too. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the BTR live stream. I am your host, Lev Polyakov, and BTR stands for Break the Rules. Thank you guys so much for coming in here today. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And we are going to be having a very active chat today and talking with our amazing guests about the uh, state of Venezuela as it currently is. So I would like to introduce first to my left, we have Maria Bello. Maria, can you tell us a little something uh, about yourself for your uh, origin story? Hey, thank you for inviting me today. Um, I left Venezuela when I was 17 due to socialism and all the stuff that were happening there. Um, I left because I did know that I wasn't going to have a future or a good education over there. So that's why I left. And from here, I have been, you know, like still trying to talk to people about what socialism is like and what socialism has done to our country. And we just keep fighting about it and, you know, keep spreading the truth about this political view. <laughs> Excellent. And to my right, we have Daniel DiMartino. Hi, everyone. I'm Daniel. Uh, I, I'm also from Venezuela. I came here in 2016, uh, just after I finished high school and came for college uh, under a scholarship. I graduated in December and I'm working in Kentucky. And I'm going to start a, a PhD soon. Uh, and basically what I do is I, I do a lot of TV I, and I do a lot of commenting and writing about what's going on in Venezuela, about why socialism is not the path, but more economic freedom and capitalism is, and how the government is really the, the cause of our problems and not, not the solution to them in most of the cases. And below on the uh, left side, we have Andres Gilarte. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yes, you do. Don't worry. Well, hello, everyone. My name, like, like Lev says, Andres Gilarte. I left Venezuela in 2019. I used to be a political uh, activist from the student movement back in my university at the, uh, over there. So I came with an internship with the Cato Institute that, well, the things came out with what happened in the crisis last year and the, some problems I had in Venezuela, so I had to stay here. And right now I'm working with the Fund for Americans, going around campus, around the U.S., university campus, and telling young students that socialism is not the, socialism is not the way and the actual factors that led the disaster that we have right now in Venezuela, how someone like Hugo Chavez led to power. That's what basically I'm doing right now in the US. Cool. And before we get to my main man, Daniel Scott Caden on the right, I just want to say we are also going to be joined shortly by Kimberly Coulter and Remzo Martinez. So look out for that. And now on my right side is Daniel Scott Caden. Welcome, Daniel. Hello, welcome. Thanks for having me. Lev, uh, yeah, I'm Daniel Scott Caden, and uh, I'm a writer, producer, and uh, director as well. I just directed a video over FaceTime about PPP. Um, what is naughty PPP? By Nature's, it's the Paycheck uh, Protection Program. It, w it was a Naughty by Nature uh, song uh, in the early 90s. And since you can't actually go and direct anything anywhere, I did it over face FaceTime yelling at the client's wife to move the camera around <laughs> and it worked out we did a we did a viral video on ppp if anyone needs any ppp let me know i'll send you the video it tells you everything you need to do perfect so i want to first address the more recent question on what's going on in venezuela having to do with the um military uh, contractor man that uh, the Venezuelan government took, who, from what I understand, was there to uh, kidnap Maduro. So who would like to go first about this? Uh, let's see. How about uh, Daniel? Which uh, Daniel? Uh, Daniel DiMartino. Go, go ahead. Um, well, um, it's really very messed up and mysterious, I would say. Um, the, the theory that is outside, you know, the popularized one is that these two men, you know, led by uh, Jordan Gordreau, who's um, an American veteran uh, who served as a Green Beret before and went to war. Uh, he created this company recently. He signed a contract supposedly with Waido and his advisors. He, one of his advisors admitted to have given him money for this. And they worked with a man called Cleaver Alcala, who was a Venezuelan general under Maduro, who supposedly defected 
However, nobody really believes that he was not with Maduro since he was even recently indicted in the United States and is now under U.S. custody after he surrendered himself to authorities in Colombia for narco-terrorism. So these are not good people uh, that this deal was supposedly signed with. And there is a lot of doubt, and I don't really believe that their, their real goal was to take off Maduro since everything about the operation was messed up, right? Uh, people who did not have enough funding, did not have enough food, went to the La, Gua La Guaira, who is in the central coast of Venezuela, from Colombia in a boat. You know how, how what, that, that's a huge distance to go in a boat. They took their IDs, like everything was just completely out of a real military op operation and looked more like a prop. Mm, interesting. Does anybody else have any thoughts on this? What I think is that, um, as Daniel say, it was just something really messed up um, that United States government, they don't have an idea who these people are. They, they just said that um, these people doesn't have anything to do with, with the United States government. What do I think is that this was something played by the Venezuelan government. I think this is something they planned. And it, it just like, it, as Daniel says, it's just so messed up that like it, there was nothing organized. Like you're taking a boat to La Guaira and stuff like that. So what I think is something they plan and they're just trying to blame it into the United States government. Mm. And um, I disagree with that um, because if you look at the history of uh, U.S. interventions, you'll find so many comic disasters and missteps. You can even look into, you know, you know, um, any any country's you know uh, Mossad's interventions in in South America, where they accidentally end up shooting three people, this is totally believable. I mean, have you seen our reaction to coronavirus in this country? We can't manufacture a mask. We're not going to be able to take down a government. Come on, Maria. That is the most well, insane thing I've seen in my life. It's they totally have taken possible. Their IDs, Daniel. Though there, there's no reason they would have taken their IDs. There's no reason they wouldn't have fed them. It looked purposefully badly done uh that's why i think so i mean because you what you're receiving information and you're you're making a judgment on that are you sure oh no but, nobody's sure of what happened yeah because the u.s government is reacting in a way that it seems like we're responsible for those guys one way or the other well, that's the way that uh, a lot of people on the uh, left look at the situation. And before we keep going, I also want to say that we tried as hard as we possibly could to get people who are left-leaning to join us on this broadcast. And you guys also know that we've had a back and forth on Twitter with this guy, and we even invited him on, but uh, he apparently does not want to entertain, as he says, you know, like fascist propagandists. What's, so, what's his name? Uh, let's see. I don't have his name right in front of me, but I could tell you. Uh, I could tell you later. But the point yeah. here is, is that we <laughs> want we want people to come on who are on the left. We want to give them an open platform to discuss whatever it is uh, they have a disagreement with you guys with. So, uh, unfortunately, they all seem to uh, not want to take part in this conversation. And before I talk about the cruise ship, I wanted to ask everybody, is this something that you guys have been experiencing in general when you guys want to do debates, when you guys want to have discussions? How often are you able to get people from the other side to uh, come on and talk? Not that much. Yeah, it's really difficult, especially yeah, it, here it, in the U.S., yeah. Because I mean, there is a there is a, a talking point in the media that when you say something bad about Venezuela, you are immediately related to being the, the Republican talking points. If you go against you know Maduro and all that, and you speak about bad about socialism, so there is a, a, a trend that when you, we make these kind of events, usually well, like that guy on, on Twitter, he says that we are a bunch of mega supporters and fascists, and I'm neither of both. So you know that's a usual you see when these conversations. And uh, how about yourself, Daniel DiMartino? I'm going to say your last name from now on, just to distinguish. That's, that's okay. That's how they called me when I was in high school, <laughs> by my last name. Um, so do you want to know like what I think about like Trump and stuff like that? Well, absolutely. But first, yeah. I would like to get your take on how the experience has been trying to reach out to people who are on the left and try to have a productive discussion about this just to fill in whatever your whatever you may be missing or wherever they may be missing i enjoy talking with people who i disagree with on policy much more than people who i agree with on policy 
I don't enjoy talking with the people who are just crazy and start calling others fascist and crazy and and then just insult, right? Like this mm. guy on Twitter, uh, who who you know just assumes things out of a, a, a specific position, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I've had success at least in some college campuses bringing other people who disagree with, and we just talk about specific policies. Uh, and it's really, I, I really enjoy it, especially when it's policy focused rather than just talking about whether you support a person or not. Uh, I think that you really bring about change and, and people to agree on things when they talk about what really matters, which is the policy of the government and who, who is there. Absolutely. And this is why I have an open invitation to anybody who is currently watching this live stream. DM me at leftpo on Twitter. I have open DMs. DM me if you want to come on. I'm going to be paying attention to those DMs. If you want to challenge anything that's being talked about right now, we don't want to constrain the conversation. We want to open it up. So with that being said, I wanted to uh, talk about the cruise ship situation. So from what I understand, there was a cruise ship that butted heads with a Venezuelan vessel and the Venezuelan government, Venezuelan, Venezuelan government was accusing, <laughs> was accusing uh, the uh, members of this, I believe it was a Portuguese cruise ship of trying to oh, kidnap tourists. Maduro. Now, were there any tourists in the cruise ship though, or were they doing some kind of, I believe that they were doing some kind of a test during the waters like it was not in its official uh cruising capacity but either way it's still a cruise ship so i don't know like what do you guys what do you guys think of the situation uh what, what what's what's going on here are people actually trying to kidnap maduro though <laughs> well i would say um or andres do you want to say something i mean yeah when you had especially after the diamonds uh, just a few months ago when you had that Maduro has a price on his head, and not just Maduro, a lot of people. It's, it's understandable that there may be some underground operations to try to do something. And I, I particularly believe that the old, this whole operation of Gideon that we were talking before, is just a private, it's a private organization, uh, operation. It doesn't have anything to do related with the government. And many of those maybe we'll see, but it's seen about the Russia with the Portuguese, I mean, that's just another try of the government to that is has been happening years after years after years that they always say that there is a, some kind of plot from any of, uh, from the whole world against them so that's something we're used to always hear about mm -hmm. look i wish i wish they actually tried and kidnapped him successfully and took him out right like that's my real wish from the bottom of my heart because that's the here's the reason that i had to leave my country my family my friends and that has killed thousands and thousands of people Right, you know, just by the crime that has increased since Chavez became president, thirty thousand people a year are dying in Venezuela on average just by homicide. That didn't happen before. I mean, we're talking about per day. by murder in Venezuela have died more people than in the Iraq War. Uh, and that's Mar how crazy it is. Maria, you you were saying something. Oh, I was just telling that um, it's like it's it's really like hundreds of people die every day in Venezuela, not just because they're starving, but because the crime. Like as Daniel was saying, uh, my friend died almost two years ago. Um, we still don't know what happened. Um, some people said the, the cops said they wanted someone wanted to kidnap her. Other people say they wanted to steal her car. She was driving. She was going uh, from one city to where I used to live in Venezuela um, in 2018, November 2018. And these guys came out of nowhere. They started following her car, and they shot her six times and she's obviously dead, you know? So so you see this type of things in Venezuela, like all the time, it's not like she was rich. So it, it, it's, it's still like, they just, oh, well, she died and they didn't do anything, anything else, you know, to figure out what happened to find these people. Th this is the thing that we live in Venezuela every day. And if I was there, I don't even want to imagine what would have happened to me. Well, let's step back for a second and get to the root cause of this crime. I mean, I think that uh, many of the people in this panel would agree that it all started from socialism. But how would you say the kind of socialism that is in Venezuela directly translates to the uh, high crime rate? Let's go with, uh, let's start with Andres, then Daniel, then Maria, and then Daniel number two, who is a.k.a. Daniel Scott Caden. Well, first of all, the whole, the whole disaster in Venezuela started with Chavez. That's the 
the, uh, the, the main point in 1999 when after he won the elections, he all started a downfall from that point. But there were a lot of mistakes that happened before Chavez that allowed him to get to power and make the whole the whole thing set again. One of the key points that Chavez used to say when campaign, and well, even to his today he died, is that he wanted to give power to the people, especially to the more poor people in Venezuela, like the neighborhood where I used to live in Petare. So the problem is that he just decentralized the power, but not the way that he should. He just decentralized the corruption. So corruption started, you know, flourishing in among a lot of neighborhoods where there was no uh, actual presence of the state from an actual state that made, uh, maintained security. So every single gang and collectivos started to gain more power and power in every single district to a point where you can even see the latest news. There is a gang in Venezuela in Madrid that they're actually facing against the security forces of the state. There is like a, a war between them and the security forces. I mean, I mean, it's crazy. There is even the, the guy that he's the head of the gang. He has thousands of followers on Twitter when he's just saying that we're going to face against Maduro, his forces, so there, there is a moment where the, 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 the consequences of a lot of policies that they, they didn't actually lead it to improve the, the quality of life of people. They didn't care about quality of life of people. They just, they just wanted to gain power, gain money. And eventually, they were not the only ones. All these gangs also gain power and collectivos gain power. So what you have in Venezuela right now is just a lot of corruption or corruption in every single level. And that is mainly doing the whole crime stuff in Venezuela. I think the crime situation was purposeful uh, because part of the power of the regime rests in reducing protests, in not letting people try to take them down. And what better way to keep you home than by increasing crime to the, in Caracas, at least the highest murder rate of any city in the world, Caracas. Petare, the most dangerous neighborhood in the whole Latin America. Um, like worse than the favelas in Brazil, right? And it's similar how, how they look. And it's it's the best way that they can do to keep power. The colectivos are friends with them too. I mean, sometimes there are fights between the police and them, but recently that same gang leader, we don't want any problem with Maduro. We are not with Guaido or anything. We just want to be in our neighborhood and, and obviously keep power. That's what they want. And they know that if Maduro is pushed out, and democracy comes to Venezuelans, the democratic overwhelming majority wants to end crime, right? This is not a partisan issue. Venezuelans would vote overwhelmingly to completely end those criminals. Uh, um, I just yeah. want to cut in real quick and ask for the whole panel, would you vote for a Pinochet type figure? Someone who would come in and, I mean, Pinochet did a lot of, uh, you could say, pretty horrible things, but it ended up getting rid of a lot of uh, leftist forces that were uh, present. Uh, so I don't know if this is the kind of, the kind of, let's say, iron fistedness that it would take, or could there be what I would personally prefer, a uh, much, much more peaceful and piecemeal approach to uh, getting, rid of this, uh, getting rid of this problem. But before we answer that, I want to get Maria's take on the crime situation. Um, so everything, yeah, it started with Chavez, but once Maduro got into into the president of Venezuela, everything just got really bad in, in like literally one day. Um, I remember when I was doing campaign in Venezuela in 2012 and then the following year, they will send the colectivos after us. We were literally kids just trying to talk to people and telling, hey, this is why I believe we need to get rid of the government. They will go after us. They will um, they will have, you know, this kind of people, they just have guns and stuff like that. And we didn't have anything. We didn't have anything to defend ourselves. And that's why I was talking to um, some of my friends a um, few days ago. I was telling them, you know why the Second Amendment is so important in here? If we had something like that in Venezuela, believe me, none of these things were happening. How can we defend ourselves? I have friends that they're like, yeah, but you know, guns kill people. I was like, no, guns are to defend yourself. You know, the from the bad people. Have guns. It doesn't matter. Exactly. The criminals are the ones that have guns in Venezuela. The government's the one that has got, uh, guns in Venezuela. We don't have anything to defend ourselves. And that's why they have killed thousands of students, thousands of people. Like my friend, they killed my friend. They have, you know, done so much damage to Venezuela. And like, there's nothing else left. By the way, I'm sorry to cut you guys off. I wanted to make an introduction to my uh, good friend, uh, Victoria. She is an amazing artist, illustrator, and she is joining us today. And uh, I uh, wanted to, before we go any further, 
go back to the question that I asked about a possible Pinochet situation, which I hope would not happen. Uh, but what do you guys think it would take to uh, change things? I was actually just thinking more of an Uribe style plan, like in yeah. Korea, right? Where they really went hard against the criminals and the terrorist organizations like FARC, but it's a perfectly democratic government, right? Um, and of course there are mistakes and everything, but it's never like Pinochet, which I, I don't condone that kind of like disappearance of, of taking <laughs> people who are again, you know, just because they are against the dictatorship, right? That's mm. crazy. Um, mm. and that's not what we want. We want democracy and we want free markets because that's what's destroyed Venezuela's economy. It's socialism. Absolutely. Um, let me, if I can interject for a minute um, here, I, I feel a nonsensical argument is being made regarding socialism and I think the argument should be made differently. Um, I will take, you know, on your word, and I don't doubt any of you, that the government has been predacious um, and uh, absolutely horrible in so many respects. But taking it to task for socialism is like being against salt. It's ridiculous because salt is a seasoning. It's nice, but in, in a massive quantity, it's toxic. So you're always going for a balance. But when you come at this from the socialism is evil um, uh, perspective, you're making no sense. The fire department, what is that? Socialism. No, so Daniel, you know, you're right. So you it's a matter of degree. Exactly. It's a matter exactly. Of degree. No country is just like either socialist or capitalist. That's not the Perfect. way. Perfect. Perfect. There is an index of economic freedom. And right. Two least free economic countries in the world are North Korea and Venezuela. Venezuela is less economically free or capitalist than Cuba. We think that Venezuela should be among the most economically free nations like Switzerland, like New Zealand, yeah. like Australia, uh, and prosper like they do, like America does. Right, right. But I mean, have previous capitalist governments uh, made extreme, huge, and egregious errors? Yeah, and, and well, Venezuela- That could be Venezuela's described as crimes. Venezuela's problems. Same kind of criminal, different different area, you know, like more concentrated power. Um, you might have more criminals on the loose, but, um, you know, the government also can be confiscatory. Capitalism can be predacious. All of these things. That's, I mean, this socialist government is in reaction to something, right? I mean, something was wrong, very wrong in Venezuela to, to get to the point where you have Chavez, I mean, Chavez. Well, let's uh, <laughs> let's talk about that for a second. That's what I'm curious about. What happened in Venezuela that led to Hugo Chavez? Well, well, first of all, I, I regaining your argument, uh, Daniel. I don't mm. think that. Well, yes, it may be on some degrees in some parts of the world, but definitely Venezuela socially plays a huge part. And I think that the argument of fire departments, I mean, fire department is is one of the uh, you can say one of the, the factors that a local government can do, but that's not a sample of socialism. Usually okay. here in the U.S., the yeah. media says that socialism is anything related to public. So there are people, you can see people it saying is. that, well, anything that is public is socialism. That's, that that's not socialism. It socialism is, is getting the what means of production is? What is it from the, the, the government. He's that's trying socialism. to explain that. Yeah. Socialism is when the government can, gains all the power from the means of production. Socialism is when you, all the services well, they passed all to public power, to public uh, As uh, hands, and you don't have private options. That's no, socialism. According to Marx, in the Communist Manifesto, services. socialism is when private ownership is nationalized. True. Um, that, yeah. yeah. So, but the part of the Okay, wait, hold on. One at a time. One at a time. The that's distinction that people that's know, you're, you're just twisting a word that's been translated from Cyrillic. What people know for a fact is that communism seizes, you know, the the way of production socialism is not about that it's about a mixed economy bernie sanders describes himself as a democratic socialist he sees that word he's definitely not a communist so well i do think bernie not sanders pretend is pretend there's not like a distinction. soviet guy like i do yes, think soviet guy. Radical. Mm -hmm. democratic socialism by the way that's what chavez used to say he used to say that i'm sure to implement democratic socialism oh that's yeah I, people say. lie all the time well also well, daniel America, if you were an example He's a communist, not a socialist. If he seizes the oil production Who? industry, that's not socialism. Who? That's communism. You're talking about Maduro and Chavez, right? 
Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, if, if we are going to apply that bar to Chavez, we have to apply for every single politician. So whatever Bernie says, no, well, I understand. Put, put into, so into I, I agree with Andres, Daniel but I think understands. that we just have a terminology problem. Daniel. And the terminology problem is that I'm just re going off Marx. Socialism is seizing the means of production. Communism is the next step, which is yeah. when there's not even a government that's needed. And everybody lives in a society mm -hmm. without a government sharing everything. Marx that's was an ANCAP. Everyone. Marx was an anarcho-capitalist. <laughs> like, that has never yeah. happened. Like that form of Marxist communism. He's a theorist, yeah. What socialism has. Now, what you're thinking, Daniel, and you know, like the, the academic Europe, and I think that what you're thinking, thinking is social democracy, which well, is exactly. something different. That's the completely it's not completely different. It shares yeah, a lot of the same different. aspects. Mm -hmm. But, completely different because in social yeah. democracy businesses are private right not yeah. not government not owned. all businesses are private in not social all democracy. businesses but the overwhelming like the, majority the of national them. health service is is not necessarily a private thing but we keep right. private entities you know innovating with drugs but but there is a certain amount of socialization which is necessary to be a decent society i think everyone here might agree with that as there so, has always been sure yeah. but if you're talking about like yeah. nordic countries nordic countries from what i remember they don't like to be called socialist countries they are capitalist countries yeah. with a they, welfare state and that is not the same as being a socialist country they're a mixed economy I, mean, Look, I have the economic freedom index here and they are amongst the most capitalist countries in the world yes they have manufactured by who you know i mean all these things are like I mean, so you have this book, and from this book, you're telling me there is a fact, and who? No, who, I'm telling you that there is an index based yeah. on objective measures of government debt, of percentage mm. of taxation as a percentage of GDP of spending. These countries do have high taxes. They do have national health services. Yeah. But they also have no minimum wage, lower corporate taxes, balanced budgets, they have a minimum wage. Dude, None of those things. Venezuela. In Denmark. McDonald's workers get 22 bucks an hour and six months paid leave. But that's not government mandate. That's McDonald's. That, that, McDonald's that's has like a, a, no, no, it is government, government mandate. Uh, global they're, they're wage. Government in Nordic countries, they have a bottom for people that you cannot fall beneath. You do not go without health care. Here not, too, you have Medicaid, Daniel. Yeah, but that's that's no, different. You that's, don't. That's safety net. That's no, you don't. Yeah, safety net. Any welfare state, any welfare yeah. state, especially the those Nordic countries, they have a safety net. That's completely it's not a welfare different. State. America has a huge. Take away the word, word welfare. It's a state that has a mixed economy where you protect your citizens. You know, you're you're trapped in these phrases here. It's a state. It's a mixed economy. You want a mixed economy. You don't want your grandma dying in the street, do you? Okay, are you okay? So you guys are saying like there's the color red and the color orange, and there is an in between area where you can't really say is this red or is this orange. So you would have something it, red to be socialism, yeah. Yeah, but something more exists. orange to be like this mixed economy you're talking yeah. about. But Listen, I think well, the big problems happen from what I'm able to observe in the lives of let's say my family who were living under a uh, communist uh, dictatorship is that whether you call it socialism or whether you call it communism or whatever, if the government has control of the economy, which it still does to this day, if we're talking about the Russian Federation, then that's going to lead to tons of problems. And uh, I think, like, regardless of however we may bicker about the definition, it's kind of like when uh, that judge talked about pornography saying, like, I know it when I see it. I think that that's the only thing we could really say here. Like, how much does the government have control over the economy if it's to such an extent that it's harder for, this, for the citizens to make businesses, it's harder for them to uh, trade freely, then it should be pretty obvious that there is a difference between that and having a welfare state uh, where people are taken care of, especially when we look at examples like uh, Sweden or Norway. I mean, Norway has so much oil that it's like, it's not a surprise that you had something like, uh, even forget Norway for a second, look at Sweden. Sweden was like one of the top performing countries economically, I believe around the 50s, but then it started going down and down and down. So it almost seems to me, like as an outsider looking into these Nordic countries, that they are like rich kids who have inherited a lot of money, and now what are you gonna do with that money? Are you gonna be able to make it last? But that's not true, love, because you know Denmark um, doesn't have a hell of a lot of oil, neither does Holland. They, they have um, a But they're very small and homogeneous. Homogeneous. Yeah, they have a, hom yeah, they have a homogeneous population. But it, it may be easier for them to enact 
you know, their socialism. And it is socialism if, if the government takes care of your health and many other features of your life and guarantees you certain That's rights. And that is socialism. socialism. Hmm. Okay, so guys, one, one person we have I'm not heard anything from. Gentlemen, one person we have not heard anything from, and ladies, is Victoria. Victoria, what do you think about this whole communism, socialism, mixed economy conversation? Well, like always, I'm not as well-read or well-researched as everybody else. I've just kind of been listening and absorbing uh, what's been said. Um, I honestly am just going to continue to do that because I feel like uh, there are people in this chat who know more and and have it's their place to be talking about it so i don't know more victoria she's probably like this whole you. thing going on <laughs> <laughs> well let, let me ask you this question victoria growing up in the united states what did you learn about uh socialism and communism like what is your perspective as an american student socialism didn't start and this is coming from somebody who didn't become political until after 9-11. Um, and I was still an early teenager, so it took me a long time to even really start researching and knowing where to go with this because I was just kind of an ADHD kid and went where the wind blew. Um, socialism wasn't something that was talked about in in throughout my life until fairly recently, I think. It was like during college when socialism started be because it was probably when Bernie Sanders was starting to really ramp up his uh, presidential runs um, and uh, I think maybe during um, Occupy Wall Street and stuff like that uh, and again I'm not very well versed in it um, I just know that uh, there are some problems in some countries that uh, are they're normally called communist. Uh, I don't know the the inner uh, the more specific definitions of what's going on. I just know that there's some problems going on in other countries that uh, seem to be much worse than are what's going on here. Um, that that's a good I, way to I say used, it. Yeah, I used to think that we were pretty okay, but now I'm pretty embarrassed by my country. <laughs> <laughs> well, in compare in comparison to what though, and uh, we have a uh, Wiley Matthews joining us, and That's also Mads mm, South Swati. I'm going to get to your comment as well coming up, but first, uh, Wiley Matthews, since this is more among the conversation we're having right now, asks, "What about the difference between South America and these Nordic cultures?" Um, I want to say something about the cultures. I don't think that it's true that being homogeneous means anything related to socialism. I think that that's actually a little bit argument based on culture and race that I don't think applies at all. Um, I just think that those countries are not really socialist like Venezuela, right? Those countries don't control their currencies like Venezuela did uh, that had a terrible scheme of currency control. Those countries don't put price controls on goods and services like Venezuela does that created shortages that I had to wait for hours to buy food. There is no price control for flour, right? There's no price control for milk in Nordic countries. There is in Venezuela. And those countries didn't print money to pay for their overspending, right? They have balanced budgets. Venezuela didn't. And that's why we had hyperinflation and I became poor. I worked mm -hmm. for America, my family, not me, I was a kid. Uh, from earning thousands of dollars a month in 1999 to making $2 a day in 2016. I mean, that's what inflation did to our income. And Maria and Andres probably can say the same. And it's about the policies, right? It's about that. It's not about the cultures. Those same policies applied in the Nordic countries would have the same result. We're all human. There's a person that I follow on Twitter, and that's this is where I kind of get my Venezuela information. I try to follow people who live in Venezuela. Um, and he's got internet, he's on Twitter, but at the same time, he has a, uh, a, a daily water regimen of, of rationing. Um, and, and electricity too. Yeah. And it's so bizarre to me to hear that he has to go out and, and get in line for certain things. And like, mm -hmm. I don't make much money right now, but, um, I really want to like send him like treats and things just because like when i it, it wouldn't take much money for me to like yeah. give him something but like i you know I, I think that water rationing while having internet is just such a 
a weird flip flop. Mm. Look, I, I I understand that the situation there is is dire, um, but again, I'm coming at it from the same direction to make the argument against socialism. Yes, um, no, Daniel, you're not correct. Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Germany, Belgium, the entire EU does enact price controls on, on certain goods? on certain things, not on oil, but like, on on medicine, on samples? things that keep people alive. Let me finish. Um, so. It's not really a characteristic of, of a theoretical system. It's the, the monsters who are holding office and administrating it. Um, but getting back to the comment of, the, of um, um, Lev, I don't know who it was. Why doesn't socialism work in South America and why does it work um, in, uh, in Nordic countries? I don't know that there's an answer to that that I can give. Daniel DiMartino, homogeneity, um, in any systems is an advantage. Um, I wouldn't discount that or, or write that off as some kind of weird bigotry and say, yes, it is easy to manage people who have all been brought up in the same way, believe in the same thing. Well, there's They're also a caveat. Too. There's also yeah. a caveat I want to add specifically about the Nordic countries. They did not have the same system of serfdom as Russia did, for example. No. So yeah, right. it was a very different relationship that the people had living there towards uh, to towards their fellow villagers. And I think that makes a huge difference in Russia as well, why we had so much chaos and carnage during World War II, why so many people were allowed to go through uh, the horrors that they did. I think it does have to do with a lot of darkness that was built up over time by people living like in an absolutely animalistic state as serfs. And that has no bearing at all on the quality of a human being because you got uh, you know you, you got amazing writers whose uh, parents were serfs S no condition whatsoever would prevent somebody who was a who had a parent as a serf from attaining higher but it's still something that kept a lot of people within that uh, within that mind cage for lack of a better word daniel you just said that there were price controls in the eu what's your source for that and what are the goods with price controls there's every single good is under price control. The EU is highly, yeah. highly- What is your source for that? Production. Because I, my family also, lives in Spain and Italy, and I can tell you- Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to send you links right now. They they have a, an economy that is regulated in a hundred thousand ways. Our regulation is not a price control. Dude, I'm talking I'm about- I'm a German citizen. Capital. I know this. Like, I know this. Okay. Just saying you know it doesn't mean it's yeah. true. You need to- Okay. Agree. So I will, I'll, I, we, we can, we can discourse on this anytime at all, but you like should there know. Is no, like milk can go up in price or down. Every single, yeah, some, some commodities are not regulated at all. Almost I, every commodity is not yeah. regulated in price. But, but there's some commodities that involve life and death that shouldn't be out of reach for people. They should be able to live. You're so talking about healthcare and what should yes. be, not what is. Healthcare. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, healthcare, and that's why there is rationing, and you have to wait for 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 appointments we in Europe. Have, we but have. There is no price control the, for the milk. Outcomes in the There's U.S. No are much worse bread. than they are in in the Nordic countries. We are the worst. Okay, of all developed countries, we have the worst outcomes, especially um, uh, with babies. We have more. We have a, a mortality rate that's off the charts here. Why is that? Is that socialism? No, well, it's capitalism. You're about healthcare, but you just said something that's false, and that is that there are price controls for goods. There is no price control for bread. There is no price control. No, there's no price. I never said there's price control for bread. Did I say okay. that? That's if good. I said and that, that's why there are no that. shortages of I didn't bread. say that. But there's price controls for healthcare, and it will be made good. available. And there are shortages of healthcare. Or free. In here, there are no no price controls for healthcare. Um, there's a there's an oligarchy who charges as much as they damn want. I can go and get a diabetes pill. I'm not that fat yet, but if I wanted to for 10 cents and I could pay $10 over here, this is predacious capitalism. It doesn't work. You need real street fighting capitalism like Lev is doing with his show. Like if they have to, he has to make a noise and people have to come to him and do things. Well, a we big, pro a big problem is American dictatorships you know, with, with an oligopoly controlling their citizens, seizing all the industries, calling it capitalism and, uh, and ruining people's lives, just as the communist governments that succeeded them did the same.
Well, I still want to bring things back to Russia as a comparison to a country that I think did exactly as you're saying, Daniel, because on their face, they're a capitalist country. Meanwhile, in order to have any successful business at all in Russia, you're going to have to hand it over to one of Putin's cronies. Crony capitalism. Exactly. But there is a yeah. difference still between crony capitalism in America and in Russia, as far for as sure. the crony capitalists well, in a Russia. Lot of crony capitalism here. For sure. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Like they don't take, I don't believe American businessmen take like a 90% of the total profit and just create an absolute Cropola product that they give to a pe the people like they do in Russia where they, let's say, build a bridge. They build a crappy bridge, it breaks yeah. down easily, but 90% of the tax money goes to, into the pockets of the oligarch who uh, heads up that company. So That's we kind luckily of why I love, I, I love Russia for that reason in my own weird way. But uh, I remember... Um, I was negotiating on a deal with a Russian guy once, and I was like, what's your commission? Like 10%? He's like, no, 50%. <laughs> I'm like, what? But I loved it. Well, I love Russia. Well, uh, I, I love Russia, too, as far as Russian literature and uh, Russian culture, you know, so Russian music. But now let's get to the uh, comment that was made by Mads Mswati. Very interesting surname, if that is a surname. So he was asking about how does the oil crisis factor into what's currently going on in Venezuela? Fucking huge. Who want wants to, to go first? Daniel? Daniel I was one? Thinking, I don't know if Andres wanted to say something. I mean, of course, it plays a lot of uh, factors inside Venezuela because Venezuela is a, a huge oil, well, used to be a huge oil producer. We, we still have the biggest oil reserves in the world, which doesn't translate that we actually are super rich. It just means that the oil's there, but it's not actually being produced. Uh, the petroleum is there, but it's actually not being produced. But of course, the oil prices play an impact in the Venezuelan economy because we depend mostly on, on oil resources. But in the last few years, I will say like the last eight years since Chavez died, well, it's not just oil, the main resource for Venezuela, also the illicit actions, illicit uh, resources, like selling gold to other countries in, in, a, in, a, in a legal way without the permission of the National Assembly. Also the narcotics issue, mm. we all know that there is actually a cartel in South Venezuela managed by the militaries. So they, the, the Venezuelan uh, regime has many ways to gain resources, but the main one, of course, of the economy is the, is the, the oil price. How, how do we know, by the way, that the cartels uh, and the government are uh, one and the same when it comes to drug dealing? Uh, because well, the thing is that the, 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 uh, the cartel... Uh, Andres and then uh, Daniel. Yeah. So the cartel in Venezuela is called Cartel de los Soles. In English, Cartel of the Sons. Usually a high rank military in Venezuela gets sons here in his lap. In his, you say in his shoulder, he gets sons. So it was called the Cartel of the Sons. In Venezuela, because most of the of the of the ones that managed it were militaries from the Chavez era. The, all the whole investigation from the DA of indictments against the the, cart the cartel in Venezuela started in 2006. Because even in those years is when Chavez started gaining the whole the whole uh, tre uh, treaties with the FARC, with the LNN to get the the, uh, the, the to gain the, the power in the frontier with Colombia in, in the terms of dark of narcotics. So yes, it's called Cartel of the Sons because the militaries are part, and Diosdado Cabello is part of is, is the head of the, of the cartel, and Diosdado Cabello is a military, and it's the second command in the Venezuelan regime. So it's, that's the that's the uh, the reason why it's called uh, that is that there is a relation with the military and the narcotics because the militaries in Venezuela are the ones that run the country. Well, also I want to add that uh, Russia and Venezuela are very close when it comes to the drug trade. I know from uh, Russia itself, Putin was dealing cocaine back in the day from St. Petersburg Harbor when he was uh, the uh, deputy mayor at the time. So, what? yeah, <laughs> no, he's been dealing drugs forever. And I believe that this is one way that uh, the current Venezuelan uh, government stays afloat from a lot of this uh, from yeah, a lot of this drug money. Yes. And they also have like so many different uh, deals together, like they get um, uh, they get a uh, a purchase. Okay, so s since 2005, there was a purchase of more than four billion dollars in uh, arms uh, from uh, Russia. And okay. uh, as far as the uh, drugs go, it's uh, I, I don't know. Like this is what the United States right now tries to uh, put a stop to when it comes to intercepting a lot of these uh, Venez Venezuelan uh, ships. And from what I understand, this has something to do with the cruise ship story. 
I'm not sure if it has something to do with the cruise ship story. What I understand is that the cruise ship story was actually a mistake the Venezuelan military did, which is very common. Uh, and they were trying to attack the cruise ship and they ended up sinking themselves. <laughs> <laughs> There's like, I even saw a video. It was, I mean, it was hilarious. The, the cruise ship was like, please don't get close, don't get close. And they just, you know, crashed. And the, and the Venezuelan one was the one that sank, not the, yeah. not the first one. Wow. Um, so typical socialist government but um the narcotics that's the main reason they stay in power together with the cuban spies and the support from china and russia practically you know you would think how can a government that is not supported by the people stay in power right well how do they you know keep power the military the guns how do they keep the loyalty of the military well the low-ranking members have power over the food supply because it's government-owned right they give it for, for their families they have power, the higher ranking you get, you have access to deals to do contracts for the government and to drug deals. Hmm. Uh, before it was through just the oil royalties that gave them power. Now oil royalties, not just for the are because of the price are, are nothing, but because of the production. Now we're producing like 500,000 barrels of oil per day. We were producing 3 million before Chavez. Um, well, and you're that's not producing any now because the demand for oil has dropped true negative value so you're gonna yeah. have to start selling more cocaine yeah well uh, <laughs> yeah, the united states that's basically it man yeah but, but, the, the, but, the whole thing is that i don't think that the war on drugs can succeed uh because of the evidence over time so i don't think that we can stop them well, from, but, from getting that know, well we can legalize cocaine if we legalize, and then we would still import them from Venezuela. Yeah. But what if? Okay. Yeah, well, it's better than painkillers. That is no, true. No, I'm not. I'm not that saying for true. the U.S. I just mean like for Venezuela, the revenue yeah. stay. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's I mean, a good what point. Saying, what I'm saying, in essence, is, I was you were complaining about the government printing money. We just printed a thousand fucking trillion dollars over here, or two trillion. Well, it was debt. It was not printing money. Yeah, but also the capitalist governments printed money back in 1982 as well. So, yeah, and, and, hype, and Latin America. I know you know that, but your argument, your I think your beef is not with with socialism or communism. It's with this particular government. No, um, my beef is with specific policies. Right. That okay. No matter which government. I enjoy that. I enjoy that. I think that's a. But those policies, those policies, Daniel, it's yeah. not just printing money. It's excessive government spending. It is over-regulation. Oh. It is price controls. It is nationalization of businesses. Those are socialist policies. Are you against Norway's nationalization? Yes. Um, and there they, is, and they there is rank on the happiness index way higher than we do, or Venezuela like, does. They have one state-owned company, which is their oil company. Yeah. that they don't nationalize milk factories like venezuela or they Africa don't land. but do you agree that you know they're they're splitting their oil profits among their population and was that a terrible thing that norway did to well, have venezuela had that before challenge yeah but they fucked it up they right. didn't split because it up they the fucked with it up. nationalization you yeah. get one authoritarian guy what one time in power <laughs> he destroys everything <laughs> So, but, so, um, so guys, we have a we have a comment by the way from Mads Msawi. Oh, that's what the North Koreans were doing yeah. with. Okay, his comment is that's where that's what the North Koreans were doing with meth in the early 2000s. And I also know that they legalized weed over there, I believe. But uh, I wanted to uh, change gears a bit and ask you guys individually about your o own experiences, horror stories living in Venezuela. Uh, let's start with uh, Maria. Uh, what was it like? And just uh, guide us, gu guide us through. S tell the Americans what they what they're missing. So um, I started getting involved because my mom used to work uh, in politics. And then, um, you know, as a kid, you want to do so many things. You want to be so many things. So I remember I was like, well, I want to be a uh, engineer. I want to be a professor. I want to be a teacher, this kind of stuff. And then um, there were certain things that I didn't like about those careers. So when my mom used to get uh, was getting involved in politics, I was like, well, I think this is what I like. Um, when I think about politics, I think about helping people. That's what I want to do. I don't care about power. I don't care about the money. I just care about helping people. Um, in 2012, I did my first campaign against Chavez and then Maduro. And I remember um, I knew I was going to leave the country since I was 14. But then my hope was 
if we win, if we get rid of the government, then I'm going to stay home. But then we lost and eventually have to leave. In Venezuela, we have to do lines of hundreds of people just to be able to get in the supermarket and buy food for ourselves and buy groceries. Um, as I was telling the guys yesterday, I remember they marked my arm with, with a number, with a Sharpie. They were like, I was like 400 something. I remember getting close to um, the supermarket entrance and they were like, there's nothing left. And then my mama was like, well, let's go to another supermarket. There was nothing left. And you could only buy groceries once a week, depending on your ID number. Um, my family has gone through so much. Uh, my grandfather almost got kidnapped because my grandfather, um, he wasn't rich, but he had some money. Um, then we got people robbing our house. Um, I got robbed twice with a gun pointed at my head. And I was telling my friends yesterday how when I got to the United States, I was so scared of guns. I was so scared. I was traumatized. But then I heard someone speaking about the Second Amendment and why it was so important. I said, yes, we need the guns to defend ourselves. Um, as I say before, my friend died in 2018. And from that moment, I say, I don't want to go back home. I'm scared of going back home. I'm scared that something's going to happen to my family. Something's going to happen to me just because I'm risking their life. Why? Because we're coming from another country and people think that we have money. They're going to do something to our family. Um, in Venezuela, we have the prisoners going in and out of jail as they please. This is what the government does. This is the, the prisoners are with the government. They are in, in touch. They, you know, this is why, as Daniel said, this is why crime is so high in Venezuela. And as I can tell you this, there are probably a million things I cannot talk about because I can put my family in risk. Mm. So these are the horrible things that socialism does. It's not just about taking your money. It's about socialism kills. Socialism kills people. Uh, that was that, that was very powerful. But before we get moving, I have one new person to introduce. Everybody, welcome, uh, Exile Judge. He uh, was on a previous show of ours. Here he is with the Judge Dread Avatar, going strong. <laughs> Hello. Stop. Hey, how we doing? <clears throat> so, uh, oh, wait, wait. Is, is everyone hearing me? Okay. Is that yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so it's kind of weird. All right, so. This is, I don't know what the introduction was. I don't know how you, what, how you introduced me as I just couldn't, I, I was trying to take off. Like it's been like a weird pause. So, um, so I, I think I'm doing, uh, I, you know, as a, as a veteran, as a, you know, uh, as a U S Marine Corps veteran, I guess I'm like the uh, expert military guy here now, apparently. Cause I have until, more, until more Rem Remzo comes in. Remzo's also yeah, in the yeah, military. Yeah, really? Damn. Yeah. Fuck. He might, might, he might outrank me. I got to like scurry away. And run away and, I think and he, then, he's uh, still in the National Guard, by the way. Lol. <laughs> that's a good job. Good on him. That's that's interesting. No, but um, but actually, I just wanted to make it a clear point that I absolutely believe that the situation with what happened with uh, what's his name, Jordan, uh, shitty French Canadian name. Uh, bro. Bro. <laughs> bro. He he. Okay, you guys ever watched that movie Firefest? Have you watched those two Firefest documentaries? I did, yes. yes. Yeah, all right. So that was great. It's a great example. So that's, to me, that's what kind of happened. It's, it was like the Firefest of um, private military contracting. You know? So, I mean, this guy's obviously like just <laughs> Eric. It's okay, true. wait, wait. Let's back up. Exile Judge. For those who don't know what Firefest was, uh, it was a festival that people paid a lot of money to construct and made out of it something that looked very impressive. But at the end of the day, everybody was just stranded on this strange concrete part the of this island. Islands. Yeah. yeah. So it was. Uh, <clears throat> so it was. It was following an example of like the bigger music events like Coachella, All Tomorrow's Party. Like every metropolitan has, or you know, area, bunch of you know, a place where you know hipsters can go and mm. you know, you see. Yeah. So they they. <clears throat> So yeah, the fire fest, like fire fest, what like this? This was like a version of what uh, the, the fire fest version, but instead of like music festival, it's it's supposed to be some you know wild coup, you know, you know either revolution or counter revolution attempt at uh, maybe inspiring the Venezuelans to overthrow their government and you know, have a new one in place. But, but yeah, I, I do believe that uh, something went, the, I mean, the situation I feel really what happened was, was probably this guy, Jordan, 
um, who wants to be like a um, wannabe Eric Prince like figure. He he basically got started this company and probably got himself in debt over various things, and then um, just like signed this like wild contract with uh, um, I guess like the uh, interim president of Venezuela, President Guado. Is that why? He says he didn't sign it, but his advisor says he, the other guy, he himself didn't give, gave him money. There's a lot of controversy now between them. Okay. So here's what happened. I think, I think they just kind of realized, okay, maybe this guy will be crazy enough to pull this off. And then of course it didn't because this guy, this guy's just like, you know, he just didn't understand the scope and scale of what he was trying to do. And it was very, just an idiotic move. Um, and it, you know it's stupid bad pigs basically right it's, and i are, know, ran contra and so on and so on yeah i mean even 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 like even the, the bay of pigs invasion that involved thousands of like like you know anti-castro fighters rebels yeah. willing to get involved this guy had 60 venezuelans they were expected to take on you know the venezuelan military I mean, who 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 knows how many defectors there could there could be in the mm. in the Venezuelan military? But you know, the Venezuelan the Venezuelan the military itself has an entire fucking air force. They have their own jets. They have their own, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, they have quite a few helicopters. Obviously, we saw that arrest. Mm. Well, so, so, some people on this panel uh, think that this was possibly orchestrated by Maduro's government itself. Is that right, oh, yeah, uh, they, they, Daniel? Well, that's they, they what. Don't, they, Daniel. That's what I think because Cleaver Alcala was there, and I think that the interim government of Guaido okay. was stupid enough to think that Alcala was not okay, going so to ride. Wait, 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 uh, Exile Judge, you got to let Daniel finish. Okay. I just, th well, I think I just said what I, what I okay. wanted to say. Okay. Alcala. So, so there is, you're still at least giving an admission. There's a, there's amount of uh, competence within the Maduro government then, because if they're going to oh, be, oh yeah, <laughs> they wouldn't be in power. <laughs> like, yeah. So I mean, it's just that uh, he's. Um, I mean, it's. I mean, I, I started laughing like the things I found out about, you know, trying to d you know, dig into the entire situation of all that. But I, I just believe it was it was a fuck up. But also, they also had defectors. He did Jordan, you know, at tweeted President Trump as if he's gonna like open up his fucking app and be like, oh, I gotta send the Marines in just so the, to help these guys with their like coup attempt. But uh, you know. Uh, they had he had 60 venezuelans involved as well and then i think at least half of them probably just defected and just became informants to set this entire thing up you know they just became informants to maduro and then as soon as they really were gonna get getting a bunch of you know body armor and like weapons on a boat one of which was an airsoft gun you know they were just wait like the you know venezuelan military police were just like re right there ready for for them to come into their fucking boat and you know just arrest them all Wow. So, so, so I mean, the entire situation. You could. Say, this is this is where the private sector failed, obviously. Maybe I'm not, but I don't want to make it into a, a freaking econ argument again. And by the way, the word I think people should be looking for in terms of degrees is uh, Keynesian. Everyone's kind mm. of. Like, I think everyone's a Keynesian in a degree. I mean, there's Mar you know, Marxist, socialist, uh, communist, and capitalist. But we don't we don't go around calling each other like Adam Smithists or something. We just we just say capitalist but, Speak for but yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> oh and by the yeah, way but, e exile judge yeah. major props to trying to get that dude on unfortunately uh no no dice yeah and then, yeah i ended up uh just, just having to call him an idiot let's, he actually knows him. That's, that's, <laughs> i have no idea right how to now. No, I mean, look, he didn't want to do it. I'm not going to force him into any position here. But look, we tried, like I said in the beginning of the show, we tried reaching out. And by the way, everybody who is watching this right now, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like, leave a comment, uh, let us know what you think, any questions. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com slash levenjules. You are the lifeblood of this operation, bringing different people together, having very intense and interesting and exciting conversations. So anyway, I want to now bring this to Daniel DiMartino. Tell us about your horror stories, the things that you've experienced. What got you motivated to do it from those horror stories? Sure. And, and I got to leave after this just because I, I have other things for tomorrow. No but, problem. Um, well, many of, I have many, uh, I would say that one of the worst, and it just made me so mad was 
you know, the government, as they implemented the rationing system, because obviously when they imposed price controls, companies didn't continue producing, there was more demand. Of course, there's a shortage. This is basic Econ 101. Um, and I had to do a line for an hour. I got to the end of the line. I had to put my fingerprint because they had a fingerprint machine to know how many things I had bought that week to know how many I could buy still. And I was so mad because even the cashier didn't work for the government. Why was she collaborating with this whole system, right? And I tell her, you know what? You want to put my, my fingerprint there? So I just spit on my finger and I put the <laughs> fingerprint on the, on the, on the machine. I'm like, okay, this is what you have. Um, I could have probably gotten in trouble for that, but I didn't, thankfully. Um, that was one time. Then there was nothing when I got in, right? There was no, no bread, which is what we needed and, and other things. Um, Drugs, it's happened to me with drugs. There, there are no drugs that you can find there. Um, Crime-wise, uh, the last time I went back to Venezuela in the summer of 2017, we were coming by car from my cousin's uh, uh, home where we were celebrating his birthday. And it was the evening. It was not a responsible thing to do in Venezuela, going out in the evening. Uh, and when we were coming back, it was like a closed street and a, a motorcycle gets in front of us and points a gun at us. Um, and that's when I thought like, okay, this is it, right? I'm, we're going to die. Uh, the guy fell off his motorcycle. Thank God. And my dad just pushed the accelerator and we left. Um, uh, you know, I just think sometimes, you know, that's when God really takes care of you and, and tries to help you, but it's, it's very scary. Now I don't think I could go back after what I've said outside of, of the country. Thankfully my family is outside, which is why I'm, I'm also my most direct family, not all of them, um, which is why I most feel at free to talk against the regime and say what I say, you know, like for me, you know, I think we need to end Maduro by force. I don't think that negotiation is going to end it, right? The United States became an independent nation through the war of independence, right? Not by doing sit-ins mm -hmm. and asking, please, British, decolonize America. No, that didn't happen. Well, um, Daniel, Dean Martino, I don't doubt any of the, of, uh, the actions of the Venezuelan government and how horrible they are. But I have to, you know, in a playful and brotherly way, put the end to the lie that European nations don't have price controls. And I'm right now texting the entire group about European price controls on pharmaceuticals. So your, your, your denigration of socialistic systems is not the way to go. Oh, you and Daniel, hold on. Before you finish actions. that point, before you finish yeah. that point, we have We're, Kimberly Coulter here in the chat. Uh, sure. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Any person. Any relation to Anne Coulter? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Hi, guys. I love How's it. How's it going? So, well, bef Hello. before we keep going, uh, Daniel, your uh, point about the price controls, and uh, then Daniel uh, is going to have to go. Um, I think that you disestimated your whole point, Daniel. If you just read the abstract of the paper you just said, it says, in 1986, EU pharmaceutical R&D exceeded US R&D by 24%, but by 2004, EU R&D trailed the US by about 15%. During these 19 years, the United States Research and development, that's what R&D stands for, uh, grew at an annual rate of 8.8, .8, while at the EU, just 5.4. Right. It all showed that while the EU consumers faced lower pharmaceutical price inflation, it cost them 46 fewer new medicines. So, yeah, you're right. They didn't get more inflation. They just didn't get the pharmaceuticals price. that you don't need. I, you you're said right. It's no, better if we don't create medicines. Daniel, it's medicine. over. You said there were no I mean, price controls. You were wrong. Hey, I, our president. Right. No, I uh, said. Sorry. Okay. Not every good has exile. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, guys, Daniel, exile judge. Bye, Daniel Di Martino. Okay. okay, bye, bye. I just want to, okay, yeah, the I exile just judge. Hey, I feel, Don't lie. Okay. Real quick, I just wanted to say I'm I'm for price uh, ceilings for meds, but besides that, let's talk about like what it takes for I agree a violent with you. violence revolution, like like a, a you know successful revolutions. You know, I mean, you gotta sometimes you also gotta look at situations with like how marxist governments took over successfully um in terms of like violent overthrow you know uh, there's a there's one famous quote by uh, fidel castro he said you know i started this revolution with 82 men if i could do it all over again i would need 10 or 15 with absolute, with absolute hey guys. uh what's it uh, with absolute faith and a plan of action and then, but you know, and that's like, that's really inspiring words. But you also got to factor in, like within that top, uh, 
within that time, the population of Cuba was what, like 7 million people. And, you know, you, but Venezuela, it's a, it's a population of uh, 30, like, you know, it's, it's almost 29 million now, right? Venezuela is almost 29. If you look this up in Wiki, like, Wiki, I'm, we're, we're, this is using Wiki stats, but it's like around 29 million people. So you would, I think, you know, the, uh, the number for, you know, Jordan was kind of right, up, right, right around there with like 60 people, but did they act, did they have a, you know, absolute faith in a plan of action? No, no. <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, you, you do kind of expect defectors and informants, uh, you know, being infiltrated into these type of like revolutionary um, uh, movements. Um, but one thing I can tell you right now is, uh, you know, some company like Blackwater could probably over like might pull off. A <laughs> they actually have, you know, they do have like, like, like three, like three, over 300 guys. They actually have, an air support side with like helicopters. Now this is might be kind of you know they're, they're basically like considered like you know the uh, the uh, modern fry corps of today. But you know that's how that's that's maybe like what it takes when people talk about um, some weird successful coups and re revolutions. You need companies like that, or for, you know. But it's going to end up being like a CIA front, basically. You need BlackRock for <laughs> Black Blackwater. Blackwater. Well, now it's called Academy, I, I believe. Black I Blackwater, Blackwater, yeah, Blackwater. With you know, because this Jordan, that this Jordan guy was, was uh, the kind of like a, you know an Eric Prince wannabe. Well, you know, uh, he, Daniel, I, Daniel, I know you have to go. I just have one final question for you, uh, which is. Where would you draw the line as far as any intervention from the United States when it comes to, uh, you know, s solving uh, the situation in Venezuela? Look, what I, what I think is that we need to take the regime out. It's not just Maduro. It's not, you know, the State Department put forward a plan, which is ridiculous. The whole entire government. <laughs> uh, we need to take out the entire criminal enterprise, right? The generals, all these people. And that's a hard task. And I think that the only way to do it, the realistic way, is a, is a real threat of force. It's telling Maduro, look, you have these days to go out, otherwise we're just going to go there and actually take you out personally. Or do a take, lot of killing. Or take specific yeah. members of the regime. And yeah, them. I mean, I agree with ending yeah. Maduro's life, just like with any terrorist, like Osama bin Laden. Um, and not just take him, right? We have to take other people, Good scare Lord. everybody else who's left, and tell them, you know, you can go and live freely in Cuba, Take all your money. We just want the country to be free so that people can stop starving in the street and eating from the trash because the socialist policies of price controls, of nationalizations, of everything, inflation, crime, all those things, you know. We want a exile of 5 million people of us, like Maria, like Andres, like myself, yeah, who have had to leave our country because of those policies. Okay. That's very, I mean, hey, that's cool. You, you're you willing to admit this. But uh, the thing is, here's the situation right now with why even something like, uh, why even the, the, the attempted coup or whatever with, uh, with Silver Corps failed. Uh, right now, most most of Latin America, South America, they're in a crisis right now over, uh, you know, the Wuhanic plague that's kind of ravaging the world. And I think no one wants to start, you know, no one wants to d get into a, let, let's say basically a regime change type of situation in Dude, Venezuela. Dude, we just did. We just did. Well, you have no evidence of that. I don't think Wait. that's true. No, no, no. I'm just saying, like, once once we get into Venezuela, like you're sending. Oh, I don't mean there. you, exile judge. I meant Daniel. Yeah. Uh, oh. <laughs> no. There's okay. no more oil in Venezuela. It, it, there's no value to it. We won't be yeah. there for long. So, so middle. Yeah. So the thing, the situation is the middle. Like you know, we're already withdrawing troops from like. Not just you know Latin America, but also um, in the Middle East. I think if, if people can like you know people can like actively observe this right now, and you know even like Iran, like everyone's almost getting kind of laid back with okay, Iranians now see U.S. troops leaving. It's like I don't really think they're planning on doing any kind of like uh, you know a new fronted war out here, and, it, and it's right because we're all scared shitless about. You know the entire DOD, who are all run by boomers, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're exactly. gonna like you're gonna send your Marines out into these like like zone like areas and zones of uh, foreign conflicts where they could like where all the <laughs> where everyone could like entire platoons will be uh, you know infected with COVID. They're gonna go like 
you know, and it's going to probably infect the entire like Department of Defense sooner or later. Or how is it really going to be effective in trying to run, you know, control and run things? We're trying to police our own in this country to keep this like uh, like the infection, the, the pandemic down. And and, general, so it, judge, it, I, I see this ending in one of three ways uh, because we have all this frustration and it has somewhere to go. Have a mic. Um, <laughs> it can either end in war with Iran, war with China, or civil war. But it's got to go somewhere mm-hmm. unless you know the government gives some amount of meaningful aid to citizens who are you know barricaded up in their homes the union will likely dissolve or we're going to go to war how do you see I mean, the that's, outcome i don't I, you see I'll leave love. okay daniel okay. DiMartino, so, thank you so much for joining us we appreciate it okay uh, daniel. Wait, guys i, I gotta go really good. quick i have something else to do but thank you for the invitation maria it was a pleasure for you to join us thank you so much Nice to meet you for five seconds. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, I just, I, well, uh, is anyone going to have, and anyone else saying their goodbyes? Because I just wanted to just say that, you know, the military is definitely planning on just, you know, a legitimate withdrawal of forces almost everywhere because everyone's just too freaking paranoid about this bug that's going around. Okay. I don't like, you know, uh, the state, you know, you know, Rhino Marines, like you know, that are stationed out in uh, the Middle East, they're gonna go. They're what? But there's gonna be an activation of medical units, like our mil, like the military industrial, our military itself is actually one of the most like uh, underrated, or like um, I would say, I don't know if it's underrated, but kind of overlooked in terms of like the amount of medical personnel that that it, it employs as a military as a, you know as as a, like as a large military structure you have like you know the entire na- fleet of navy corpsmen and uh you know army medics and they're going to be had they're going to have to be activated over this crisis you know people have to be you know tents got to be set up where if if uh this pandemic spreads everywhere if we're once we're going to open up that uh you know open up the economy again for people because I, I don't think people really get the point how bad this is you know i think the greatest irony is just that I do blame China in, in, in the notion that, okay, they did actively try covering it up. But the thing is, the same, like, libertarian right-wing type folks that are just like, hey, we got to, like, you got to bring the economy back and everyone has to, you know, everyone should just go back to being free and being consumerist. They, they don't realize, like, okay, <laughs> you know, and you're just saying it's just a flu. It's like, yo, you know, China, Iran, these countries, they're fucking lying about how many people are dead. You know, once, once, um, you know, like China probably had uh, like tens of thousands of people die over this pandemic. Could be a million. Um, it, I mean, you, you could, yeah, that mean, it could be pushing up to six figures. I, I mean, I wouldn't even, you know, Seven, first, man. K- Kimberly, Kimberly Coulter, your gears are, your gears are turning. <laughs> well, the fact of the matter is, like, we do understand that there are more deaths in China that are being reported. But we also know on the other end of that, on the other side of that coin, sorry, I messed that up, but we have hospitals across the United States, funeral homes, uh, nurses, doctors, who are all testifying to the fact that the numbers here are grossly inflated. And not only are they inflated, they're, ju- they're, they're just marking deaths off people who also had COVID, but they're putting down COVID for people who never even were tested for it in the first place. Not Kimberly, to mention that's exactly of- wrong. In New York State, they're inflating the number they're actually admitting the nursing homes are admitting to a much larger count of dead. Um, Cuomo himself has said so. They didn't want to actually report the accurate number because they didn't want the homes to look like horror houses. Oh, but uh, by the way, before New York State, before this we is keep... not getting it's 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 not you're, a conspiracy. Muted, okay, before we dying. keep going. Okay, before we keep going I mean, with COVID nineteen, we're gonna go no back. Guys, we're going to no, go back to COVID-19. Population. It's Man. the exact opposite. Muted. We're going to go back to COVID-19. Look, you're still first... muted. Oh, okay. okay. Muted. okay hey, so this, this, okay, this, this, here we go. Here we go. Okay, so before we get back to COVID-19, I want to bring it up to Andres, who unfortunately has to go. Uh, so, Andres, please say in short what your experience has been like and any final comments. Or, in fact, I would love for you to answer this question from DS. Hey there, do you feel that executing Maduro or inter- intervention in the country could have a negative outcome? I do understand the measures that are needed, 
I do worry about the retaliation. Well, the main problem, <clears throat> the main problem in Venezuela is that it, it's the problem that everyone gets wrong about what is going on. The, the solution to Venezuela is not a political one because there is there is no politicians in power in Venezuela. There are criminals, there are terrorists, there are narco terrorists. So you can't seek a political solution with them. So what is some, well, actually what is a political solution? A political solution is where you recognize the one that is on the other side of the table because you respect the other important points of view when you actually can reach an agreement. But these people in Venezuela, they don't care any agreement. They only care about maintaining power, maintaining all the privilege they have. So uh, unless you give them another another privilege and power in another way, there is no way they're going to negotiate anything with them. It's like trying to negotiate, you know, with someone that has hostage a, a whole country because they're kidnapping the whole country. When so it's not actually a state, it's a criminal enterprise run by all these militaries in the cartels. So that when you understand the reality, when you understand the nature of the evil with, between the regime in Venezuela, you understand that the only solution is when their heads are running around, around the floor. There's no other solution with these people because they have been killed in Venezuelans for many, many, many years. And when they, in my, my experience, I, I live in, when we're starting a conversation, I live in the, in the I used to live uh, just one year ago uh, in the most dangerous place in Venezuela, that is Petare. I mean, I, I got robbed twice the same day with two completely different gangs at gunpoint. I got used to, you know, seeing my own classmates dismay because there was no food to, to, to in the university. Or even I just eating one or two meals a day because sometimes I just gave whatever I had to some friends that they didn't have anything. Getting used to when you graduate from university in Venezuela, well, you never know who's going to die. Like one of my friends, he got stabbed 70 times in the middle of the street just to take his phone away. Just one week after he graduated in 2017. Andrew, so I, I you, gotta... you, bec you become you become too com too common with violence in Venezuela because that's the way to control the population through collectivos to all to solve the gangs that they have around him. So when Andre, you understand gotta... that nature, there is no political solution. In I, I got a question. I got a question for you, Andre. So uh, yes. what's the situation with the? Uh, do you feel it? Or I don't, I don't, are you in the? Are you in Venezuela right now? Or are you in the? No, US? no. I mean here in the in the U.S. I only have one year here in the U.S. Okay, great. Uh, sorry, <laughs> that's great. But uh, I mean, I hope you want to stay. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, like, I, I, I don't know. It was not my plan to stay here. I'm actually okay. an asylum option because I have to, okay. a lot of problems with the collectivists. It right. was not my plan to stay here. But so no. what's the situation with, um, what do you think is going to happen with the pandemic? Because it feels the government is obviously kind of lying about how they're keeping it under control too. You just mean the Venezuelan thing. government? Yes. I mean, it seems like they want to save face, just like in how like Iran and China, like Iran wouldn't let healthcare workers. I mean, they'll, they'll complain about these embargoes and sanctions and the much needed medical equipment being blocked. And I understand that. But then when they actually say, okay, we'll come in, we'll also bring in our like medical volunteers. They say, don't don't bring your medical volunteers in and we're, we're paranoid. Uh, there's going to be spies. It's like, they're going to be just there at the hospital helping, you know, COVID patients out. So what do you think is going to be, what's the situation with epidemic wise? Because I mean, it's going to happen all over Latin America. It's not just a single out of Venezuela, but you know, Brazil, everyone's going to have their fucking problems too. But What's the situation? Yeah, well, the, the, well, just, uh, just something about the sanctions. Usually people and the government raises that argument that the sanctions, uh, they, they don't allow them to get medical supplies. When you read the text of the sanctions that have been implemented from last year, because the, the act, these kind of act, uh, sanctions, general sanctions on the country started last year. Before 2019, the sanctions were on individual, financial in sanctions in individuals. And these sanctions that were implemented since last year, they don't apply to medical supplies. They don't apply to humanitarian aid. So actually, the, the regime in Venezuela can get those supplies if they actually have the will to do it. The, okay. the sanctions don't apply to that. The thing is that they don't have the will to do it. And the, and the problem with this pandemic in this kind of authoritarian government is that it's a perfect, a perfect excuse to implement even more control on the population. So what I tell people here in the U.S., for example, is that when you see some that, that I understand the, the argument that in some states there is more authoritarian measures and in other states and all that, I tell them that <clears throat> I get I, I, I don't feel that I'm different in some measures that have been taken do you, do you support... than what I used to be in Venezuela. Because in Venezuela, we already had all these measures before the sanctions, before the pandemic. We were used to be controlled by the government in every single sense of our lives. So what's going to happen in Venezuela is going to be really sad because we if, if you don't trust the numbers of the U.S. government regarding the pandemic, can't imagine that you're going to trust the numbers of the Venezuelan regime. 
they're, they're way worse than the people is thinking. You actually have the reports of but people it, on the ground. It's, it's way worse than can you But, but you say, like, even, even the government itself has trouble trying to control, like, the criminal element of the population. You know, uh, but but in terms of that, like, what's this? What's the sentiment among Venezuelans about wearing masks? And like, I, I see everyone's wearing masks. Like, you know, in people Venezuela? in California, in California, everyone's wearing masks now. But uh, yeah, it's in Venezuela, Latin America. No, no. Well, I, I had to argue all that because I uh, I actually started wearing masks here. Well, I, I live in Washington D.C. Like one month and a half ago, when actually the CDC said that you know, in the beginning they said that it was not going to be like uh, uh, yeah. they, they, it was mandatory. But then they said that yeah, everyone should wear masks. But in Venezuela, the regime said that everyone should start using masks since the beginning. So I, actually, yes, I mean, I, that's what I, I was telling you where you saw that, because I'll, I, everyone in Venezuela tries to use masks, but at, at least so far. The problem is that eventually people at ours are going to run out of masks. And the problem in Venezuela that you have on, on, bottom, on top of all of that is that we don't have gasoline. We have a massive shortage of gasoline. So wow. you, have a lot, you have a lot of raids of people outside the street protests of people that they don't have food, they don't have job, they don't have the, the salary, that was, it was a miserable salary, but you know, it was something. They don't have anything and they don't have gasoline. So they don't care about mass at this point, Venezuela. That's what, it, what, that's what it's, it's going to be a really sad situation. Because what you think in Venezuela, in the US, for example, that Daniel was saying before, that maybe we did reach to a point, when, a point where we have a civil war here where the people don't trust the government. Just imagine in Venezuela, people didn't trust the government before. They don't trust it anymore right now, and they don't have anything left. So there is, we actually are, believe that if the situation is, goes you, far, we want to have a serious civil, civil problem in Venezuela. Do you know about any, like, the problems with overflowing hospitals over this right now? Are you getting any word about that? Any, like, any legit word you could trust to say the hospitals are being kind of overflowing with COVID patients? Over this well, uh, where I used to live, and you can check that out, I used to live in El Llanito, and El Llanito is a part of Petare, and the biggest, uh, one of the biggest hosp uh, public hospitals in Venezuela, it was just a, a blocks away from my house, it's called the Domingo Luciani uh, Hospital. So I, before the pandemic, it was overflow. It was usual to see people sleeping outside with gunshots in their, in their body, waiting for, you know, enter the, the hospital. Oh. So yes, right now, you have also the people with gunshots, but you have people that they think that they have COVID-19, they think they know they have it, or whatever. But they are they were overflow before before the pandemic. So now it's it's way worse. Uh, so even the economics, because it seems like uh, have the government made any mandates? Are they closing down all the shops? And was is that the new mandate now, or are they change, like? No, they they were doing it before for before. I mean, they they shut down basically and anything. I mean, there there is people working from their from their home, like here, if, if their job uh, allows them to work from home. But it, 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 everything else is shut down. And if you had also the problem with gasoline, is that no one can make deliveries, no one can make uh, the trucks that they were, you know, meant to take uh, supplies, whatever. They don't have gasoline. So you can't they, make they, cocaine they either, by the way. You can't make cocaine either, by the way. That's how like they you you the cocaine is like it's the requirement ingredient in. in well, they, it, it, it turns gasoline. out that in the the whole narcotic scheme from Venezuela, the the cocaine was not produced in Venezuela. What used to be producing in Bolivia on under the Morales government. It, well, it's known that more, Bolivia is one of is the biggest producer of cocaine. So the the scheme was from Bolivia to Venezuela to the rest of the, you know the the northern side. So, well, that would, since Morales fall in, in Bolivia, the shortage of the, produce, the production of cocaine started to come down, and they started to produce more in the Colombian frontier with the parks and the ELM. So they, they don't have the same amount of But when you have like a gas, gasoline shortage, that's like, that's like a required like ingredient with, with this, you know, with like street cocaine, not factory cocaine or whatever. Yeah, yeah, uh, of course. You need the gasoline to take to, to move the truck. You need the gasoline to move the, the airplanes that are, good, that are flying around. You also need all of that. You need gasoline for everything. And, and Venezuela, one of the most oil-rich nations in the world, it does, they can't even produce gas. That's yeah, we have all kind of, of petroleum. We have heavy petroleum, we have uh, light petroleum, we have, we have the biggest What, what explains uh, the gas uh, shortage? Uh, what explains the gas shortage then, in terms of, did all the contracts... Uh, uh, we have to go back before Chavez. Venezuela nationalized the oil industry in 1976. And when that happens, they bought the whole industry from the American companies. Before that, there were concessions with the, with the, with the American companies. When, when they nationalized the oil industry, and especially the Yom Kippur War in those years in the 70s, the, the government just get a lot of money because the oil prices went up. So the, the government was always, since the 76, in charge of the oil, produ of the oil production. 
at some point they were doing well. Venezuela was to, it used to be known as the Saudi uh, Venezuela because we, they, they, there was a, 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 a saying in Venezuela, it's cheap, give me two, that people were, were feeling that they were rich or somehow. It, it was common for people to even come to Miami in the 80s to come to buy, buy stuff and just go back like anything because they all was giving a lot of money. When the prices went down and the government starting not, uh, putting polit politicians in charge of the industry instead of technicians, things started going down, going down, going down, going down. When Chavez went to when rich power in 1999, he just went deeply more in the nationalization of the oil industry because there were some concessions in the late 90s because yeah. of the whole Washington agreement, a lot of uh, countries in Latin America starting to try to liberalize some part of the economy. In Venezuela was a case in 1994, but when Chavez arrived, he just went back to all that and he gained the whole power, not just of the oil industry, also the steel industry, the agricultural industry. Every single major industry in the, in the, in the country was taking over the hands of the, uh, of the government in Venezuela. And what happened is that they were sucked at it. They went back to bankruptcy of every single industry that they, that they took, every single one of them. And when they ran out of the industries, they started taking uh, a small businesses, medium businesses. And their own problem, when you see the numbers, they, the production is starting to go down since Chavez down, down, down. And right now we only have uh, 500,000 um, barrels produced in Venezuela, which is which is, 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 is stupid. Venezuela used to be 3 million uh, pro, uh, barrels produced. We, we were one of the top in the world. Right now we don't even sell the barrels. We actually trade barrels from food. There is an agreement between Venezuela and regime and some Mexican company, but they just give barrel and they get Mexican food. That's what they also, that's also an agreement with the Iranian government. When I was in Venezuela a year ago, we had this social program from the government called the Clack Box Boxes, where every single household will receive a, house, a box of food because you know the government is, is, is wonderful that is giving you a box of food. The thing is, when you open the box of food, you will see Iranian rice, Mexican milk. Turkish uh, pasta, you will see all the uh, food from the allies of the regime that were just trading barrels from food. And that's just one way. Oh, that they, okay, they yeah, that. yeah. It's, it's funny you mentioned that stuff about Saudi Arabia just because um, I, I think most Saudis, uh, they don't really have the, the uh, how do you say, the, the population um, pool or the human capital of having petroleum engineers, but like you have, but they're all. Like they're all British guys, like like university engineers, like petroleum engineers making the gasoline. Um, I did one 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 thing to really consider is how important, like you mentioned, like the in terms of scale or how it's done. Uh, you know, a government contract goes to people that actually know how to do things, right? In terms of infrastructure, and like in the case of uh, you know uh, Silvercore, they 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 were not a very competent company, and <laughs> then you saw you saw what unfolded from there. But I think people really need to understand, like, what, what it, what, how much, like, the production values and like how much technician skills it takes to maybe make make something like movies or, um, you know, get contracted to like, you know, yeah. produce yeah. jeans for people. But, uh, but yeah, I think that gets really overlooked, and that's really, really unfortunate. Like, you know, Venezuela, like, they don't even have gasoline producers anymore, which is well, right now. Yeah. I mean, there's something called Corona, um, which is has uh, driven the barrel of uh, oil value down into the negative. So I don't think that's a really fair comparison to use right now because you can't buy oil. It's, it's unpurchasable. It's ridiculous. That's why- No, but, but Venezuela is an oil producer. Venezuela, well, the, the thing, thing is that, it just to clarify the thing about the, the, the negative price, that happened, uh, if I'm not mistaken, just a few weeks ago, but it was just a matter of one day. It was because of the, it was the Texan the Texan index of oil. It was not the actual because in the oil industry you have several indexes. I'm, you have the one in, the, sure. in, the, in Britain, you have the Russian yeah. index, you have the Saudi, you have many indexes. So the Texan one was the one that went negative for one day because it wasn't they were the, the agreement between Russia and the Saudis in the OPEC was still being made. So when that happens, alongside with the Corona, of course, because the Corona it plays a huge a huge role in all of this, the price went negative. But right now it's not negative. Right now it's a, I don't I think I just saw it. It's around ten or twenty. It's but it's not negative anymore. But it's, it's not in any way. It's not virtually negative because there's there's a glut. For instance, farmers here are fucking burying potatoes and and slaughtering pigs and burying them and burning them. There is no demand. If there's no demand, it has no value. I am a capitalist. I believe in capitalism, and I believe in a fucking strong safety net. 
the same time. You can't blame anyone for the decline in the price of oil. You can't blame it on mismanagement. There simply is no demand. Oh, well, no, but, but in terms of for Venezuela, they are a oil producer. They have oil. It's just that they don't have the engineers anymore <laughs> to, or, you know, you know, to produce the gasoline. Yeah. And uh, it, which and then now they they have a, a you know gasoline shortage which is kind of unprecedented. But can we see your we face? Are. Like, can you come on? It's like if I had like a big fucking strong avatar, I'd be really confident too. Oh like, uh, yeah, I just <laughs> uh, yeah, I was I, just, I, I yeah, I could send like a pic photo of me at at like uh in, in this chat, right? Is Dude, that... IRL right now. What are you waiting for? It's only right, it's only it. me. Love. Yeah, I'll, I'll totally. This is gonna be answer. so exciting. We're Wait, finally. Okay. Wait, is there a way to freaking send a photo on the Zoom app? Now I feel like an idiot. Come on, like, like a on them. You don't want to, you know. Okay, well I'll get, I'll get, I'll flash it on Twitter. <laughs> I, I flash my face on Twitter. <laughs> All right. So, uh, anyway, uh, damn. Hey, is it cool if I just say goodbye at this point or what? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I don't. I don't want you to be scared off. But first, I wanted to get a word from Kimberly Coulter. You've been sitting here all this time, all this talk about Venezuela. Then we went to Iran, Saudi Arabia, and also I want to apologize to uh, the uh, guests for any of the chaos that may have been spreading uh, in the midst of this conversation. But you guys are the best. I love you guys so much. You guys are so awesome. So, uh, Kimberly. Let, let us just know what you think about Kimberly, this. I, I have to go. So just to say that I, I love the chat and all, and all of you. We, we can have this conversation again, especially with Daniel about capitalism. And we had many uh, common points. It's just that the conversation didn't pay, didn't get to that point. But we actually had many common points. I believe in capitalism with a safety net. You have to help the, the, the so I believe in that. But we, that's something for some, for some uh, another moment. So thank you guys for the opportunity. and. And stay safe, stay safe in these days. God bless you. you too. Thank God you. Bless. Thank Have you. a good one. Um, so did you want did you want me to just kind of jump in with where I'm at? Yes, jump in with you, where you where you're at. Um well, we, I mean, me and me and uh me and Dan here have a little side chat going in the in the in the sidebar. I, I noticed. <laughs> I think I'm going to go and then watch from the sidelines and have dinner, and I don't want to be chomping into my microphone, but I'm interested in watching you guys go at it. So Sounds good. And if you have any comments, write them down in the chat. Yep. Yeah, please do. And join us back if you want. Yep, I shall be around. Yay. And also, we have one more person coming in later on, my friend John Gonzalez. We met back at the uh, Zubi meetup, and uh, he is also an expat from Venezuela. And I look forward to hearing what he has to say about this whole this whole situation. Does that mean Remzo is blowing us off? No, Remzo may be coming back. We are trying to get Remzo. I am not going to rest until I get Remzo. Yo, I'll give him a lot of shit for you if you want. <laughs> no, it's fine. I appreciate yeah, it, though. <laughs> okay, so what were you guys chatting back and forth about with a uh, with the ch chat text? Um, so we just kind of have a fundamental disagreement about the COVID testing, and um, I don't I don't actually know anything about you. I'm sorry, um, but I don't really know much about your background. But I myself, I I'm an investigative journalist with the National File. I've been following COVID since. Uh, a the beginning of January and from everything that I've gleaned from my own research and from my own um, like following of these exposés including the Project Veritas leaks um, from the funeral homes and from the actual hospitals including other doctors and um, uh, nurse testimonies that there are people who are inflating more than um, under reporting the case um, the cases of COVID and not just the cases of COVID, but those who are actually tested, those who test positive, those who um, had tested positive when they passed away. And a big reason for that is because the federal government in the United States of America is saying that with higher rates of infection and higher rates of death, you're going to get higher um, federal aid, you're going to get more federal aid, you're going to get more consistent federal aid. And there are hospitals, and I believe New York is a prime example, where they are taking advantage of this, and they're falsifying r records, and they're inflating numbers, when 
a lot, when honestly a lot of the evidence and I can't I don't want to say this definitively because I don't have definitive evidence that this is true but it seems that most of the positive cases of coronavirus as of right now are coming from people who are staying at home they're not people who are interacting with the world around them but do we so, know but do we know sorry to cut you off but do we know that other people did not come to their home who have uh, COVID-19 like their relatives or friends I don't, I don't think that there's a way to test that, but I think that with the numbers that I'm reading, if the numbers that I'm reading are actu are accurate, there's no way that all of these people are staying home and then just saying like, oh, F it, like have Bobby Sue from next door come over and we'll have a cocktail hour. These are, it seems like these are people who f followed closely the stay at home protocols, which means in my mind, if I'm going to take an educated guess, these are people who are wiping down their boxes when they get mail. These are people who are putting on face masks, putting on, you know, protective gear on their heads and their and their hands. And um, see, you'd expect that. But I have a friend of a friend who had some can that she got in the mail, didn't wipe it out, just uh, opened the can right up and started eating. This was when, uh, you know, things were very hectic as they are still now. So she should have known better not to do that yet she did never be surprised by the stupidity of most people okay let me let me if i can lev and, and kim like posit an argument at you and maybe change your mind on this okay um i think that two things are true one is that there's corruption and there's a financial incentive to some hospitals to over report covid right yeah done yes. okay yeah. secondly um if we go by some people's analysis, nobody died of AIDS because they all died of pneumonia. So how do we separate these statistics apart, right? Um, let's take the death count in February, March, and April in New York City. Um, and let's take it from 2019, 2018, and 2017. And if you look at the death count in New York City for those three years, you'll find that the um, death rate in 2020 is about 23,000 more people. Now, New York's official statistics, I think it's about 19,000 deaths. Okay. But from 2019, February, March, April, 23,000 deaths. So I would argue to you that COVID deaths are actually underreported. Now, you could argue to me, if you really wanted to, that you know the difference between 2019 and 2020 is because we made people stay indoors and they died from being indoors and you may have some point to that um because because people might fucking be killing themselves in isolation but if there's 23,000 more deaths in 2020 during a 90-day period than 2019 then i think you can fairly argue that the statistics are underreported rather than overreported. I do actually have a response to that. Um, Please. And I'm surprised it took me so long to remember it. And mm. I would be happy to look it up and substantiate what I'm saying. But there's um, there are people who are coming out of New York out of, uh, I believe there is the testimony I heard, I believe, was from a nurse mm. um, that there the people who are dying in new york right now a lot of the people who are dying is not necessarily because of covid but because of complications due to um intubating and yeah. i think that that is a major sure. issue i think that that definitely spiked the number of deaths and um and again i can't personally substantiate this claim so i'm gonna right. throw out the alleged uh yeah. bar but right. allegedly according to some of these nurses people are just being allowed to die or put in situations where they're more likely to die so You're i correct. think I so it. i think that even if even with the spike in numbers i think that there's so much to think about when it comes to the COVID-19 situation um, when, it, you know, there was like all these like, oh, the hospitals are overflowed, but they're not. And we don't have enough masks and ventilators, but we did and we sent them away and um, people we are did. dying. Because we sent them away. Yeah. We, Kim, we have less hospital beds in 2020 than we did in 1975 because the pharmaceutical industry decided that pills were more profitable than people and you can look at other countries you go to other even even english speaking nations if you want the most analogous conversation that we can have look at fucking new zealand and australia they're done with this they're finished 
we're just beginning. We have 3,000 deaths a day. That's more than the average of, of deaths per day. Boomer remover. In 2019. Boomer remover. So, yeah, I'm not going to even comment on that, even though I might smirk. But, uh, but, uh, but yes, mo it's mostly old people who are dying. Um, our state government deserves some blame for people. For, but I love my grandma, so fuck all of you. But in the same moment, yeah. okay. maybe my I grandma's like to, not alive. I don't know. I so, so guys, yeah. I want to change the subject back into Venezuela. We're in an interesting oh. situation since we do not currently have one Venezuelan <laughs> in the chat, uh. but there is one Venezuelan who is coming, and there is one Latin X who should be coming to pretty soon Remzo Martinez but before that I wanted to open this conversation up since we do have a military guy here we have exile judge I want to open this conversation up to where do you think America should stand in foreign policy but also we have a comment from and uh oh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name Peiname Shifei uh has okay he says Hezbollah is a proxy of the Iranian regime in Lebanon. And yes, we're not. Yeah, we're not the only countries with fronts or allegiance of groups of you know throughout the world. We have like I mean everyone from CIA and then you know I mean Iran. Iran is its own power and actor. It's uh you know herself. So it, yeah, they had she she uses Hezbollah by proxy. Um, the Chinese probably you have front groups everywhere as well as part of. You know the Chinese Communist Party, but whatever. But yeah, so, I, don't, I don't know. I, so that's far, kind of known for information. So as far as uh, American policy goes, exile judge. I mean, it's a very broad question. You know, like the whole grand chessboard. But uh, where do you stand on how far should America go to, you know, stop like, for example, the spread of China or the spread of Russia intruding into other countries? And okay, well, this... uh, here's the thing. I don't think any, and, and no one, no one's really contained it. So, I mean, the Chinese have been lying about their numbers, so I don't know how bad they still have it or if it's if the, the virus is mutating and then spreading, like, forever. I don't like to put myself in a position where I'm going to, um, uh, you know, I'm going to okay. do another 180 when, when circumstances change. And, of course, I, I will. But, um, but in terms of, like, with what's going on with China, I mean, I would say, well, we should get we, – we're, we're getting the fuck out of the Middle East. And uh, and I think that's ultimately a good thing, and we're doing that. But um, and but in the situation with uh, Latin America is like we will support you know anti-Maduro sentiments activities in Venezuela, but we're getting you know, but we're not going to intervene. Like some guy decided to go, like a like a like a independent actor who which was Silver Core and Jordan, this Green Beret guy, and I wanted to be like his, like his own like be. Uh, you know, be make his own Blackwater type company and become like the next Derek Prince. He he did some cool attempt, but you know the C, like CIA State Department they were they were just like hands off, like what the fuck are you doing, man? Like you, you know, they were even even you know I've been reading up reports. They've been telling them that if you know making uh, just, just suggesting to you know because discouraging them to do anything crazy in Venezuela because they're not going to send Marines out there and put them at risk getting infected with. Uh, you know, COVID nineteen. Everyone's at. Everyone's just afraid. Like you know, within our hemisphere, we can't. We're not able to police things going within the nation. Let alone thinking we're gonna even like uh, put it this way. Uh, uh, you know, stay faithful to the Monroe Doctrine and try to control things in the hemisphere when we can't. We can't do anything about that with with uh, with this pandemic that's kind of unleashed on the world. Um, so any when when people ask me how did you how would you feel about Chinese movements or things in the sea? Well, yeah, let them go ahead and try, and then see if they're going to get infected by COVID again or having some, like a new pandemic once they're trying to you know take things over. Uh, once you know we be, we, we decline in power. Exile but I think judge, we don't need to combat anyone. We just have, need to take our manufacturing base back to the USA. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, and we we have uh, we right. could be, I mean. Yeah, uh, F thirty five. I mean, we produce more F thirty fives than any other country in the world. I don't see something, some like like a billionaire, uh, you know, uh, over engineer project like that. I, I can't. I can imagine we could build a lot more ventilators in that regard. We don't need more ventilators. Ventilators you know? are a disaster. We need we need oh, masks. Well. 
You know, yeah. we can't even manufacture a fucking mask in this country. No, we're no, we're no, no, no. We're, we, we How are, are we going to beat China in a war? What the yeah, fuck yeah, are you yeah, talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, my, oh. my, my pillow guy is making quite a few. Apparently. I was just going to say that guy. pillow guy. Oh, and by, and by the way, I want to exchange, I want to exchange a formal invitation to pay Maya Shafei to come on this program. I will send you the Zoom link, just uh, DM me on Twitter. In fact, I'm going to leave this DM me on Twitter thing for whoever else is interested in taking part in the discussion. But uh, I've always been very fascinated by Iran, its history, and uh, just all the great contributions that it's made to this world. So open invitation, I would love for you to come in. So, and who is this guy, by the way, or girl? I don't want to misgender. Who is this? Uh, how dare you misgender? No, his name is Max. 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 Oh my God, Max. Max Whoa. is Max is very adorable. I love Max. So. I know, Kimberly. What do you think? Holding this beautiful pupper. What do you think about America's foreign policy situation? What should it be? Is it in the right place now? Should it change? Um. Honestly, at this point, uh, in where we are in our country, I'm not very inclined towards being interventionalist when it comes to any other country. Uh, I think that we're kind of drowning in our own uh, lack of preparedness. And I, while I realize that there are other nations who do rely on America, you can't, you can't subsist on the fact that like we're the only ones maintaining any kind of baseline of uh, um, substantiation for your, your, your nation. Um, I am first and foremost, America first. I am a hundred percent, you know, I'm a patriot to this country. And I think that we are too interventionalists when it comes to other countries. I think that we can't afford that at least as far as where we're at right now, especially with COVID-19. Um, if the deaths really are underreported, um, you know, regardless of COVID-19, I think that we already spend too much money on other countries, basically. Well, I'm also tired of a lot of these proxy wars. I just, uh, the only thing that still bothers me is that when it comes to nations that are, let's say, more warmongering, like Russia, as far as acquiring a uh, portion of Ukraine, acquiring a portion of uh, Georgia, there is still this idea that countries have that acquiring more land is I mean, going I to think, bring more prosperity. I mean, I think with the situation with Russia, and I mean, I'm, I support, you know, um, you know, Ukraine independence movements, you know, to a certain extent for their own like, state sovereignty, so to speak. But understand, like, I think you also got to understand the Russian mindset where we never dissolved NATO, NATO after the dissolution the of the Soviet Union. And when we, when we, when you look it in the eyes of how Russians feel about NATO and American troops, and um, you know being stationed out in Western Europe, supposedly against this unspeakable, you know, enemy power, they're all prepping up against. You know that builds more of a paranoia towards them. And also, it's also you got to factor in the fact it's hard to control countries. You know, it's regardless of how many. Well, look at um, look at Egypt. Egypt was once Israel's enemy, no more. Like people have this idea of there being like this plan for a greater Israel. But if, for example, Egypt is already, let's say, calmed the fuck down and doesn't want to do anything bad to Israel, what does Israel care now? You know, Egypt and Israel can get along. I think the same thing could happen with these other countries. But at least judging from the mentality of people we know in Russia. Their mentality is if we can do something that would reduce the quality of life for whoever happens to be around us, be it Ukraine, be it uh, Georgia, you know, be but it, uh, is it yeah, Latvia. But is, that, is it really happening, though? I think they might they'll have some arguments and territorial disputes. But by the way, in, in terms of but it's already got, happened with Ukraine. It's already happened. OK, Lev, Lev, can I register a complaint? Go for I it. To, I need to register a complaint with the show. So I, I haven't slept or had a haircut in eight weeks and exile judge is just like flaunting his avatar. <laughs> you know, this is outrageous. He should be on camera, you know, because he's a muscle man. He can't see his face. He can't see his eyes or his insecurities. It's not fair. It's not fair. I was, like, I was in, uh, I was, those yeah, of us well, who I are said, human. 
I, I sent you the link. The, wait, did you see the chat? I, Dude, I, do I look want to like, see your face moving in I, real I look time. like uh, Freddie Freddy Wong. I don't want uh, to. I don't have. Yeah, I want to. Wait, who, who's Freddie Wong? Who's well, Freddie Wong? It's short for what for what it's worth. Freddie Wong. <laughs> for, for what it's worth. F W I W. But in any case, <laughs> Freddie Wong, listen, you got to show your face. Look, my eyes dart around. My head moves too much. We're all visible. You're a superhero. This is not fair. Yeah, well, I gotta, uh, well, I gotta get exit off the chat. I gotta uh, set up a connect to, <laughs> for me to. You this. Know, I, I don't know. There's no evidence for me to know whether or not uh, you have to go through all these steps. Maybe there's a camera. I don't have a webcam, but the only webcam Kim I have is, is my connect. Diplomatic here. Do you have a mobile phone, Exile Judge? Do you have yes, a mobile I phone? Do. Okay. Actually, I do. How about we use that? How you could call that? back, go to Zoom. Uh, yeah. God damn, you guys really want me to see my fucking face. Yes, we do. You can put your penis there, too. It doesn't matter. <laughs> like, something. Please don't do that. Okay, sorry. Vic <laughs> Vicarano <laughs> says... D so, Victoria says, don't drink and steam. But you know what? I think that sometimes alcohol does bring out some honesty in people at a certain point. And, exactly. Uh, exactly. Right, Costco is gonna, hey, yo, Costco's going to close in an hour right now for me. So I'm gonna go right now. Oh yeah, bullshit! Maybe, you're not yeah, human. Yeah, you're yeah, a bot. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, you, you didn't. Like, you didn't say I'm anything about going yeah, before. Today. Oh, you, fuck. one day, Mr. Caden, one day you'll see. Me. <laughs> yeah. One day. I'm, gonna hold I'm looking you forward. Guys. All right, later, guys. All Bye, right. Wong. Take care. So now we are in a very interesting situation. We do not have Exile <laughs> Judge. We do not have people from Venezuela. I think Remzo may show up to say hello. At least that's what uh, Levin Jules, or it, rather Jules. Is it Jules. fault or is it my fault? Uh, no, I think that this is all a matter of, uh, you know, just it takes time. It takes time. It I does. think people are going to open up much more in these uh, coming years. I just think that there's been this stigma of wanting to, you know, you want to hide your face to make sure that, yeah, I guess you you don't you don't get hurt. But personally, I think that that's bullshit yeah. because I have an asymmetrical face. I don't care. No, no, I don't um, even th I don't even think it's that. I just think that uh, you know some people like having a mask to hide themselves from whatever repercussions. <laughs> but personally, I think that whatever whatever things happen in our lives. We're all human, well, Lev, you and we're look all beautiful. here. Look, thank you. Well, you're be like behind that green you. screen, your glasses are perfectly cleaned. You know, it's yes, Chris. But it doesn't matter where we are at this level, because we gotta no. help each other up, get to a higher level, right? Yeah. Exactly. That that that's what it's all about, and yeah. that's the same thing that I wish for all the uh, Venezuelan people. Cause Me too. One thing that I would wish, though, is that there would have been one person on the left who would have joined us for this conversation. I mean, Daniel, you're so you're sort of there, but I mean, I'm like, really on the left. I mean, like, somebody, like like a tank. Who's an idiot? Oh, well, here's the thing. <laughs> I want to I want to bring, and this is you a question. A partisan. That I was, yes, yeah. well, this is a question that I was asking before to everybody before uh, Kimberly, you showed up. What was your experience, Kimberly, of trying to talk with people who are more left-leaning in these open conversations, open debates? Um, you mean particularly uh, about socialism or just generally trying to speak to left-leaning individuals? Well, let's start with the latter and then go to the former. Uh, well, growing up, uh, I, I believe that I was given a really false depiction of what socialism was. So I didn't really grow up understanding what that meant and the big the big mantra was like you know socialism and communism are not the same thing rah, 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 rah. <laughs> you know and um wh when it comes to when it comes to uh venezuela um i think that we can see very clearly that these are people who are suffering under socialism um and uh i don't i i haven't really had a person who can have an argument with me about it that is anything more than uh, emotional rhetoric. Um, lots of like, how dare you? And uh, what about, you know, what about ar yeah. arbitrary, arbitrary nonsense that doesn't actually yeah. affect the, the ultimate livelihood of the individual or the group. Um, and I think, and, you know, I mean, I guess that answer is the, the, fir the former too, when it comes to discussing some, discussing these policies with somebody who's considers himself on the far left or just on the, even breaching the left, um, it's hard to have the discussion without it devolving to emotional rhetoric. Right. I agree with that. 
Well, I agree with that. one conversation that I had on the subway uh, with the socialist guy talking about Venezuela had to do with the Americans enacting sanctions on Venezuela that causes the Venezuelan people to suffer. So the argument goes back to the sanctions and it also goes back to the CIA, you know, whatever Machiavellian things they do. So um, I'm honestly not all that familiar with the United States sanctions on Venezuela. So can you maybe like elaborate on that a little bit? So the sanctions happened very recently, which is again, something that okay. I wouldn't, I, th I believe it happened uh, last year. So this would not be something that I would contribute to Venezuela being in the way it is. But when you have a government like this, I understand that they're going to have all kinds of enemies that they could lay the blame on for whatever it is that's happening to them. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. I mean, and uh, it's valid. It's it, it's valid, but it goes back to this idea of a conspiracy where the CIA is the one force or one of many other intelligence agencies out there that's responsible for the world being the way it is. It's kind of like that clip from The Simpsons when you had uh, that lawyer imagining a world without lawyers and you had everybody <laughs> holding hands and uh, dancing around. I think people have the similar idea of the CIA, but... We're yeah. in a we're in a weird position though, where I don't find um, I don't find a lot of middle ground in terms of people understanding that sometimes you're going to have to have these Machiavellian people that are going to go out and do horrible things. You know, like you don't know whether the classes for the CIA or like there's an urban legend around the special forces that uh, one of their and you are not going to like this at all, Kimberly. One of their requirements would be to take a little puppy to raise it as your own and then. At the end, just uh, is that true? It's an urban legend. I don't know if it's true, but if you can imagine, like <laughs> creating a super soldier who is totally obedient, that would be kind of like you could see a movie like that, right? Where that is something that they have to do. So, regarding the CIA, yeah. this is something that I think requires a lot of research just to look at what are the most horrible things that people have been accusing the CIA of doing. So talking about various coups, but then asking the other question, if, there, if this coup that you are insinuating the CIA did never happened, what would be the outcome for that country? And it's a difficult, uh, like I'm curious what you guys think about this because it's a difficult thing to say because like I don't want people to live under a communist dictatorship. But how much responsibility would a country like America, Pax Americana, if you will, have towards stopping that if, let's say, the people themselves want there to be this uh, exquisite uh, socialist dictator, you know, to rule over them, if that's what the people want? Daniel, what do you think? Um... Okay, so let me, in a nutshell, let me say what I think. I, it, the system is, is not the point of argument. The person running the system is the point of argument. And the Russians have been pretty terrible to other Russians for a millennia, you know, whether it's under the guise of feudalism, capitalism, or communism. You guys fuck each other over so hard all the time. It's just a different fucking brand. It doesn't even We've never matter. had capitalism, though. If you're talking about that's true. If you're talking about that's imperial true. Russia, like I'm half Jewish, and the Jewish part of me was well, living in, in terms of yeah, yeah, in terms of yeah. uh, the in terms of my ancestors, the Jewish part of yeah. me was living in the Pale of Settlement. You know, yeah. way back when. Mine too, Lev. Exactly. Yeah, we same. are from we are from the same yeah. branch. We are leaves yeah. of the same branch. Anyway, fucking neurotic. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Anyway, they couldn't even let us into Harvard until like no. 1950 We're too something. Smart for that. Yeah. Cause we... <laughs> Who needs Harvard? Harvard's full of of gross people anyway. They are fucking full of shit. They took all that PPP Harvard, money. Harvard. A Harvard degree can... is is the is the Paris Hilton of of uh, college degrees. I, mm -hmm. I will raise that. That should be written in the sky. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, it's beautiful. Well, um, I, I, anyway. We had this uh, pale of settlement, and Jews in Imperial yep. Russia were not allowed to, or like a certain portion of them were allowed to have regular careers within the empire. But everybody else, no matter how right. capable you may be, had to stay behind. And I think partly that may have fueled some people like Trotsky, for example, uh, or other people to try to find some kind of a solution to this. Uh, so their 
final solution would have been to create a, a socialistic uh, life for everybody where everybody is equal and everybody, you know, everybody doesn't discriminate you know, like we are all one, and yeah. there is something, of course, like there's merit to that. Yeah, yeah there's, there's something quasi, of sense there, quasi yeah. spiritual about that. Right. But it's like one of those things where if we had, like, I don't know, if we could read each other's minds, if everything was out in the open, then sure, maybe we can create that kind of society. Exactly. But people exactly. are always going to be able to use that situation to their advantage, and as a result, a lot of these very smart bright, young, idealistic, uh, Jewish socialists ended up, uh, you know, being lined up against the wall by the thugs who came after them. And I know, they're so stupid. <laughs> they were always going to get lined up against the wall. Whatever they did, you know, they were going to get lined up against the wall. But what, I, what I'm trying to espouse right now is basically just common sense, like, you know, nobody should be too poor to live, okay? So we can agree on that proposition, then we agree on everything, basically. I want people to compete to create the best possible medicine, the best plastic surgery, the best vagination. It doesn't matter what it is, you know, as long as their comp competition is fantastic. But I also, you know, I don't want to live in a country that, um, you know, lets people die. That's disgusting. It's worse than a fucking ant colony. So, you know, these two things can coexist um, as uh, somebody who I find obnoxious and, and pseudo intellectual Ben Shapiro says this, two, uh, two things can be true at once, even though he's an idiot. Um, yeah. they, they can be, you can have, you can care about people and have, have them live and you can have competition. And why wouldn't you want to have all these things together? Like, why are we having this this par paradigm argument between terrible socialism and, and good capitalism? Daniel DiMartino was completely incorrect about price controls. And he turned around, he's not here to defend himself, that's fine. I sent him an article that he, he, that he tried to misrepresent against me. Europeans regulate pharma prices. They should be regulated. We, like, government people discovered and invented the vaccine for polio and diabetes, and yet you you have a cartel fucking charging masses of amount of money, and you can't go to Canada legally and purchase it for one half the price. That's crony capitalism. That's fucking USSR bullshit. You know. So and what would yet, you? Da so Daniel, what would you do instead? What would be your three-step process to undoing this problem? Uh, I would um, deregulate pharma, which means let foreign competition in, so people can buy Canadian drugs. You know, capitalism. I love it. You know, step number one that will eliminate half the problem right there. Um, step number two: nobody is too poor to live. Step number three. Break up Facebook, break up Microsoft, break up every fucking cartel. So my internet, I lived in Bulgaria for a month. I did a play there. Internet, my Wi-Fi was $4 a month. There's no reason it's 50 here other than there's two providers and they've decided it's 50 bucks a month. This is bullshit. This is extracting value from people, not giving value to people. There should be 400 companies competing for your internet dollar, but there aren't. But if we're talking, that's not capitalism. Sure, but if we're talking about how to uh, solve it, if we're if we want to get rid of a lot of this crony capitalism, All that's gonna okay. But here, here's it's the communism. Only problem. Sure, sure. Yeah, but it's going to take a lot of work to undo a lot of these Machiavellian ties that businesses have to uh, the government. So. Right unless we have some kind of messiah-like figure who comes in and figures out, you know, everybody's weak spot, like we have some, you know, whatever, then the only way that I could see as far as, let's say, choosing, do we go for someone who would, let's say, in the meanwhile, raise taxes or lower taxes? Like, let, let's just stick to that because it's very right. partisan. It's a very partisan issue. People who see a lot of problems with our 
healthcare system would say, hey, let's right. raise the taxes to get the healthcare better. But the problem, and you may agree with this, Kimberly, that I've observed is that the people who are going to be paying those taxes are not going to be these businesses because we don't have anybody to get rid of the corruption problem. We don't have that messiah let, figure. Let, so, let, let, let me, let me okay. before you, you go to Kim for a second, say you don't need to raise taxes. You need to eliminate price controls which are being being um, manipulated by two companies and we're not allowed to buy from Canada. You don't need to do that. These, these, these drugs are manufactured in India, in Singapore for one tenth of the price. They will sell it to us for one tenth of the price. The US government and, and Medi Medicare are barred from buying these medications that are just as good as those that are manufactured here. In fact, we sell these same medications to Singapore, India, and Tibet at the same price. They're pennies. So why not, Lev, seriously, this is my appeal to you. Why not break the crony system? You don't have to raise taxes. You just, let's have market capitalism. We, I think we all want that. But the issue that I'm getting to here is that that desire to break cronyism would be a messiah move. It would be something that I wish would happen, but nobody who is currently going into office is going to make it so, which well, leads us tried. against... Okay, but I mean, it goes back to like Bernie tried, but Bernie comes with a whole other set of issues. So if we're talking about somebody yeah. who's not going to completely ruin the economy while trying to enact certain things that, you know, part of them would make sense. We don't have that person. So if Trump, we don't have Trump that... was saying he would do it. He was going to he was going to break up the, the farmer cartel. Uh, the, you know, somebody's got to like nobody's in favor of crony capitalism. Right. I mean, I got to take my hand down. Well, um, Kim Kimberly, I don't know. Where do you put Trump as far as how much was he able to do to, uh, as they say, drain the swamp? I think uh, it's it's pretty consistent that we've all, I shouldn't speak for anyone other than myself, but I've been pretty upset and disappointed with the lack of follow through as far as that is concerned. Exactly. I, you know, I... I'm still very, very pro-Trump. I do still believe that he's the best president of my lifetime. Um, I believe that his intentions for the American people um, are in a similar place to when he was running um, in 2015. But the fact is, there, um, for whatever reason it may be, right? I am not as politically literate as most. So this is my educated guess, but I don't know what it's like to go from campaigning to actually being president i don't know how much of that he got into the office and realized that he didn't have as much control over or whatever you know there's a min a million different possibilities as far as that goes for me but where it comes back to is yes fundamentally he hasn't really followed through that's why and and coulter my aunt has been all over him um all over the place uh, harassing him about not following through that's why he had to on, on, that's why he had to remove her on Twitter is because a lot of the stuff that he came into the office saying hasn't come through and a big part of that is the lack of draining of the swamp because we want capitalism yes we well, yeah. I mean yeah exactly capitalism is um, is the way to be and we've seen that time and time again but there still needs to be counterbalances and checks in order to maintain capitalism so what's the big disagreement? I mean, look, Daniel, you are a New York Jewish intellectual dude, <laughs> you know, who's among a lot of artists, a lot of entertainers, yeah. you know, uh, a lot, you know, great people. I'm just Jewish. Yes, you are. Well, yeah. well, Kimberly, I mean, you are in the belly of the beast of, you know, as far as being the niece of Ann Coulter, you know, you are related to somebody who like people on Daniel's side of the fence will be like, no, you know, like it would just oh, be, no, no, we, it would be too much. It's too much, yet we're here together right now, and I think that that's a beautiful thing. But where's the big disagreement? This is what I, I'm not understanding. Everything's Everything seems to be fine. Listen, I, 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 sometimes when Ann Coulter is speaking, I'm laughing out loud because she's telling the truth. Oh, Dan, uh, your mic, far away. Sorry. Sometimes <laughs> when Ann Coulter is speaking, and uh, before I'm canceled, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes she makes sense. 
And she does because, you know, you're being force fed a political agenda and it's ridiculous. Democrat and Republican are barely distinguishable at this point. Um, I applaud Ann Coulter splitting from Trump because Trump said, you know, I'm going to make America great again and bring manufacturing back mm -hmm. and destroy the cronyism. Yeah. Who could not be against that? Nobody. We can't, and Lev, as I said, we can't fight China in a war. Okay, They'll yeah, kick our ass. Absolutely. We can't build a fucking mask. Like, well, I wouldn't say those two things are the same because military budget may not be the same as the civilian production budget. Like I, I remember Exile Judge was talking about earlier. Right. You know, the military does have tons of capable people in there. So the question, I mean, that actually goes back to what can you they were make a bomb though? I mean, they yes, can't make I, a believe, I believe, I believe, I believe that there is all kinds of hidden military tech we don't even realize. Speaking of which, we're going to be talking I about UFOs. So. We're going to be talking about aliens this hey. coming Wednesday. Yay. So please tune in for that. That, that's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of great guests, including the deputy, the former deputy head technologist of NASA. Oh, I'd best be invited to this one. That sounds awesome. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I would love people to contribute. And uh, what I was going to say is we have a big military, big fat military. I mean, hopefully they're not. Fat is well, the key word. Well, I mean, you know, people have that right, idea. Right, Kim? Fat with a PH. <laughs> there was well there was this oh really okay that was okay i'm I, you killed me there there was a photo i remember <laughs> there was a photo i remember of a uh, world war ii like the uh, german army where there was this guy very aristocratic looking he was uh, coming uh, out off the uh, airplane and there was this dude who was just like you know like this big in the same military u uniform saluting him so the germans like people think you know nazis you know like a uh, uh, master race yada 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 you know they had that sh their share of fat people as well but anyway going back to america and the military and their uh big big budget this is another question where people say like how come we don't have all of these uh all this you know wonderful health care good food quality uh i think one of the reasons may be that our military budget is really big but the question is how much would it make sense to trim it so that you cut out the fat but you still are able to do everything that's been done before like how much are people who are like military contractors or whatever like how much are they making that is just way more than the private sector would uh y you know like twenty five hundred dollars for a toilet seat or something like that yeah yeah like stuff like that it's it's so it's like all world dominance is like a con game and we just printed a trillion dollars out of nothing you know so like what is it what is wealth what is money what mm -hmm. is you know the the fiscal power of nations these things are, are extremely illusory at the same time they're impressed through repetition on other people we just printed a trillion dollars out of nothing how did somebody do that um, that is that is an amazing magician. Um, one I wish I had in my apartment right now. It's called the but, Federal um, Reserve. Yeah, but 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 the truth is, we are extremely wealthy country. This is what gives us the advantage. We have massive resources, natural resources in in um, in just dairy and cattle in in land. That's what makes us rich, and we can just print money and become even more powerful. Although China right now is going to pose a threat because they produce everything that we dream up from an iphone um to you know a camera stand to your headphones so if there's a war we have no manufacturing base to even make a fucking bomb we don't even have the natural minerals to you know do anything anymore well, We've do you become corrupt? Do you also think, uh, Kimberly? Do you think that it's our bloated military budget that also makes us maybe, uh, or people in the military, take it a little bit too easy and not innovate as much as they could have otherwise if the budget was a lot more uh, controlled? Um, I'm not. I'm not really sure how to answer. I. I mean, it is a super difficult question. I. I have no idea either because. For me, it just comes down to I don't want to be 
in a position where we don't have a strong military but at the same time when you have people in the media coming out you know like on fox news and saying you know like we're going to support the troops no matter what we support our military why not have a more nuanced conversation about it and get to the bottom of maybe there are certain things that could be done in a better way while at the same time achieving your goal well i mean i think in i think the the military budget um as far as i can understand it as far as i know from the, the learning that I've done, there's always been uh, room for the military budget to go down. I think that when it comes to federal aid, very much like with the coronavirus, people take people are prone to take advantage of situations that will get them more money. And I don't think that the military is exempt from that. And I also, but on the other hand, when we, you know, we talk about military budgets versus you know medical preparedness we, we can look at new york for example the reason that new york um failed when it came to taking care of coronavirus has very little to do with the fact that the money was spent on the military instead new york has been failing in healthcare for a long time the more socialized it becomes the more socialized we've made med medicine in new york the more hospitals have closed the more people have not been able to receive the health care that they that they need and the more trouble we get in as, as far as maintaining um, public health. Now, even before coronavirus, New York lost 16 hospitals last year. It's true. Yep. So that is nothing that is that is nothing to do with how much we're spending on the military, but they're always there. I believe there is room to cut back on military budget. Now, whether or not that would have influenced something like coronavirus, I think that's irresponsible to speculate on at this point because it almost is irrelevant. You know, you but can, I don't. Right? I don't think that going forward. I'm sorry. If they, yeah, no. I think um, if we if we close the country down like a week earlier, you know. Yeah, but the, okay. So I I I've I've had a couple sips in my drink, so I'm forgetting specifically if it's Sweden or Switzerland, but, um, you know, they, there's countries that haven't closed down at all who have the same rate of infection, the same rate of recovery. They, they didn't follow any social distancing nonsense. So I think that that's, and, and it's not like, you know, they're suffering from less population or they're, they're, they like somehow miraculously discovered. Well, there, themselves. there's a, there's a bit of a difference though. If you're talking about something like New York city, New York city, I cannot compare it to any other city as far as people coming from all around the world intersecting in here, like something like Sweden, you know, sure you have some tourists, but more or less you're going to have the same people in there for a pretty long time. Which is why I think what's happening with New York right now, we had a conversation with our uh, family doctor, and he is on the front lines right now in Brooklyn. Like, he's got the, you know, get up on, like, the mask and everything, like, in hazmat mode. And he had a very interesting conversation with us about how he anticipates that New York is going not anticipates like this is actually was going to be happening that when you're going to go into a restaurant for like the next several months as soon as things start opening up you are going to be checked for whether you have uh the uh anti i mean okay i know you're doing this but here's where i would personally draw the line as far as invasiveness uh, microchipping. I think we can all agree, except for the Swedes who have already implemented that shit, that microchipping is no good. We don't want to have anything under our skin, okay. right? We can all agree well, on that. Doesn't the Bill Gates vaccine have like a biohaptic feedback it component? Does. Yeah. Oh wait, where's where's your proof for this? I want I want to see this. I I mean I I, I can try to pull it got up. Got a dog? How is she gonna go on Google? <laughs> it's like a... Well, I'm yeah, ID2020. Let's look up ID2020. That's a great place to start because I think that Okay. No, I I do remember ID2020, but I don't remember them talking about microchips at all. I think the assumption was for me when I first read about ID2020 that oh, this is the microchip thing. There are no microchips in there and it is a voluntary thing. That is what I was able to extract out of this, but it does seem very romantic, right? Because there is this end of the world, you know, um book of revelation type idea that we're going to get the mark of the beast that we're going to have it implanted on our forearms and our uh, uh foreheads but uh i mean wait and see this doesn't look like it whether or not people want to do it eventually to control people sure 
I am willing to believe anything like that is possible. But if you look up ID2020 and microchip, show me the evidence because I looked it up and I did not find that that is a microchip at all. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a scientist and I'm not a doctor, but knowing what I know about Bill Gates and knowing what I know about his affiliation with these companies that make the vaccinations and knowing what I know about his affiliation with the, the, um, you know, the labs in Wuhan where this bioweapon was released from. It happened. Yeah. It, I don't, I, you know. I don't think that I think that if you have an IQ above a toaster, you won't believe that this disease came from a butt a, a, the butt of a bat. <laughs> you know what I mean? So <laughs> I think that I think that like yeah, maybe what... when we get to the com I you know like I said, I'm not a scientist, but when I look into the stuff when it comes to like the five G conspiracies with the bioheptic feedback, the pr like when you talk about five G and biohaptics. The reason that they're talking about the fact that there may or may not be biohaptics in the injection in the in the vaccination is because these biohaptics are people are concerned that they're being they're going to be able to be read from 5G towers. So, like in Connecticut, for example, the governor was talking about implementing these Bluetooth um, thermometers so that you you would have to you know take your temperature before going anywhere. And if you took your temperature and it was above a certain degree, it would go into the system and it would prove that you weren't supposed to leave your house or whatever. Well, this is just the next step of that, as far as I'm concerned. This is the, you know, and we were talking about technology that the military has that we have no idea of. Um, you know, my my, my, my guy, his, his dad was in the military using a Pip-Boy in the 1980s, okay? They, Wait, they what's a Pip-Boy? A Pip-Boy? Yes. Like in uh, Fallout? It's like a, it's basically like an, it's like an, I'm sorry. It's a personal information processor. It was essentially an iPhone stuck to your arm in the 1980s. Wow. Okay. So like, wow. So when it comes to technology that the military has access to that we don't even know exists, first of all, if I had to take an educated guess, they definitely have biohaptic software. There's almost no doubt in my mind that they have biohaptic software. So I think that there might, there, you know, even if, um, what was it? They talk about in me too. There, there's a shred of, of validity in even the most wild situations. And I think that there might be a shred of validity in this, especially with how people have been implementing social distancing and how they've been using that to control entire s groups of people. I don't think that it's, far off to assume that because we we can openly acknowledge to each other we believe this is a bioweapon we believe this was not unintentional so we're fighting this silent war against technology that we don't even have any way of knowing exists so i guess i can put on my tinfoil hat and it is a little tinfoil hat but i don't think that um i think that not entertaining the possibility is equally as foolish <laughs> Well, let's say, okay, let's say they have exactly what you're saying, and I am in a position where I'm about to get this vaccine. What you're saying is that there would be no way at all for me to know that what I'm going to be putting in will have some kind of bio uh, feedback mechanism, that it's, yes. it's going to be a complete mystery to me. They're not going to talk about it at all. And I wouldn't be able to, let's say, for example, I wouldn't be able to go to a laboratory if I wanted to. If I was one of those people who wanted to know for sure and make a big media deal out of it, I wouldn't be able to go to a lab, have them test whatever it is that's going on. Let's say my friend's a scientist, okay, or whatever. I go to the lab, I get it tested, and they figure it out. Oh my god, like this person has biofeedback in his arm. Let's make a big media deal out of this. Next thing I know, I'm on Fox News, and I'm talking I mean, about the New World Order. So I I'm not saying that that's, you know, I'm not saying you can't figure it out. If you get the injection, you can go to another scientist, you can go to another doctor. These are all things that can potentially be substantiated. But I think that the more important questions right now, even before we address, like, are there bio, is there biohaptic feedback in these vaccines? First of all, when did Bill Gates become an expert on global health? And second, when did we decide that Bill, when did we vote for Bill Gates to decide the, what, what we do and don't need in order to re-enter society? Well, that's a very Machiavellian way that life is. When did we decide that uh, the WHO 
was a sage uh, for uh, what we get to do with our health. I don't the, like the World, Health, the World Health Organization either. I exactly. Think. So, like, to me, it doesn't really matter whether you, you know, happen to be in a position of authority or not. You're, you know, you're going to be listened to if you have enough money, if you ha have enough contacts, and there's not much that we could do about it. There's always going to be a reality distortion field on people like Bill Gates or his uh, rival Steve Jobs when it comes to uh, Apple computers. Like I, I was mean, talking before with uh, Daniel about how his Mac sucks and how he has to get a PC. <laughs> I mean, Bill, Bill Gates, Beautiful. I mean, when you look at where Bill Gates comes from, right? Bill Gates, his father was a eugenicist who like reinvented Planned Parenthood to facilitate his eugenics. And his mom worked for IBM, which documented and made possible the label, the, the, the number system, which they used to, for, um, you know, a, a imprisonment camps and in, in, during uh, the concentration periods. Like, I, you know, he doesn't come, he comes from evil. Like he is, he is fundamentally rooted in evil. And Mediocrity. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I have a very upset dog next to uh. me. Um, so if you hear cl crying, that's why. But I think that the like, as, like you know, these these the World Health Organization, even Obama, okay, even like people like like Bill Gates, all these guys, they leave these little breadcrumb trails, right? That 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 you can follow that prove their their um their ties to each other, number one, and their incentives towards doing evil things, like having this mandatory vaccination that they all of a sudden had ready when they d they weren't preparing for this. They didn't do a tabletop, you know, um, re a, a tabletop scenario of COVID-19 in October. Let's just look past all of that. It's no big deal. Well, let's step back a little bit here and... Uh... Talk about conspiracy theories in general, the big problem that I have with the way that they are presented. If you look at Alex Jones or anybody else who talks about, you know, like the, the, the globalists are coming, you know, like the world. Exactly. So, okay. So the way that they talk about it is they present a lot of these details and they have an image in their mind of what the reality is that either you're for or you're against. If you're against, you are not going to take one scrap of whatever it is they're saying. To you, it's all going to be just a meandering conversation about these, you know, evil globalists that want to take over the world. The, yeah. And I think the solution to this problem is, again, doing it very piecemeal. So, for example, let's say you're on InfoWars and... Okay, let's say, not even InfoWars, let's say you're Joe Rogan and you are, have Alex Jones on as a guest. What I liked about the episode that uh, Alex Jones was on is that Jamie, bless his heart, was putting up articles related to what it was Alex Jones was talking about. He was able to be somebody who could sort all this information out and figure out, okay, this actually does happen. Here is an article that references exactly what he's saying. And sometimes Alex Jones could do that, but it's more of like, you know, the camera looking down at the screen where, you know, you could see some papers that he happens to have lying around with some article, but it's not something that's done in a coordinated and in an in intelligent way so that people can follow up with everything and also taking everything one step at a fucking time. Like, if you're talking about Bill Gates being a eugenicist, I think that is, and this is just, like, something that I would love to happen in the future. Like, that could be brought up. Just that alone, everything else could be forgotten. Just that could be brought up, and there could be an official document that we could just paste in front of the screen and show everybody and just ask... Like, I'll bring in, you know, members of the media in here, and I'll ask them, does anybody here have a problem with this document that's being presented? Someone could say, how do I know this document's real? And then we go to the next step, and we say, okay, here's how we know it's real. Or if we don't, guess what? We stop the conversation, we move on to something else, and then we follow up again with the officiality of that document. We bring in an expert, like some kind of an archivist, somebody who can connect this document to being real. And that's uh, what that I think was missing. such a beautifully reasoned uh, piece of rhetoric. I can't even say anything to that, but I loved it. I have to go because I love you. 
a little less than my mama and it's Mother's Day. So Happy Mother's jump. Day, by the way, everybody. Yeah. It's only a little. Yeah, only a little less. Um, <laughs> but I still love you. Um, but we're going to have quarantinis with my mom and sister. Um, and uh, I think that um, that uh, the two of you should have some quarantinis, too, um, as I disappear and turn it into you know, a drink and debate show. Pleasure. Kim, pleasure, love. Pleasure. Take yeah. care, Daniel. Enjoy it. This is beautiful. Loved it all. Awesome show, love. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. All the best. I appreciate it, too. Ciao. Ciao. And now I have to turn my screen into... Oh, there we go. We did it automatically. So, yeah. Kimberly, I am yeah. not sure if we're staying or going because there is John Gonzalez, who I really wanted to talk with, who is an expat from Venezuela, who says that he can come in at 9 o'clock. So I don't know what I can, you're. I can shoot the shit with you for a half an hour to keep to keep shit occupied. That's Excellent. Right. Well, I don't just want to shoot the shit. This is going to be yeah. an opportunity for us to get to know the uh, real Kim Coulter <laughs> to find out your story. Your like, was it your aunt who inspired you to do this? Did you decide to just on your own? Tell us. You know, Anne, actually, if it had just been for her, I would have stayed away from politics my entire life, and I never would have come anywhere near this crap. Um, it actually, the, my introduction to all of this came when I was living in Los Angeles um, three or four years ago, and I won't go into all the, the nitty gritties, but I had a really awful situation. I was um, living with somebody who was very dangerous in the sense that he had a very unpredictable lifestyle. We had people like breaking into the house to have sex in his room, and he almost burned our house down. And I was not having it. I was not very happy. I didn't care that I only had to pay very little to live there. It wasn't worth it. So I was trying to figure out where my next move was going to be. And one of Anne's friends actually reached out to me, somebody I'd only met once pr prior to this, and said, you know, let's go to dinner. I'll, uh, I'll talk to you about what's going on. And I went out with him. And uh, he's a good friend. He's, you know, he's my uncle. He, I, you know, he's practically my adopted father at this point and he basically said like listen kid you're effing up your life like stop being a stoner stop being whatever you're doing you need to like get your stuff together so pack your stuff you're coming to live with me bring your dogs it's fine we'll make it work just like stop doing this and I was just like okay all right that's fine so he brought me in and slowly but surely we started talking about politics and it occurred to me that this guy is like a hardcore Republican. And even I, I've never been a hardcore Republican. I'm very conservative leaning in my ideology, but I'm not a full blown Republican. I'm not by any means any anywhere near a war hawk Republican. But I had up to that point been ambushed and harassed and threatened when it came to being related to Anne, people would always say, you know, like, oh, you don't believe what she says because she's a Nazi and she hates black people and she hates Mexicans and she hates gay people. And it was just like, oh, of course I'm not like that. I'm adopted. I'm adopted. Don't talk to me about that stuff. I'm adopted. And it like I, it was just drilled into me through liberal, liberal education and through friends, um, parents and uh, eventually friends of my own that, you know, liberal and um liberal and left. Oh, and, and by the way by the way for everybody who is currently tuning in right now to the six people who are watching if you do not know what's going on let me just inform everybody uh we had guests from venezuela but they unfortunately had to go it was a wonderful conversation though it got a little bit too chaotic in the end so my apologies for that but i still think we had a beautiful conversation and for you guys who are watching i am with the one and only kimberly coulter who is the niece of the famous or for some people infamous and Coulter. <laughs> yeah. So where, where was So I? you were talking about how you were influenced. At... I was scared. I was literally traumatized into not identifying as a conservative. Even mm -hmm. though when I was younger, that's like, that's basically, you know, I agreed with all of the conservative points I was introduced to. Um, and then once I was reintroduced to the idea that this, this ideal of Republican and this idea of conservatives, which are not the same thing, by the way, I just want to make sure that everyone knows I'm not saying that, um, that I was totally wrong, that these are like people, these are nice people. And this came about, this was around 2015. 
so this was before Donald Trump was officially president, and uh, this was when, you know, everybody was being a Nazi, everybody is racist, if you're, you know, if you follow Donald Trump, you're a terrible person, and I still get memories from Facebook of all those posts I used to share, which I'm very embarrassed by. Um, and then I, it, you know, I started spending more time with him, and Vicar and then after that, I was spending more time with Anne, and it all accumulated, it all came to the point where I went to go see her on the show Problematic, um, there was, they did a panel on the alt-right with Lucian Wintrich, Ann Coulter, and Jim Norton. And that is when I met Lucian Wintrich. And I Lucian, know Lucian. I love Lucian. He's adorable. I, he's a dork, and he, I wish he was back in politics. There's, you know, he, people have their own issues with Lucian. I don't really give a shit. He's wonderful. But Lucian essentially you know i had been reading about him you know everywhere it's like he's a nazi he's homophobic he hates minorities and it's like first of all none of that could be further from the truth especially like the homophobic stuff which was hilarious to me um but the, you know i've been told all these things and i've been reading all these things and i met him and we went out to dinner and we had a good time and you know he hit me up a couple days later on facebook I was just like, I made room for you on my Facebook, friend me and come to Washington. I was like, yeah, you want me to come to Washington? That's fine. So I stayed with him for about a week and I met Milo and Cassandra Fairbanks and Jack Posobiec and so many other people who were just being completely annihilated by the mainstream media as these hateful, wrong, th guilty of wrong think individuals. And at first I was like, well, I'm going to be the liberal that's like, hey guys, like, they might be stupid on some stuff, but they're not Nazis. They don't hate you. They're not. And I was going to be that like bridge. I was like, I'm going to make sure that the people on the left know. So when I started coming to my leftist friends, for the most part, I was just getting like how my favorite comment. I posted a picture with me and Milo and someone said to me, how, what do you expect your Jewish friends to think when they see a picture with you as someone like Milo Yiannopoulos? Like, I don't know what do you expect them to think you're dumb and i realized that i was openly a liberal and openly like even socialist leaning in a lot of the things i was saying to these far right nazis and they were fine with me they were cool they were willing to have conversations the second i brought it back to the left it was f you you're a nazi f you like you are a bad person i you're more like your aunt than i ever could have imagined and then it occurred to me, like, I was waking up from a bad acid trip. Oh my gosh, what have I been doing? What, <laughs> what have I done? And I actually started researching into politics and watching Donald Trump's speeches beginning to end instead of the little clips. And I realized, oh no, I'm a conservative. Oh no, I've been a conservative this whole time. What do I do? So what did I do? I started becoming involved in the, the conversation, I started trying to make more videos. I started trying to talk to more people. And now I'm a, a journalist with the National File and I have my own bitch shoot channel and I have lots of loving relationships with people on all um, ends of the political spectrum. And that was, you know, that's one of the reasons why I say Donald Trump is the best president of my lifetime. This never would have happened if it weren't for Donald Trump and Ann Coulter. So God bless America, right? <laughs> Well, that's uh, that's really well said. And from my perspective, when I was growing up, I remember watching, uh, and I'm still a big fan of uh, Bill Maher. In fact, if you were to ask me what political position I would hold, I would say it would be more of like a Howard Stern, Bill Maher position, except for that thing that Bill Maher said about, uh, you know, wanting there to be a recession. I think that that's a very, I mean, I think he was kind of like half joking it. I mean, look, I don't want to put any excuses out there either, but I'm just saying what I like about Bill Maher is that he is someone who is able to have a lot of different people on the show and uh, have you know, n not not be repelled by bringing in conservatives. And from what I understand, Ann Coulter is a friend of his. Is that correct? Yeah, I've got. I actually got to meet Bill a couple times because of their friendship. Uh, How was he, he? He's awesome. He's so cool. And I like. I used to be a lot more politically in line with Bill Maher. I think his comments about the recession were gross. But you know, like everybody people try to cancel bill maher every two seconds because yes. of the fact that he goes between the party lines and i think that what he has to say about politics a lot of the time is dangerous and unfounded and he should probably chill with the weed a little bit but 
Um, ultimately, Bill Maher is the kind of, like, I wish there was more people like Bill Maher on CNN or on Fox even. Like, he can sit down with Anne and laugh in her face and still mm. ask her questions and still tell the audience, like, shut the F up. Like, listen to what she has to say. So I respect Bill Maher for that. And I also think that, like I said, because of that, he has a he has a big target on his back. You know, only well, like every four months, Bill Maher has another reason to cancel. Like right bef before this, it was you know he he said to I forget a, which guest it was, but he said something about like oh I'm I'm not going to come work in the fields because I'm a house n word. You know, whatever I I work in the house, I don't work in the field. You know, like he he says these ridiculous jokes every like it, this is not new for Bill Maher. So. I, I think that people, you know, should just chill a little bit when it comes to that. But. They they definitely should take a chill pill. And I had a conversation, I remember, uh, in our uh, previous stream about contemporary art. And uh, we were talking with uh, Patrick Meager, who's a great dude. I love that dude. And uh, we were asking him what he thinks of Bill Maher. And he loves Bill Maher. You know, like, uh, he's a fan. But uh, Patrick is uh, in, just like Daniel is, in the community of people who I think a lot of them, like if you're talking about people who work at any mainstream publication that's not like, you know, Fox News or, you know, not the, uh, not the Daily Caller, they're going to have to, unfortunately, these days, submit to the people who are going to scream the loudest. So I think that there are going to be people who want there to be more Bill Mars. They may even have a little Bill Maher inside of themselves. Yeah. But at the same time, there is just this problem that keeps them from doing anything. And it's a problem that's very fundamental as far as uh, law goes. Like, to be quite honest, I think it goes back to uh, civil rights law, which I think was a very important thing to have happened. You know, like, uh, number one, I mean, it goes without saying that there should be no door closed to anybody of any color of skin uh, at all. But yeah. if we're talking about things that were implemented in the 60s as far as what would count as discrimination, I think that is the core of the problem when it comes to people in the media being afraid of being on the side of somebody who the loudest goon on Twitter would consider to be a racist or a bigot even if they aren't. Well, the problem is... Okay, so there's two problems there, right? There's the, the nature of mob culture in the first place and, like, these these online attacks where people just take the littlest thing and they blow it out of proportion um and then on the other side of that there's um you know people who aren't willing to think for themselves and do their own research um we have like instant gratification and clickbait to think about um and we also have to think about the idea that like because there's such a mob culture we live in a very apologetic time people think that there's like as long as i say i'm sorry it'll be okay but the thing that you have to understand about hate mobs is they don't they're not looking for you to apologize they're not looking for the the reconciliation they're not going to say oh look at this this brave and stunning individual they came and they apologized good for them they're going to look at that and they're going to say oh that's an admission of guilt. Mm. You're guilty. You're doing whatever. So and, and, and by the way, that's what I like about Christianity. In Christianity, or at least the idea of Christianity, is you have forgiveness. And in Judaism, you have a similar thing called Teshuvah. The idea that in the eyes of uh, God, somebody who has actually experienced sin, somebody who has done, let's say, bad things, but has you know, learn their lesson, basically, you know, that is somebody who is even worthier in the eyes of God than someone who lived a completely innocent, sheep-like life, because you're not learning anything by living that kind of life, right? Yeah, exactly. So that also brings me to the question of religion today, which played much of a bigger role. You were saying that in your life, it didn't play as much of a role in the beginning, but now much more so. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that that has a lot to do with growing up, too. I, you know, even my, my, uh, my, both my adopted and my biological mother experienced the same thing as far as I can understand, which is that they grew towards religion the older they got and the more that they were able to maturely understand what the purpose of religion is. Um, whereas, like, when I was younger, um, you know, my, my mom is Catholic, my father is Presbyterian, so there was always the divide in the house between, mm. like, which services was best. Wait, and please remind the viewers, what is Presbyterian? 
<laughs> Put, putting you on the spot. <laughs> putting me on the spot. Honestly, the the, fun, the the fundamental differences between Presbyterian and Catholic have to do with the way that you worship and the ki- and the kinds of service. I I honestly can't really step through. I'm looking it up right now. So Presbyterianism, for those who don't know, is a part of the Reformed tradition within Protestantism, which traces its origin to Great Britain, particularly Scotland. Thank you. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, Protestantism, that was a whole big deal back in the day. You couldn't, like as a Protestant, you couldn't get married to a Catholic and vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, that, that, you know... um, like I said, I didn't start to appreciate religious principles until very recently. I didn't, um, cause to me, like, you know, a lot of, a lot of the social stigmas that come with being religious are things that like, you're particularly more self-conscious about, I think when you're younger, um, you know, like the, the idea that if you belong to an organized religion, you're a cult member, or that you're brainwashed, or that to some degree that you're of lesser intelligence because you believe in some, um, you know, omnipotent being that can't be definitively proved or whatever. And there's a lot of different reasons. And I also think that, I think that being an American and living in America has to contribute to that a little bit in terms of culture and in terms of media, how we portray religious individuals. so, you know, I don't, I will never actually be able to know how much of it is conscious versus subconscious or how much of it is just like maturity versus knowledge. But I know for a fact that when I was younger, I had a, I had no idea what it meant to be religious. And now that I understand more that it's, it's about instilling morality and it's about having faith in something larger than yourself. And it's about community and it's about togetherness and um, it has nothing to do with this like occultist group who like wants to sodomize little boys at the altar. You know, what I mean? it's like uh, it's it's just um, I think that we're fed a very false portrayal of what it means to actually be religious in this country, and I think that that's why a lot of younger kids, including myself, veer away from being religious. Well, there are different uh, there are different levels here. For one thing, in Russia, the uh, Orthodox religion. It's called uh, Pravoslavny, which means the right faith, which is kind of presumptuous if you ask me. You know, they're <laughs> calling their religion the right faith. But anyway, um, back during the uh, Mongol occupation, they had this tradition where the Russian people in their church would say a prayer. First, they would say a prayer to the Khan, Han. I don't know how to pronounce it. You know what I mean. They would say a prayer to the Khan and his family. And if you think about that dynamic, you know, there is nothing that Genghis Khan has in common or Kublai Khan, whichever one it was, uh, has nothing in common with Jesus Christ as far as, you know what I mean? Like it's the furthest you can go. Or if we're talking about people like Alexander Nevsky, who is considered to be a patron saint in Russia, you know, like people would kiss the iconography of this guy. Yet this I guy. I don't know anything about him. Well, honest. this guy, well, this guy, he was a mob enforcer where he would go into a village and he would demand money from the village a portion of it he'd take himself and another portion of it he would give to the uh golden horde which was the uh the mongols who were uh, ruling over russia at the time so you know forward to 2020 and you still have icons of this guy that are being sold to very religious russian people who are worshiping him well worshiping god through him i guess you could say whatever 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 but the point is is that what I don't like about certain religious uh, mentalities is that it doesn't allow people to question anything further. It becomes yeah. sort of a like, because I say so mentality. And that creates, much like we were talking earlier in our discussion about um, how communism came to be, how you had these very, um, very intelligent uh, uh, people with a good heart 
ended up lining being li lined up against the wall by thugs. I think it's a similar thing when it comes to any organizational structure, no matter what the belief system. You're always going to have people who are going to occupy high positions of power and they are going to hide behind the cloth. They are going to hide behind their faith and they would be able to manipulate people who don't know any better. So as far as going forward, like I think a big problem, and I'm curious what you're going to think about this, a big problem of people losing faith has been, you know, like the whole Nietzsche and death of God has been this rise of technology as well as the rise of being aware that, hey, these people have a slightly different version of whatever we have, so which one's right? Like, personally, I think that's uh, not the right question, but you could see how something like this would leave people to lose religion. Well, that, that's the problem, isn't it? You know, like, we're, like, how much of it is conscious and how much of it is, sub like, how much of it is a conscious evolution of the, of the human condition to question something that we can't definitively prove? And how much of it is subliminally enforced by people who would rather have that kind of power? Which is a, a tinfoil hat thing to say in and of itself, but when it comes to, I've always said that um, the stronger a community is, the less it needs its government. And I think that if you divide a community, religion is a really good way to do it. Mm -hmm. And it also leaves people dependent on, like I said, a, a more um, enlarged, a more grandiose style government. Oh, and by the way, we have Hero Alchemy joining us. Hero, how are you? Hero has been a superstar. He has been with us from the very beginning, and I totally appreciate him, as I appreciate all the uh, people who are watching this right now. If you have not done so yet, here's my inner salesman. Please don't forget to subscribe. Please subscribe. leave. A yes, leave <laughs> a like and. Uh, Put something in the chat. Ask any questions. This is this is Ann Coulter's niece, Kimberly like Coulter, in front of you guys in the flesh, and we are talking. Next generation Coulter. <laughs> and we are talking about religion. So, one thing that may happen is there's going to be a rise, as was in the '60s, of a lot more cults. Like we were talking before about the occult, and that we were talking before in an earlier show about how. I have this idea that if you were to ask religious people what they think, like the first word they think of when they hear the word occult, they'll think evil, evil. you yeah, know, evil like, or, or like Maleficent or exactly, um, exactly. But what is, but what does the word occult mean? It means hidden. So I, was, I know what it means. It's, I was going to say sneaky. <laughs> well, oh, okay. Here we go. I think this is the big, the big differentiation because sneaky implies malevolence while hidden means yeah. like, okay, let's say for example, you were someone who didn't know how to do push-ups the right way. You could mm -hmm. say that the art of doing push-ups the right way was hidden from you. It was occulted from you. Or if you were someone who didn't know how to, I don't know, any skill, drawing, you know, uh, arithmetic, programming, these things were occulted from you before you learned how to do them. You know, they were hidden from your exp field of expertise, as it were. So... Yeah. Um, Taking the word occult in that perspective shows me, at least, as someone who likes to meditate, likes to do yoga, likes to engage in all these things, that there are probably, you know, people that would be afraid of even going into it because they would think that they would get invaded by demons or whatever. You know, like, we're talking about things that were very much present in uh, Eastern systems of thought and still are even though I'd say that a lot of these systems of thought are still very dogmatic. So, for example, in India, you would have a lot more of an emphasis on praying to a particular uh, deity, but not that many people go the route of self-discovery, go the route of uh, self-liberation, if you yeah. were. You know what I mean? Like actually changing your mind, like the alchemist talked about, into someone who was able to perceive more than they were able to do so before. And I could see why that could be considered dangerous, but I don't see anything wrong with it, nor do I see anything in Christianity that would uh, discount that process of self-discovery. I mean, there were so many Christian mystics uh, as well. So I'm curious if there could be maybe a resurgence of this I guess you could call it new age, but I don't like that word because I think it's been tainted over time. But a resurgence of that while still not having it be something alien 
except for those who like wearing tie-dye shirts, have long hair, go to Burning Man, and, you know, take a lot of drugs. Have it be something that would actually be more present in a village life, you know, like in a, uh, in a small town life that would actually get people to more of a bottom of what exactly are these systems that I personally think exist within our bodies that we can uh, access to make our awareness better. Well, the problem that I think when it comes to addressing spiritualism is similar to a lot of, you know, controversial hot point issues that we come across in society or, you know, globally is the, the fir first and foremost, there's so many like colloquial differences when it comes to definitions. And I think that's what really messes us up is because like, you, you know, we're talking about a cult. When you first think of a cult, what do you think of? Like, we don't agree on the definitions of words yes fundamentally we cannot have a discussion about the occult about religion about spiritualism about politics about fill in the blank unless we agree on the definitions of words absolutely so if i'm talking about you know if we're having a con we'll go back to the occult if we're having a conversation about the occult and my presumed assumption is that everything occult is evil and your presumed <laughs> assumption is something else we're going to be yelling at each other until we are dead yes cuz fundamentally we're talking about two totally different things mm -hmm. well ryan and ryan has a comment here our weapon uh ryan wonderful dude great dude i love you man you are excellent so ryan asks uh or ryan says religion deals with fear of the unknown but for a lot of people it keeps them from learning by locking them in a dogmatic belief i'd well, like to see some evidence for this well one i just showed you uh with the uh russian people during the time of the golden horde it locked them into a belief that had them praying to the uh you know their invader and we also see that in you know like any kind of small town life going back to russia where even though everybody was supposed to be very religious they were doing very irreligious things behind their back yet they thought that once they went to uh mass you know they could kind of hide it like they they become a different person and there are experiments where uh Jonathan Hyde, for instance, noticed that people come up with um, they come up with the reasons after they do something. And I think people are very good at fooling themselves. So they could sin and they could do all this horrible stuff while still being robotically attached to a certain faith. So to me, that's kind of troublesome. And I'm not saying that the environment people are in today isn't also troublesome for different reasons. If you're talking about like a complete loss of anything more than this being like a dead machine that has no purpose whatsoever like i personally think that's a bit troublesome for me you know i wouldn't adopt that idea but do you see what uh, what i mean as far as the criticism towards people who become too dogmatic and can't get out of it yeah well, i agree I, I mean i i do see where you're coming from i think that being super militant about anything isn't productive um so i do think that religion could fall under that category yeah so, by the way, an update about John Gonzalez. He says, hey, man, I'm getting off from work right now. Would I still make it? And the answer is yes, but I'm going to ask them how much longer would he take? Because I really want this guy in. He is an yeah. expat from Venezuela. We met at the Zuby meetup. And uh, he, along with a couple of other people, were talking about how crapalicious life in Venezuela is and how a lot of people here in the United States don't realize it. And for those who are just joining us, who are not sticking around the whole time, but just peered in and you're asking yourselves, why the hell are these people talking about religion? We should be talking about Venezuela. That's the name of the show. Well, here is why. We had people who were in here. It was a great discussion. Unfortunately, they had to leave. But now we have John Gonzalez, who is coming back and he is going to talk with us about Venezuela and about his experiences in there. But uh, Kimberly, leaving religion aside for a second we talked about religion we talked about the difference uh, in you growing up to who you came to be and the response that you have had from your friends would you say that the response is different now that you were able to get your friends more in uh, you know a better groove of who you are how you are trying to kind of like uh, take the middle path um 
Honestly, or did you get a, like a whole new set of friends and you just uh I have a lot of I mean I I do have a couple of friends from back back in the day um but most of them have honestly turned on me <laughs> to be completely honest with you I was actually recently kicked out of a Dungeons and Dragons game um because all of the people in my group decided that my Instagram made me a Nazi sympathizer Ooh. Well, so, and these are people I played with for almost a year, by the way. These are people mm. who like, you know, one of them was like openly trans and they were like, you have a problem with trans people because you made fun of Caitlyn Jenner. And it's like, dude, I've been calling you they for almost a year. Like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> Sorry, I keep saying that word. Um, but really, honestly, it's heartbreaking. What I, I while we're while we're on the subject, I, I do actually want to say something about it. Um, Anybody who thinks that somebody would elect to live this way is high or stupid. Um, I have my own issues when it comes to like codependency and problems with like friendships and relationships, but I would never elect to have all of my oldest friends and family members come up to me and say, oh, you're a Nazi. You're if it were up to me, honestly, if I were to succumb to my social anxieties, I would say, F this like you're right I'm wrong I'm a terrible person this is awful you're right I'm a, I'm a you know that's Nazi sympathy that's bigotry that's whatever nobody elects to live like this nobody elects to like lose their only favorite like fun activity of the week because they're trying to stand by patriotism and nationalist principles like there's nobody who would elect that um so no I don't have a lot of the same friends I used to have the ones who have stuck around are real friends. The ones who have stuck around, well, you know, know for a fact that I don't have hateful ideology and I don't um, discriminate people um, for their unmeetable characteristics and all that SJW nonsense. Um, well, a hero has a comment that is uh, connected with this. He says, uh, uh, yep, well said. All my friends from high school hate me now. I have no connection to my hometown anymore. That hurt. I I actually that really makes me want to cry. Like you know, I I'm adopted, so I deal with this ever since I was a little baby about like separation and all that, and not wanting to lose friendships. So I identify with that on such a personal level, and I I wish that it wasn't like this. I wish that people could understand that. Um, st you know, they, you can look back. It's like standing up for what you believe in has rape repercussions. You know, it has for people across history. And I think that um, this is no different. And um, I do f I do forget where your where your question started at. So I for forgive me for that. No, no problem. I was just asking uh, earlier on about how people responded. And you answered oh, that. How people responded poorly. Very poorly. It's the answer to that. I'm mm. um, sorry I interrupted you. No, no. But uh, since they responded poorly and you could cast them out of your life, you were able to find new friends. But what I'm curious about is what, okay, here's what I would love to happen. I am in a position right now where I'm in New York. I'm the uh, chair of the art and technology committee at the national arts club. There are a lot of wonderful, fabulous people there. I think that it would make a lot of sense to have groups within these kind of societies that can be open up for anybody regardless of whatever it is they happen to believe i mean obviously you know, there is a limit as far as you know yeah. we all we all have our limits but if we're talking about something like you know someone who is considered to be the epitome of evil for no reason at all all that's missing i think to change that is having one face-to-face -face conversation and i think these zoom calls might as well be a face-to-face -face conversation at least i hope that that's what's happening with uh, what we're trying to build here uh, jules and i look i commend you and i god bless you guys for it i've really been trying since 2015 to make that happen and you know i hope to help you guys continue it but the problem is and this came up earlier in a different light um but in a, I'm going to bring it up in a, in a different circumstance. You can't argue rationally with an irrational person. 
you can't like the problem with me and like I said I thought I was going to be able to come in with my magic wand and be like look well I'm a liberal and these people aren't Nazis so you should just be nice to them and try to hear them out the problem is that this indoctrination is so deep and so fundamentally rooted in so many people that it doesn't matter if you put them next if you put them in front of me for example if you try to say like okay try to talk to Kim Coulter, try to have a conversation with her. They already are coming in with preconceived notions and it doesn't matter how much I am compassionate. It doesn't matter how long I am willing to entertain talking in circles. It doesn't matter um, how many facts I have. It doesn't matter how many videos I can literally show people and put in their face. They will dig their heels in they will find a reason that you're not telling the truth or that your intentions are malicious. And that's the problem that I'm running into is that like, like I said, it doesn't matter how rational I am. It doesn't matter how many facts I come with. It doesn't matter how many receipts I can show. These people fundamentally think that I will bring about the fourth Reich and that I don't care about anybody unless you're a white Protestant. So when you come in fundamentally believing these things, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter if I say I'm pro um, rights for LGB people. I, T does not go in there for me because that's not a sexuality. Well, it doesn't he, matter. Here's how it's going to matter, though. By having conversations with people who are not like rabid SJWs, but people like we had before who you know come from New York, are in New York high society, things could be a lot different. And with us joining us finally is John Gonzalez, Yay! Venezuelan expat. Hello there. <laughs> Brother, it is so great hey, to guys. see you. Thank you so much for making it. You are in a uh, car right now, so we may... <laughs> yes. We may have a difficult signal, which is going to change because you're not going to be in that car forever. At least I hope not. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry for being late so late. No, dude, it is it is such a pleasure to have you here. You are the man we met at the Zuby meetup, and you were talking about Venezuela, and you were the one who actually inspired me to do this uh, live stream today. Oh, wow. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, thank you, man. Well, you, you guys were really amazing to talk about. Uh, it was really nice to have that big conversation. I, I think it was like a four-hour long conversation that time. Yes. <laughs> yes, it did. But uh... Everyone went to leave. About to leave, but we were still talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I Because I think it's very important to have you on. You're a young man. You're living in New York. You must have encountered a lot of uh, conversation. I mean, I, this is me making an assumption, but you must have encountered a lot of people who think of Venezuela as being this victim of Amer of the American intelligence apparatus. Yeah, there's a lot of people who, who believe that, that statement. It, it, it's very, very well, uh, well known, at, at least from, from Venezuela. There's a lot of people in Venezuela who believe that. There's a lot of people in most countries in South America. But I lived, uh, as, I, as I told you, I, I lived in Chile for a few months and, and in Peru for a few months. And there's a lot of people who think that most of the problems that not just in Venezuela, but in other countries in South America are because of Americans uh, dealing with the, the politics and the and secret operations and stuff like that with, with all these countries. Oh, by the way, could you get closer and to the uh, to the phone? Yeah, I'm not... Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure where your volume is coming from. If you get closer to the phone, it may be a better volume. I'm not, I'm not sure. Oh, it's supposed to come from here. How about oh, now? okay. That, then that's fine. Then that's fine. No, no, no worries at all. So, what uh, uh, no. what was your life growing up in Venezuela like? Well, um, it was a bit strange because uh, I was I'm not old enough to know the what people uh, adults refer to as the Venezuela from before. <laughs> it's a, it's some, a saying that you hear a lot in Venezuela, that, oh, this is not nothing like the, the old days and stuff like that. Uh, the Venezuela with, you know, a, a strong uh, a strong coin, strong uh, economy, strong everything, you know, a, a, a nice developing country. Uh, and I'm not young enough 
to only know the the new Venezuela. I was I was born and, and raised like in the middle, right in the in the transition. Like the, the only president I ever remember uh, in Venezuela was Hugo Chavez, is what I always had uh, for most of my life. So Hugo Chavez came in and he started making changes uh, through policies, through uh, a lot of stuff that's happening in 2002. I'm sure you guys already talked about that with the with the other guests. Um, so it was always changing. It was always like it was this constant feeling of decay. Even though I didn't know anything about politics or didn't care about at all, I remember stuff like uh, one year uh, it will be harder to find. I don't know, like like a kid, it was it will be harder to find some chocolates that I liked or or some cookies that I liked. They, they were suddenly you know, oh no, honey, we cannot buy that for you for you because. There's nothing in the market. There's nothing in the supermarket or, or whatever. And, and like, I wouldn't understand why that happened. But that was just uh, the perspective of someone who was growing up in this, in this changing times, you know. So it was, uh, I guess, not as difficult for me as it would be for someone who was already old at the, at the moment or old enough to understand what was happening. Uh, who will actually see and understand why and where the changes will be, were being made. It was just something that I learned to grow up in that change, in that uh, specific change. Of course, when I get older, like uh, 17, 18 years old, when I started college and I moved to another city uh, away from my from the city I was born, yeah, I would, I would, I guess, I would feel more of these changes because I was uh, by myself, not with my parents, but with my sisters in another city. Uh, so I started to learn about these changes and how difficult it was to make a living, to yeah. uh, buy food and, and all these things. And of course, the situation was getting every time, every year, worse and worse and worse and worse. Uh, the changes for me, or at least the difficult part for me, it was more in my when I was already a young adult, not more that much, not that much as a young kid. So, Kimberly, now yeah. you have a chance to ask questions to a Venezuelan expat. What are the things that you are wondering about the most? Well. Um, you know, you said that the 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 switch was it was more gradual for you. Um, but when, um, as as somebody who ex was able to experience that in a more um, consumable way, what was your observation like as a as a younger person watching the people around you as as these dramatic changes were happening? Well, it, it, it's kind of funny because um, my dad actually is someone who is obsessed with the United States. <laughs> so he will always point out all of the bad things that were being, that were being decided or that were happening, and we we'll compare it to how the United States would do things. Yeah. So, for example, uh, uh, Hugo Chavez started doing this thing where he will uh, just take the company and make it now, uh, public, like a part of a private, uh, public market company. He will now go and he will be like, let's take this company. And then you will just take it. And now it's a public name from the government is kind of thing. So <laughs> it was funny because my dad will always like get mad at that. He will be like, oh no, you know, this will never happen in America. But in the United States, it will be totally different all these times, this kind of thing. But <laughs> as a kid, I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually understand it. It was just uh, in a sense like my like crazy dad, <laughs> like in a, in, a, in a silly way. Your dad um, sounds like a true American patriot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He always had the, the American flag in, in our home. <laughs> and by the way, for those who are just joining us right now, we got nine people watching. For those who are just joining us, we are here with uh, Kimberly Coulter and Coulter's niece. And we are here with uh, my friend John Gonzalez. We met at the Zuby meetup. He is a Venezuelan expat, wonderful dude. I love you, man. And I love everybody here who is watching this. Please don't forget to subscribe. I love you too, man. <laughs> and nice to meet you, Kimberly. Nice. That, n well, okay. Right now, here's what I'm very curious about. Yes. What would you say to people who are leaning on the left 
about this whole idea of Venezuela being the victim in all this related to American intelligence agencies trying to take it over? Well, I mean, it's kind of difficult because uh, one will, like a person will always believe what they will actually live. You know, it's, it's hard to listen to other people when your heart, because let's be honest, the, the left, leftist idea of uh, socialism uh, by itself, it, it's tricky because it, you would think like, let's say you, uh, we nobody wants poor people, right? Nobody wants mm-hmm. that. Uh, some people be poor, some people don't eat, uh, or, be, you know, nobody wants this kind of thing. So the, 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 the core idea with socialism is to take these feelings that you feel when you think about poor people and try to make the, I, I guess, an easy solution and an immediate solution for those types of problems. The thing is that you cannot uh, create solutions for such a big problem. So the thing is, in Venezuela, it, this already happened in Venezuela where they started making the changes. If you see, you, you can look Google uh, or search on YouTube videos of Hugo Chavez when he was running in 1999. And he was a very well-spoken man, actually. It, 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 like, at, for, for the time, I could understand why so many people got uh, in, engaged with him because mm-hmm. he got a, uh, well, he also ride a lot. <laughs> you know, he had a little he, parrot on his shoulder, dress, right? Did he really? Yeah, there was a photo of him with a parrot on his shoulder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the thing yeah, with, the, yeah, yeah. you know, like the the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and I think that that's like the perfect summary for socialism. Exactly. That that's the problem. That so many people uh, get really engaged with this feeling of we just want everyone to be, you know, to be happy, to be able to to eat, to to enjoy life, you know. But the thing is that. There are uh, key issues with this, with with the with the, with the leftist ideology, mostly in in, in America. It uh, hasn't had uh, the opportunity, fortunately, of not living under this idea. So they're actually implementing them. For, because, for example, Venezuela was a very, very, very rich country, very, very rich country in the 80s and in the 90s, mm-hmm. even in the 90s. Uh, so rich that when Hugo Chavez was president for like 2000 to 2010, he gave away, literally gave away food, medicine, and money to all of the countries, of uh, maybe not all, but maybe most of the countries in South America, Argentina, Brazil, uh, Chile, Ecuador, all, all these countries. He gave out tons and tons of money uh, because he wanted to, uh, he can't believe this idea that uh, 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 how do you call it? Uh, this figure in the Venezuelan history called Simon Bolivar. Uh, I'm sure you know what about him. Uh, he believed in something called the La Gran Colombia or the Great Con- Colombia, uh, which will be like all of South American or most of South American countries, mm-hmm. uh, fighting in just one country, just mm-hmm. one big country. Well, well, like a pan South American uh, movement. Would that be a good way yeah, to define yeah. it? And, and also, and also, and he will also do it uh, with the intention to buy votes, or in a sense, they will buy votes in the UN, so who he will gain more, like more uh, uh, power, let's say, with 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 issues within in the UN. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at, at the years like 2003 to 2009, he will have a lot of influence in what will was uh, decided in the UN. For South America and also in the so uh, how is it called the OEA. It's like uh, an association of only uh, Spanish country or Spanish countries or South American countries, something mm-hmm. like that. Like the UN, but for outside of the of the, <laughs> of the continent. Yeah. So he so, also he also teamed up with I'm not sure if it's Hugo Chavez or Maduro after him. When did the teaming up with FARC occur? The uh, FARC is the uh, rebel organization in uh, Colombia. Well, that goes 
really, really back, uh, almost to almost the beginning of his presence. Like after the the big, uh, I guess you will call it in English like coup attempt in 2002, mm-hmm. uh, he went crazy and he will be like a teammate, or he will create like this very close team with Cuba. And from that, a lot of these things started happening in Venezuela. I guess you could say it was like Castro's uh, influence in Chavez or Chavez's influence with the Castro or whatever. But the thing is that after this, all of these things started happening. The reports and stuff came way uh, after that. Like, I think like from 2008 uh, and 2008 and afterwards, it's when you start hearing about these things like the park and stuff like that. But personally, I know a person, uh, like I, I met a, a girl in the city I'm from, who had a family person, like the, I don't want to give too many details in case somebody from there, you know, but I know that somebody who was from the park, like a park member, mm-hmm. who was living in, in that city. The, he was like a refugee from the from, from Colombia, there in in, 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 the, sorry, in my city. So it, it, he was living in that city for a lot of time, you know, a lot of, of years. I don't know how many years exactly, but not that's too much. Two thousand and eight, probably be, before uh, two thousand and two even. So it's uh, it's really. Uh, uh, difficult to, to define when exactly all of this started. All, all those relations started, but it's way back, way back. And, and there's also a relationship between uh, Venezuela and uh, the Russian Federation as far as uh, drug running goes. And uh, I've also read reports about there being Russian uh, contractors that are sent over to Venezuela to guard, to enforce certain things. And uh, I'm not sure how much they are working with the drug trade. I'm sure that it's quite a lot. Like I mentioned before, Putin was running cocaine through uh, the St. Petersburg Harbor back when he was the uh, deputy uh, mayor of St. Petersburg. So I think it goes really deep. Yeah. But uh, I don't know, like in your personal experience, were there a lot of Russians in Venezuela that you kind of like saw were up to no good or it's not that uh, open? It's more like underground. Uh, I guess it was more on the ground, at least for me. I didn't saw a lot of Russians in Venezuela. At least, I, actually, I didn't saw any Russians at all. But what is strange is that from, I think it's 2018, uh, like fa- my family there, uh, friends that I had mostly in the capital, started sharing photos and videos of Rus- Russian uh, people from the Russian army in Venezuela, mm. uh, like the people will see them and they will recognize that it's not like the same uniform as the Venezuelan army. So uh, there was a lot of speculation uh, with that. And then the government started saying that Russia was helping with some military operations and and to help Venezuela to defend uh, <laughs> from the attacks of the, you know, <laughs> of the United States and the CIA and all these things. <laughs> Well, as far as an attack from uh, the United States, my, oh, go on. Uh, the, at least for myself, the the, the Russia Venezuela relationship actually uh, became clear for me, like from 2018. Wait, the Russian Venezuelan relationship? What since 2018? Uh, became clear to me uh, since 2018. Hmm. No, not before, well, not they me. they also uh, sell the Venezuelans, uh, from what I read, a lot of uh, military uh, weaponry uh, in return for the uh, crude oil. So around uh, $4 billion worth has been sold. So one fear is that uh, there were uh, planes that were spotted, these uh, bombers, that are capable of uh, housing a nuclear arsenal. So if we're talking about like all this geopolitical stuff, even though like I was talking before with Kimberly about how maybe it makes sense to uh, cut some fat out of the military budget just so it's more efficient and does the same thing, there is always this fear of like, like, oh my God, like we can't do anything to this military of ours because if, for example, they are starting like a nuclear or some kind of nuclear armament, it's the unfortunate nature that we're in today where 
even though we have the idea of mad mutually assured destruction we don't know who's going to be willing to press that trigger or not yeah like the the, the problem with venezuela is uh, at least in this sense is that we became uh completely uh what's the word Sorry, I sometimes I forget work. But by the way, you sound so much better now. I don't know what happened. You sound incredible right now. Uh, oh, and... I, I took off my, my ah. phones. Yeah, my, my headphones. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go. Now that explains it. Perfect. We read you loud and clear, and we currently have 12 people watching. For the 12 people who are currently watching, uh, my name is Lev Polyakov. With me is Kimberly Coulter, and with me is the great John Gonzalez, and he is an expat from Venezuela, and please subscribe subscribe the hell out of this show this is the greatest most underrated show in all of youtube history we bring people together friend. yes tell everybody tell the world just start <laughs> sending mother, texts out right now <laughs> and don't forget to become a patron some of the people who are watching this right now all 11 of you i know you i know you guys you guys are super generous you are wonderful guys whether we met at the animation festivals whether we met at film festivals whether we met at wherever like the bill sobel uh events at the time warner center whatever it is I want you to know that what we are building right now is important. We are bringing people from different bubbles together. We are popping the hell out of those bubbles and we are having actual communication take place. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And by contributing today to our Patreon, patreon.com slash Jules, you are going to help build this up into something that has never been seen in the entire history of web entertainment. This is both entertainment and it's informative and I love you. I love everyone. John, uh, now that you are not with the headphones and you could speak clearly, what I want to... Uh, the mask off. Yes. There we go. There yeah. we go. Look at that. <laughs> Yay! John Gonzalez, everybody, in the flesh. What brought you to Zuby? Because that's where we originally met up. We met up at uh, the Zuby event. Zuby was on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast. Wait. He's a fitness guy, rapper. For two seconds, can you just tell me, like, the the moron in the room what that is <laughs> zuby wait what is that what zuby yes okay Zuby is this uh, English uh, black dude who I think I don't know if he's English or maybe he lives in England, but he is a rapper. He's a fitness dude. And he's uh, I'd say he's more like libertarian leaning, you know, like he's one of those people who addresses that ever so present problem of liberals being uh, not so liberal with the way that they treat people from other points of view. And to me, that was what brought me to that uh, to that original meetup that we had at Dave and Buster's. And and what's funny is that I met uh, my uh, my friend who works at the um, I was about to say the Colbert Report. It's not called that anymore. It's called uh, <laughs> wait, the Tonight Show with Stephen Colbert, right? Is that what, or the Late Show? The Late Show. The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. Yes. Late. So my friend works there. <laughs> yes, and he was playing one of those games there, at Dave and Buster's. So it's very interesting how like that side of the Colbert of, I'm going to call it the Colbert report, whatever that side. <laughs> it's like, they don't unfortunately have conversations like we're having, or like Zuby was having with Joe Rogan. It's completely alien, even though like, I really enjoyed a lot of Stephen Colbert stuff. I remember watching the Colbert report, which is why I still call it that. Um, like, I think that the area we're in today, and I'm curious what you guys think of this. I think the era we're in today is one where the celebrity, when they don't have the support of their writing staff anymore we see the facade crumble we see that they are built on um we see that they are built on clay feet you know like that whole model of you know like the uh, golden head and the silver bust and whatever and then eventually have the clay feet the clay feet are going to get knocked down and in response we're going to have people online doing what we're doing right now having conversations deep conversations funny conversations i mean it's already happening right now with the podcasting world but i just want to say that this is a great time to be alive and back to john gonzalez what brought you to zuby let's start with that well it was actually uh, very very funny to the to, to know about the zuby meetup uh i was following him for a couple of months i think uh because i i like the way he he presented himself, you know, he presented his ideas, the way he expressed himself. I, I thought it was very interesting to follow him. And it was just by 
uh, by chance that I saw a tweet that he was at New York and that he was yeah, he wanted to meet with people in New York. And I thought it would be nice because, uh, as you said, it's not uh, so easy to have these kind of conversations with people. And I thought, you know, maybe I can meet people there that with whom I, I could share some of these thoughts or, or you know, we'll talk about these these, these matters. Uh, I heard you, heard you talk a lot about uh, U.S. politics, and I made you some questions. You and Jules, I made you some questions about it because uh, I would like to understand more about how this politics here work. You know, I, I only lived here for almost uh, a year and a half. And my perception from it, it's just from where I've been living here, you know? So I, I like to understand more uh, about what, what's the common thing here in those, uh, in those matters. So that's why I decided to go to the SUVI meetup. Well, I remember you were talking uh, during the meetup about white supremacy and racism. And uh, I'm uh, curious, like, if you can elucidate, like, what you think as far as, uh, like, racism here in the U.S. versus uh, in uh, Venezuela. Well, um, it, it's strange. I, I, I think I told you that one like, time, guys. Uh, uh, it's strange because uh, there is a lot of talks about um, uh racism and xenophobia and all these things here in the u.s uh i like i cannot talk for the whole u.s or i cannot talk for the experience of of everyone but in my experience i've been living almost a year and a half over here and even to this day i haven't experienced the first uh situation where someone even like looked at me like you have you know a strange look or or something like that because uh, i'm venezuelan or because I'm a foreigner or whatever, or because my English is not perfect or something like that. None of that, at least here in New York and in my experience for what I've lived here. God bless uh, <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I mean, maybe I've been lucky. Yeah. Uh, I'm, maybe I'm just being lucky. But, you just happen but to least... avoid all of the racist people. You never, <laughs> ever encountered one. They just, they, they hate you so much that they just completely <laughs> never even encountered. <laughs> <laughs> never even looked at me. Yeah. <laughs> They have a, they yeah, have a little they're... scouter to make sure that nobody exactly. like it's no like foreigner. Gaydar. It's gaydar, but it's other it's other nas <laughs> nations. They they just go nope, ten blocks away, not that guy. Let's mm. go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, no. And the, the strange things is that uh, I have I lived with xenophobia uh, with some people in countries like Chile and in Peru, which is strange because it's like brother uh, our brother nations you know well so well don't they have a caste system in a way like since the conquistador time like isn't there sort of like a default caste system of like certain people being on top and others being in the bottom like i don't know if that's the case today or not hopefully it isn't but uh is something like that present or no uh like as far as like a racially based ca caste system in venezuela oh then no, at least as I, uh, as far as I know, no, no, not at all in in in, in Venezuela or in none of those countries. Uh, it's just like, you know, wealthy, not wealthy. <laughs> mm, that's the big differentiator. That. <laughs> well, that that's good in a way. I mean, I'm happy that people were able to look over any uh, racial uh, bigotry they might have had. Now they're just discriminating based on who has uh, money or not. Not that that's great, <laughs> but uh, but another thing that I'm curious about in these uh, in these countries is that I keep hearing about people who are wealthy not being able to go into the uh, like they go into the government sector. Not that many people start their own business. Would you say that that's the case, like with people who are uh, wealthier in uh, Venezuela as well as uh, other countries in uh, South America? Definitely, it, it definitely, it definitely is because it, it there is no 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 guarantee that, for example, all your earnings are gonna go for you, uh, and there is actually no, ac absolutely no guarantee that the government is not gonna take away your your company. That's why most of the uh, mm. foreign countries companies uh, left Venezuela. Because uh, there was a moment, I don't remember exactly what year it was, but maybe it was 2013 or 2014, or maybe later, that uh, all big companies, like the, the, whatever company would make uh, like Oreos or, or, you know, or Nike or, or these types of companies, started leaving the, the country in, in 
basically all parts of the country because the the government was were just like uh, there is actually this famous case of a uh, Kellogg's uh, this Kellogg's fabric or this this building from Kellogg's that the government over uh, overtake they they just went and like you know what the com the company is not making as many products as we need them to so we are gonna take the company and make it work and they they literally took the the, the building and start and kept making like the cereal the the how do you call it like cornflakes <laughs> they started making this as if it were the Kellogg's company but the Kellogg's company was not running that that building uh, anymore it was the government wow and if they kept it that way for uh, for uh, some time and uh, afterwards it <laughs> it was a mess and they couldn't keep uh, doing the products but because of these situations most companies left venezuela and if if you got money and you want to start a business in venezuela you it, it's almost like uh, you have to be almost obligated to have some certain relationship with the government you said uh, like you need the government in your business so you can make a business it's uh it's the same thing with russia in uh, russia if you want to make a business if it's successful enough it's going to get uh stolen from you by putin's friends that he went to a uh, judo class with back in his youth and uh, I'm sure that even Putin didn't want this to happen originally. Maybe he had some good intentions, but it's just the nature of the beast. If he's not, if he's not gonna do these favors for people, they're probably gonna eat the guy alive anyway. Somebody else is gonna take over. But maybe that's gonna be a good thing. I mean, I am hoping for Russia as well as well as Venezuela to go through a. Uh, peaceful transition into there being a lot more of a representative democracy and people try like in russia we have opposition forces of course they're always getting persecuted they're always getting thrown in jail they're always getting poisoned like is the same thing happening right now with the opposition in uh, venezuela Sorry, could you repeat the question again? Is the same situation happening in Venezuela, like in Russia, where you would have opposition forces to Maduro that would be met with certain unfortunate uh, accidents or that would be persecuted to the full extent of the uh, power of the state? Oh, yeah, 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 totally. totally. Uh, um, way too many cases as, as anyone would want to admit. Uh, it's... I, I don't I don't know exactly the number, but there are actually been like hundreds of people being uh, put in jails and prosecuted because of just like uh, doing something. Let, let let's call it like what you do like a rally, mm -hmm. uh, something like that uh, in the in the streets. Just because of it, uh, more a lot of people will be put in jail. Like in the city I study, it's called Maracaibo. And it was a very uh, hot spot for protests and stuff like uh, like that since 2013, and and a lot of people uh, who I happen to know for in this protest will be taken to jail for like I know I knew the some people that they they didn't seem like you know like uh, people who rob or, or, yeah. or do. Oh, and by by the way, be, before I forget, I was looking at photos of some of the Venezuelan protesters, like the female protesters. They were so sexy, like the way that they were. <laughs> they are the sexiest I protesters I have I have ever seen. I bet you could just like Google that, like say like sexy Venezuelan protester. You're probably going <laughs> to see like this. Sexiest part of it for it to show up, or can I just type in Venezuelan? <laughs> I, I I I don't know. I I hope you could do both. I'll uh, do both. But uh, I'll yes, do one of each. We'll yes, see. but. Uh, how much do you think, like, I know in going back to Russia, because that's the only perspective that I have as far as, like, an authoritarian country that my parents are from. Um, I know that in Russia, they have these protests. They uh, get uh, knocked down by the police. Old people get beaten up. You know, kids, like, 13-year-old girl got beaten up. And this is absolutely fine. Nobody does anything about it. In fact, there was an old man who just had a comment that he wrote on the internet talking about how this was unfair the way that, like, uh, this protester girl was treated. And as a result, he got arrested. 
and this is like like a 76 year old man like i don't know this is like an old man you do and, have to type sexy by the yes, way yes you do have to type sexy have so type yes <laughs> so yeah like this is the situation in russia and the people who are in charge even though russia is a very homophobic country many of the people who are in russian parliament they uh you know they like the dick like that's the other thing <laughs> it's a very um it's a very uh what's the word that i'm looking for uh hypocritical it's a very hypocritical regime where they say one thing to the people yet they do another behind closed doors and it's a okay and they treat people like cattle you know like they they think that russian people are stupid they don't know any better that they need this father figure to yeah. take care of them but as a result a lot of them end up uh, just being exploited over and over and over again but uh you were saying that, that you I'm not gonna lie nice <laughs> nice. <laughs> I wish American female processors looked like that instead of Morpheus <laughs> asexual globs. Yes, well, I think that that is because the people who are protesting in Venezuela are regular people without without a stick up their ass who just want to live in a uh, free don't play identity politics either yes exactly <laughs> exactly why don't we get some of your protesters to just like move here but i mean that's the other th that's the other thing by the way like you want to save venezuela you don't just want to move somewhere else right like you are do you eventually uh john do you eventually want to move back to venezuela and have a life there have a family or are you settled on being in new york uh, well, at, at least for me, uh, I get used a lot of being away. Uh, I, like I will return just for you know see my family, mm -hmm. see like see my parents or my my sister or, or or my friends from there and stuff. But personally, I don't think I will return to Venezuela. Uh, to, at least to to live and to spend my life there I, I don't think so I think I, I got my I might say used to to the way uh, how do you call it like the way of life here mm-hmm well, it's a very nice way of life here. We obviously have a lot of problems like we talked about before, but going back to the original thing we talked about in the car with the CIA you know doing coups and things like that, what is your stance on America as far as how far it should go as being uh, the policeman of the world when it comes to regimes as problematic as the Maduro regime? Well, ob obviously my, my, sorry, <laughs> obviously my, my perspective is from someone who see from the outside what good it could actually do this police of the world thing will do you know mm -hmm. so obviously a lot of countries outside uh, benefit from this and even the united states for example uh nobody took care of venezuela when hugo chavez started doing all these crazy things and i don't know it, it's strange it's like nobody realized how dangerous it was becoming and now it turns out they are like they are I heard a person talking about uh, about this. A uh, friend told me this this thing that I, I think is actually true, that Nicolas Maduro, uh, Diosdado Cabello, and the people who are on the on the tops of, of, of Venezuelan government, they did or they accomplished what uh, what's the name of his uh, this famous like uh, this famous narco, Pablo Escobar. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. What Pablo Escobar wanted to do with Colombia, you know, actually run the whole country. He was taking cities and stuff like he literally uh, managing their country. They did it. They accomplished that in Venezuela. They are they are the government and they run the, the drugs and, and stuff and they are actually mm -hmm. moving people uh, from terrorism around the world. You know, to I guess overtake everyone who stands uh, in front of them. And it's like it, it's crazy. It, it's crazy that these things happen. So. You need someone who will to look uh, to that and say, and not just say, "Hey, stop it," but actually do something. You know, because for example, there are um, a bunch of countries around the world who uh, recognize uh, the situation in Venezuela. Uh, I actually don't like that much that that uh, statement. Like, uh, I recognize the problems in Venezuela. <laughs> 
because it's been years of all countries and everyone and everywhere in the world people recognizing uh, yeah venezuela is having a problem it, and recognizing it's, and it's recognizing. like awareness week it's like insert the blank yeah. awareness week yeah and it's like okay you recognize it you, you know it you know it's there <laughs> Then what? You know, the now what? what yeah. <laughs> what's the next step? You know, uh, so it's it, in a sense, it's needed. Even if a lot of people doesn't like it, if you had a bunch of a group of people uh, getting together and working on something, even if they are different people, you have need someone to, to put some order on it. You know. But when you You're say have it's everyone... needed, what what do you mean by it's? So, so for example, if let's say we had an intelligence agency, right, like going out and uh, assassinating, you know, this uh, leader of a country in order to then eventually bring peace to it, like would that be an optimal move or no? Like I could definitely see there being repercussions from doing anything of the sort. But uh, w what do yeah. you think? That's that's also the difficult part, you know, because who is the police of the police? You know, who is gonna watch out that the police is doing the job uh, fair and square, and you know, mm -hmm. so th that's the difficulty of it. Uh, so, uh, like a solution uh, for all these problems of, with, on such a big scale, it, it, you know, it's hard for me to to even gather thoughts that could lead to something like that, but. All, but also looking at the other side of the picture, if you had no one, uh, maybe not as obviously not as assassinating, you know, uh, regular people or, or whatever, or overtaking, you know, uh, freedom from people or something and things like that. Uh, that's not the obvious. Obviously, that's not the the choices you want to make. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, of uh, government, who is going nuts, who is bringing uh, not just violence and crime and, and all these things to its country to its people uh but also to the people to the neighbors surrounding it and potentially to everyone else mm -hmm. from uh, the whole continent mm -hmm. the continent next door or the whole world it, that's something that you, you cannot just look away from that you know or just say hey uh, you should stop or <laughs> something like that you know there needs to be uh consequences for these actions and there's an issue of nuclear power, too, where there were, like I said before, these uh, bombers that were spotted that are capable of carrying nuclear material. So when it comes to something like that, it's, uh, it's a big problem because some people may be willing to press that button. But we have a comment over here from Hero Alchemy. It's also not our business what other countries do. National sovereignty is important. So what would you say to that, uh, John? Yeah, that's also absolutely right. You know, the, yeah. you cannot also see other countries and other problems first than your own. You mm -hmm. know, obviously, at first you have to be, you know, you have to be the boss of your country, of your place, and you have sure. to run your your problems first. But if, uh, but if it's like a hostage say, situation, like let's say there was a house that somebody took the house over, they are holding the family hostage, and the family is not strong enough to, uh, you know, ward this uh, dude off, you know, to knock him in the back of the head or something. Like the little sister comes out with, you know, like some vase and just slams him over the head. <laughs> so in that situation, you're going to have like people who are uh, outside. Or, or of the, bottle of, the bottle of wine perfectly positioned right exactly. next to the victim. You know? Exactly. <laughs> So you're going to, in that situation, have to have some outside people coming in in order to assist. And that's been a very big problem with any foreign policy decision. Like, at what point do you do it? And also, there's always going to be yeah, people and, that and benefit. Also, also, you have to, and also, it, it's also important to note that even if it's not your, uh, in, in, say, in a, in a, in this way, it's also if, if even it's not your business, whatever all the countries are doing, and, and that's fine. It's it's none of your business. Also, you have to take care of your own business. It could also potentially be your business what these countries are doing if their actions are gonna be take be consequential for your interest or for your country or your people. That, you know what I mean? That's true. Like, let's say that yeah. Venezuela is uh, financing financing a lot of these uh, terrorist group that are in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. You know, so even if it's Venezuela, it will be 
uh, problem with the people that are being affected by this negatively in the Middle East. No, that definitely, you know yeah, that, that definitely makes a lot of sense. I would only hearken back to something like uh, the Roman uh, Empire when I was uh, reading about how they used to conduct uh, warfare. Their pretext for going into a new area and acquiring it was a matter of, as they said, self-defense. If we didn't acquire this area, then uh, somebody, you know, then they would attack us. So that may be. I don't think it's that much of an issue for the U.S. Obviously, the U.S. is connected via Central America, but that's it. I don't think we have any fear of Venezuela attacking us by land, but we still have a fear of nuclear retaliation, which is why I don't think it's that good that uh, Russia has planes that it's sending to Venezuela, like I said before, that could be armed with uh, nuclear weaponry. So it does seem to be like this never-ending horrible unfortunate proxy war that keeps happening over and over and over again with the stupid fucking uh uh grand chessboard you know and i hate it i hate the fact that we have to do this but my question to the anti-war people is if we did not do this sure there wouldn't be some big wigs that would benefit like everybody always benefits from any conflict you're always going to have them but if we didn't do certain military actions what would be the result then would people be better off or would would we escalate things into an even worse situation obviously with iraq i think that was horrible there is no reason for us to have have gone in there but because iraq exists i don't want that to be something that would blind people into any other uh decision or in this case lack of decision that would be made when it comes to geopolitics if Russia and China still exist. They're still out there. We can't just press a button and teleport ourselves into some other alternate dimension, you know, like some magical DMT dimension with spirit elves where we could just dance around all day and, uh, you know, we're stuck here. <laughs> we're stuck here. So yeah. <laughs> I know, like, I've been talking for a long time. I'm very curious about Kimberly Coulter, your thoughts on uh, this matter, not just foreign policy, but also if you have any questions you want to ask John. Um, well, I mean, what I really like to, to ask people who come to this country from other places is, you know, when it comes to um, explaining why the problems in Venezuela um, occurred and why we should discourage similar um, policies that are being pushed in America, I would ask you, like, how would you explain that to somebody in America, as somebody who had to go through the problems that and, and and witness all of the issues that went down in Venezuela in a very short amount of time. Well, uh, to understand how the, everything happened in Venezuela, it, it's you have to explain the long story uh, because it, there are like small pieces that have happened. Because the, the problem is that that it happens gradually, like so, like it takes some time, so much time to. So much time in, in, in our terms, you know, like 20 years is a lot of time for us, but it, it, if you look at history, maybe 20 years is nothing, you know? Yeah, it's relative. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, but but like uh, it's happened so gradually and like with so much subtle things that seems like nothing. For example, let's say, uh, let's say just like raising taxes or, or raising uh, the amount of like government permissions that you need to make a business or or, or to do these kind of uh, any kind of, of things in, in in the country, you know, yeah. it looks like a very subtle thing. The problem is that that first thing it's gonna be always followed by a second thing, by a second step. What's the next step? The, the next step is if if you wanna export something from the country, you need to pay an extra tax or you need another extra permission that will cost this extra with this part of the country. And if you are from this other city and you have to go to other city, you need this other extra permission for that and, and pay extra for that. And then everything will be growing exponentially until you know what? You are actually not making the revenue that we need you to be making. So yeah. we're going to take your company or we're going to take 51% of your company and we're going to run it for you. And then it's going to be like, you know what? 51% is not enough because you're not actually doing anything. It's the people who's working for you who's doing the things. Yeah. So we're going to take basically all of the company and, and, you know, it will be happen like step by step by step. Yeah. So it, it's, 
No, go ahead. It's hard to just, sorry, it's hard to just uh, like attack the only one small idea or one small uh, step. You know, you have to look at the, at the big picture on how bad things could go. Well, the thing is too, and we, you know, you brought, you address this when you talk about like what is gradual, you know, in the grand scheme of things, 20 years really isn't that long, right? You know, um, but for me, you know, I'm 27, 20 years is most of my life. So it, it really <laughs> is relative when it comes to how you are interpreting a situation, you know, like when it comes to the history of a country, which is several has, you know, decades of history versus, you know, my understanding, you know, if, you know, we're going to isolate my own. It's like a very microcosmic example. But in Venezuela, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call the decline gradual. I think that from, you know, what what was it, roughly 10 years that it completely fell apart. Yeah. Um, if you t look at the, the grand scheme of the Venezuelan history, that's a blink of an eye. In a blink of an eye, everything fell apart. So, yeah. But that's the thing that it started going really, really nuts. I think it was from 2008 or 2009. Uh, from that to the next year, it started going insane. And I think 2013 is when it broke. It, you know, it just jumped off the cliff. You know, <laughs> it yeah. was, they were literally like, "Let's go!" You know, "Let's go full on." <laughs> you know, yeah. but it, since 2002, there were a lot of small, subtle uh, policies or changes changes yeah. that, that Hugo Chavez were doing pretty smart, smartly, actually, pretty subtle things that they would be doing to, let's say, in preparation for these big changes, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, like, they did the same even thing more... in Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. honestly. They, so... they gradually introduced people to these ideas, right? And then once you get the snowball effect, right, then you can really... Boom! Then you can really hit people with where it hurts. <laughs> Soviet yeah, Russia too, yeah, by the way. Like in Soviet Russia, yeah, first exactly. off, it was only happening, I think, uh, just like in a couple of uh, areas. So people who were living out in the countryside, they were kind of like living like normal for a pretty long time. But they started introducing rules that they would post, you know, like in the town square, like little by little, like more rules got introduced. It's like, you know, imagine if you're a high school teacher, like if you ever had a mean high school teacher, if she took over the class from the principal, just like totally isolated your class and just started to enact new rules every time I, you know i picture the harry potter you know with uh with professor umbridge exactly nailing the rules <laughs> to the wall <laughs> yeah that's that's what they that's what they did and they also wore these very bizarre outfits like i don't know speaking of fashion again the hottest protesters i have ever seen in venezuela but uh fashion wise <laughs> it's a very regular thing like i know that chavez i mentioned he had a parrot on his um shoulder but it's like a standard military wear like nothing fancy right like the russians trotsky soldiers they wore a very strange looking getup with like this weird red pointy hat with the star on it so <laughs> no, nothing there in venezuela like that though right like everything's very very standard they don't try to uh hype the fashion up no No, just uh, just replicating the image of Hugo Chavez. I, I guess that would be the the, the biggest side of everything. Like, like haircuts there is this, or there is this, no? Like there is this design. I I don't know if you've seen it, which is just eyes, which is like Hugo Chavez eyes. It's a strange design, but the the idea behind the design is that. The commander Hugo is always looking. Look, <laughs> that's always looking for us. So we will be see everywhere in the streets. Wow. Like it will, if you go to any military base, even though you are not in military, it's not supposed to be run or to be part of any political party. You will literally see in any military or police or whatever security stuff you see in group or you will see in Venezuela, mm -hmm. they will have either a picture of Hugo Chavez 
or they will have the the eyes of Chavez painted all over the the place. By the way, uh, you guys uh, can't see it right now in the Zoom, but I'm showing the audience the uh, menacing looking Hugo Chavez eyes. And Kimberly Butler, uh, Kim Kimberly Coulter, you can look this up on your phone as well to uh, see what these things look like. Don't worry, okay. one day I'm gonna be brave enough to open up the uh, the uh, screen cap window. Right now, I just don't want to ruin this whole technological thing that we have going here. Like we're <laughs> We're, I can we're, like turn my phone around. Sure, absolutely. Well, the audience has already seen it, so oh, yeah, yes, right, they're, right. they're they're fine. But right yeah, that is head. that is so scary. That is literally like a 1984 yeah. style Big Brother is watching you thing. <laughs> yeah. And they take well, it. It's, it's is it like the cartoonish thing? It's not like cartoonish, Sorry. but it's like uh, po 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 posh polarized. No, it's like a red image with these eyes. It kind of yeah, looks like the Obey logo. Yes, that's it. Okay, that's yeah. what I was like. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's frightening. And they even have flags like that. See it the is. second image? They have flags with those Chavez eyes on them. I mean, that's like, <laughs> why wouldn't you protest? Like, here's what I don't get. This reminds me of... I don't remember what movie this is from, but it was like there were these Nazi soldiers that were standing guard and like one of them asked, wait, are you sure we're not the bad guys? You know, <laughs> like yeah. if, if you have that kind of imagery, you'd think that at a certain point they'd go, wait a minute, aren't we like... They've made them into glasses. Guys, oh my God. Amazing. I'm so happy. Amazing. That is... Uh, yeah, it's, it's super weird and it's literally everywhere when hugo chavez died the year afterwards they would paint this everywhere in, in every city i got my screen is frozen Hold on. there yeah. we go wow. yeah that's hugo chavez heart the heart for the uh, for the republic with hugo chavez eyes so that's basically the heart of chavez and chavez himself is looking at you he's looking at, at, the, at the republic he's looking for the republic yeah, we we love you, we love you, but we're gonna keep. You remember, like, and analyze this. Yeah. So we have a we have a question from Hero Alchemy, uh, John. What are your opinions on immigration to the United States? Do you think that Venezuelans immigrating to the U.S. harms the ability of Venezuelans to fight for a better government? Oh, that's such a good question. I yeah <laughs> hero yeah. hero you uh, knocked it out of the park with the questions today <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I mean it's i wouldn't say that it would be harder for venezuelans to to fight to, you know to fight for the, for the government in, in in the in in venezuela if you are here it depends on what you are doing actually or what your intentions are you know mm -hmm. like being here you could do like this kind of things you can do it openly and freely like open uh, talking just talking about the situation and you know making awareness of it and and try to look for you know ways of helping with the situation uh even just it's strange because it's it's also even though i don't like the the idea of just recognizing uh public opinion can be a very strong weapon sometimes so uh it, it, it can define a lot of things. For example, the response of the United States with the with Venezuela. And oh, that's a very beautiful cat. <laughs> this is Steve, the official co-mascot of the uh, Break the Rules live stream. And Steve is here to remind everybody to leave a like, leave a like for like. Steve <laughs> and subscribe to our channel. Yeah. And also join our Patreon, patreon.com slash 11 jewels. <laughs> So here is Steve for the close-up, beautiful cat. Patreon.com slash love and jewels. There we go. Everybody loves Steve. Steve! <laughs> Steve is awesome. So, so yeah, anyway, so, sorry, interrupted. No, no, it's okay, it's okay. okay. Uh, so yeah, so as I was saying, you know, uh, you can do so much more things here. Because the problem is that in Venezuela, you, you cannot protest. You usually don't have that many platforms where you can speak, uh, uh, you know, uh, make opinions or make points or, or, or do these kind of things. Uh, usually you will get very bad uh, response from the government if you do anything against the government. So 
in a sense, being outside of Venezuela, it actually helps to at least understand more how things uh, go or how things could go. You know, there are a lot of people who are outside of Venezuela uh, doing things in Colombia, in, in Brazil, here in the United States. Uh, there is a mm -hmm. lot of a very big uh, Venezuelan community who is doing a lot of things for Venezuelans and for the country uh, in Venezuela. Uh, from things like uh, race, uh, doing things like fundraising and stuff like that uh, to bring food and medicines to Venezuela mm -hmm. to also bring this Venezuela situation from a, uh, from the people's perspective, not just the politics, but also the people's perspective of what we move with, what we actually need there. You know, uh, mm -hmm. for example, there is a big uh, community in, I think it's Miami or Florida, that uh, it's very in touch with people like uh, Marco Rubio. Uh, he's a, his name comes a lot in Venezuela. And it's because of the Venezuelan community in Florida that uh, gets so much in touch with him, or at least with people, mm -hmm. I, I guess, people near, near him. I remember before even leaving Venezuela in 2018, I knew who Marco Rubio was because he was the the person who will speak about Venezuela uh, in the United States. So there were a lot of news about him in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. it, it may be strange. I, I don't know exactly how well known or how... No, no, he's pretty uh, well known here, but he's well known. Like the meme about Marco Rubio is that he's like a robot man. That's what I think most people remember during the 2016 <laughs> election. And the other thing, I mean, look, I'm very happy. I mean, thank you for telling me about this because that's, you know, points to Marco Rubio for that for sure. I still don't like the fact that he pretended not to know who Alex Jones was uh, when Alex <laughs> Jones confronted him. I think that that is already like, that is like dinosaur. That was a beta move. Yes. Well, that's like that. dinosaur politics shit. Like, we don't need that anymore. Everybody knows who Alex Jones is. Let's take the covers off. Nobody's yeah. taking it seriously anymore. We all, we're all on the same page, even if we happen to disagree on certain things. Well, the other thing that I found here, I'm curious about what you think of this. So, if you Google if you Facebook, Facebook has become a verb now. Oh God! If you Facebook, <laughs> if you Facebook um, Venezuela, you would get stuff like Venezuela Solidarity New York uh, by the Bol Bolivarian Circle Alberto Lavara, and then you would get other stuff like uh, Venezuela Libre, uh, Venezuela Democrática, Foro Público Político sobre la Situación Política Social Económica de Venezuela. So, uh, hands off Venezuela. Uh, so I don't know, like, who are the people who are, from what I understand, these are like pro Maduro people. Like, what is the situation there? Like, well, uh, uh, there is also this thing that the government in Venezuela has a very well. They have a, a big uh, play in social media. They know how to play social media. Uh, at least with their followers. So they will do a lot of groups, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of groups on Facebook, on, on Twitter, on, on accounts. There, there was actually, they are, in Venezuela, they are uh, pretty famous, the, the Chavista bots, mm -hmm. uh, which is like people who, like, you know, have these crazy accounts, thousands of accounts who will like, retweet, and respond to what. Maduro says or what Diosdado says in Twitter, you can actually look that up. You can go to Diosdado Cabello uh, Twitter and you go to the responses of the, of the, his tweets. And I don't know if it's still today. But I, I'm sure it will, but just in case. Uh, it, it, like from years past, it was like that. You will see the accounts of people uh, that will respond to him and there will be, you know, no picture or just a crazy Chavez picture and you go to the profile and it's just, uh, you know, the accounts that have basically no followers and all of his tweets are responding to, to these politicians. Mm -hmm. Like they wouldn't tweet about anything else. They would just answer to the, to whatever tweet uh, these politicians would do, you know, 
So it's etch it's all astroturf. Well, with these uh, Facebook groups, I really tried as much as I could. I messaged all of them. I tried to get them to come on this show, and same thing we were doing on Twitter. And there was this one guy who I remember addressed uh, us, and he was saying like, "Oh, I would never come on like you know this. You're full of fascists, you know. Like I'm not gonna converse with all these. <laughs> you know, like I might as well converse with Al Qaeda or the KKK. So yeah, <laughs> that was Al Qaeda or the KKK though. That's my that's my question. <laughs> Wouldn't you want to sit exactly, down with them, exactly? Wouldn't you want to... That's the thing that I don't understand about people who are like, I would never sit down with this hateful ideology. Wouldn't you rather understand who they are fundamentally? Wouldn't you rather know that the guy sitting next to you hates you rather than sitting there with a smile on his face? Like, you're so wonderful and I love you. <laughs> I would rather know. 10 out of 10 times, I would rather know. I would rather be able to point at someone to be able to be like, yeah, I know that guy is a bigot. Because we allow him to just say whatever he wants to say. Like, dig your own grave. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, allow people to yeah. do that. Give them enough rope to hang themselves with. And we have that example yeah. of um, uh, Daryl Davis, this uh, jazz musician who befriended ma members of the KKK and got them to take their hoods off. He was also on uh, Joe Rogan's podcast. So we have examples of breaking through these walls of bigotry and being able to do something about it. Yet, for some reason, these people uh, you know, who are online who want to say that this opposition to Chavez or Maduro or a bunch of American imperialist pigs, you know, well, I mean, come out and talk. There are people to this day that say that, that I forgot his name already. I'm sorry. I'm really terrible with that. But they say that the, the African-American guy who took people away from the KKK is a racist against black people. That's a, that's a, that's a narrative among Antifa right now. They literally protested <laughs> the Minds IRL event that Tim yeah. Pool had that guy and they were like this guy is racist he hates black people look at him like he literally got the grand wizard of the kkk to hand over his robes mm -hmm. what delusional existence do you live in well about that minds event it was supposed to take yeah, place in a theater and they canceled it because some antifa thug okay. called in to say that they were going to burn the theater down mm -hmm. Um, I would love for all these people who, are, especially with like Antifa being the way that they are, I would love for you guys and we can go back and I just I just want the audience to hear this one point. Please tell me one situation. I will pay a million dollars to one person who can give me one situation where the Proud Boys showed up to an Antifa event to try to um, harass them or ambush them. I, I Put that, put that money in the bank. You'll never find well, one. people were saying that the event that took place at the, uh, what was that fancy schmancy New York club called? Uh, I don't remember the name right now, but it's right next to the Harmony Club, which was, I think, the first New York uh, Jewish club. Oh, Metropolitan Club. That's it. So there was a video, though, that I saw of Antifa going and, like, throwing an object in the direction of the Proud Boys, and that's Are when the, the big... The what? Are you talking about the bottle of piss? Maybe. I don't know what was in that bottle. The, the, if that's the, Proud Boys the bottle of piss. The, the, oh, my like God. Four years right now over some dumb. I mean, I could go into that whole story if you want me to. I want to. I, it's a very. It's well, I think thing. I think we can definitely save that for another podcast. Yeah. It would be a lot of fun to talk about. But uh, yeah, there, we have we have a couple point of points I like to make yes. about what you said about the, the sitting down with people and, and try to understand their views or try to. Pers uh, not persuade them, but to try to make them understand your point of view. There's yeah. also a differentiating factor with who to do this or or the consequences of doing this uh, between two types of people. At least uh, talking in my perspective with the people who believe in uh, you know uh, Chavez in Maduro in, in this in this uh, people, which I, I guess will be like the hardest people for me to actually engage with. Uh, with a very heartwarming perspective, I guess, uh, because it's it's also it's also hard to understand for someone who's lived through it. Uh, for example, if I'm gonna sit with someone who's gonna tell me, you know what, Chavez was actually an amazing dude. He did a lot of good things. You know, socialism is the greatest things ever. You know, <laughs> I would think like it would make me think about situations horrible situations like being hungry like my own family being hungry my parents losing weight because we don't have food because not not even because we didn't have enough money to buy food but because there was no food at all uh being dependent you know trying to catch the person who will uh, make the list with something in, in, that we, they do in venezuela it's called the clap box 
like clapping box. Uh, it, it's uh, like a government program where they would give this box with food to people, to, to communities in, in all of Venezuela. It's, it's a nationwide uh, box of food that they give to people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so the, it. Uh, so yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, so it, it just. Uh, it may it brings back all of these memories and all these uh, situations that makes me feel really uh, it makes me feel disgust you know it made me feel uh, sometimes mad sometimes sad so that emotional response with the, with my own memories my own experience will get put me a little bit more apart uh, from doing these kind of things with people who are pro the mm -hmm. people who actually make this uh, in the first place you know who made this to me to my to my people Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also uh, important to note with the people with the, that believe in Chavez and all these these things. There are two types of people. First is the people who truly ideologically believe in these things. You know, believe in Hugo Chavez, believe in what he said, believe in Maduro, believe in in. in well, well, that's in, why. By the way, oh. shout, shout out to Jules Hamilton who asked, "Why do Maduro supporters like him so much?" Well, uh, the, that's, that, that's the point. That yeah. People who actually believed him and actually truly uh, followed his lead, you know. There are a lot of people who actually believe all of the things he say about the United States because they have a very persuasive uh, speech, you know, about we just want peace, we just want people to have decent life, we have everyone, we want everyone to have food, to eat, and and we care about working class people. So working class people, the the lower income uh, or the lower, uh, how would you call it? Uh, yeah, I guess the the, the poorest people, uh, or the people who happen to have more more work in their life or a harder life in a sense, they felt uh, almost an immediate collect, uh, connection with Hugo Chavez when he came in. You know, because he started talking about uh, about these people and to these people, we know you exist. We know your problems. We all we want to do is help you. So mm -hmm. when bad things happen, like uh, food shortages and and, and whatever, uh, they will blame other people because they are like, you know, this is what we believe and this is what you know because you receive the food we send you, you receive the money we send you, you receive the medicines we send you. So you know for a fact that we do these things for you. If we cannot deliver it for you, it's, you know, the, the oligarchy, the United States, or whoever else, or mm. whatever, uh, they are making us, they are stopping us from doing these things that we are already doing to you. It's, it's you know interesting, like, yeah. Like, it's, well, it's very it's, similar it's to... That thing. So a lot of people... Yeah. Sorry, what? No, no. Well, I was just going to say that it's very similar, I think, to obviously not to the same extent, but to the extent that, let's say, some uh, more democ democratically controlled districts where there are a lot of uh, poor people, uh, it seems like as a, I mean, New York, I wouldn't say is in that direction. I'd say maybe uh, Detroit, uh, Chicago, like that there would be this case of um, the politicians feeling like or expressing that look how much I give to the people, I care about the people. Meanwhile, a lot of their people are living in a pretty bad condition. And uh, it's hard to say something when the politician says, like, I am all about helping the people and you are a bigot and you are against these people. Meanwhile, their life doesn't change. And that's a very difficult, uh, difficult thing. Exactly. Most of the people who supported Chavez uh, when he first came in, uh, that were poor today, they are actually still and even more poorer than they were in that time. The thing is that the government's actions to those people can persuade them. You know, it's like if if you cannot, uh, if you actually leave uh, thanks to these things that the government is giving you, like mm -hmm. if you are the only food that you can get is what the government helps you to get. You cannot afford actually waiting months or years of something else happening without that 
with that thing coming to you, you know, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I also, so, and I also just people... want to distinguish, uh, just before I go any further, I want to distinguish that I don't think this is a partisan issue as much, because whether it's Democrat or Republican, I think it's more about, are you putting yourself in a position where people are dependent on you? So I just want to make that real clear that I don't believe that if you are a Democrat, you would automatically be like that. Or if you're a Republican, you would automatically not act like that. Obviously, there are some policy differences on one side or the other. But uh, anyway, I just want to make that distinction. Yeah, the, 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 which bring me to my... Sorry, what? I just said that you could definitely take an educated guess. It's disingenuous to imply otherwise. Well, I don't I don't know. I mean, I have to look at the other Republican districts and see what policies they're passing, because I think that you no, know, none of these districts is going to be perfect. I could say that there are certain districts out there like the ones that I mentioned who happen to be Democrat, who uh, have that. But I don't think it's like some plot that's hatched up by the Democratic Party to keep people in subservience. I mean, some people may be into that. But what again, I can't. Yes. Well, again, it's like I can't say because I don't know as far as these Republicans who are out there who may or may not be uh, supporting the same things the Democrats are supporting. So I don't know. A lot of those guys aren't actually Republican. Well, I mean, that's like a no true Scotsman uh, situation, right? That's true. That's true. Well, anyway. Just, uh, well, but to, to, to finish my point, uh, as I was saying that with that statement of the... Uh, People depending on the government brings me to my second point of the distinctions between the people who follow the ideology, people who actually believe in the ideology, and people who have interest or dependency on the ideology, yeah. which uh, I think are the real problem. Because, for example, people in Venezuela who are, I, I will say, maybe the people who is most loyal to uh, Maduro is people who have benefited from it. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people have got very rich when they started working in the government. Uh, suddenly they have a lot of businesses and stuff and a lot of money. Uh, people who, who benefit from all these things, you know, people in the United States, it's hard to actually persuade, uh, as we call it, Chavista, a person who, uh, who lives in Chavez ideology, uh, in the United States, who lives in the United States because he's benefiting from it. Like, he believes in Venezuela. He uh, he fights for whatever it's happening in Venezuela to keep it that way, to, for the government to keep their ruling. But it's in the United States. He's, he's not actually living those things. He's, he's benefiting from the United States while hiding the ideology of what's happening there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So if you have the if you have uh, a benefit that it's with you, within you, while you believe in the ideology, and those two goes in hand, it's hard to actually persuade you to go farther from, or far away from that ideology. Same with the people who live there, people who is depending on the government. It's very hard that you will make someone think or mm -hmm. make someone change their mind on the government when their whole livelihoods are dependent on the government. If the government is, doesn't give me my job, doesn't give me my monthly payment for being a citizen, doesn't give me my, you know, my, my box with food, doesn't give me my medicines, and doesn't give me all these privileges of being a, a supporter of the government that I have, yep. then how am I going to live? You know, how am I going to vote for someone else? Or how am I going to want this government to be overthrown if if this, you know, this channel of, of income is coming to me, I don't want that being cut. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's hard. It's one of those things where it's ultimately, like, ultimately, it is arguing in your own best interest to dissuade people away from what, what us Americans would call, like, marrying the government, essentially. But when you're in that situation, when you're constantly getting aid and when you don't, when you, like, cut off channels that you... <laughs> Um, don't okay. need to like focus on yourself it creates a, a dependency and I, I you know I brought this up earlier when I talked about you know like um, how how people perceive the world around them if you are used to accustomed to a certain way of living if you have grown accustomed to having certain 
benefits or aids, you're willing to more so look the other way when it comes to the ways that it's going to be detrimental to your life. And you're going to take that handout instead of going and doing the, the more difficult thing. So a lot of these like altruistic sounding government programs that are like, oh, we're just here to help. All we want to do is make your life better. What it does is it keeps you stuck in a cycle of poverty. It keeps you stuck in a cycle of dependence and it keeps you in a state where you don't argue for your own benefit because to argue for your own benefit means that you're taking away, you know, you're arguing for your own discomfort. And in an age of constant gratification and instant gratification, we are unwilling as a society to move away from that. And that's why like the Democratic Party is such a stranglehold on these different demographics because they're able to convince them they're going in and they're saying, look, we're the only ones that care. We have all these programs and without without us, you would be lost and hungry and nobody would give a, give a, give a crap about you. And it's like, that's not true. The fact that you are putting these, you are, you are locking people into cycles where they need to constantly depend on you. So they turn away from their society. They turn away from their community and they marry the government and they get looped in these cycles where they're giving their rights away and they're giving their powers away and they're giving their freedom of decision away to people who are just going to say, don't worry about it. We'll take care of you. And then once they have power, I've never heard American, Venezuelan, whatever. I've never heard of a government obtaining power and then giving it back. And that's the biggest problem with socialism with me. Yeah. It is, oh, look at this. We're just here. We're here to help, bud. We're going to put a Band-Aid on it and mm. we're going to get you some OJ and, and rub your back until you're feeling great. But then before you know it, everything you know is gone. You've given up everything. You've agreed to this like little stipend. And they're saying, don't worry, it's because we're taking care of you. And then by that point, you're arguing against your own self-interest. Like why, once you've gotten into the cycle where you have to rely on the government to pay your bills, where you have to rely on the government to eat, where you have to rely on the government to feed your family, why would you then suddenly say, oh, never mind, it's fine, I, I was wrong. You're not, right? Because you're in that cycle. Would you think that uh, one turn off people who are more liberal or on the left have towards conservatives is that like we were talking before about how they don't talk as much unless you're like a Ron Paulite they don't talk as much about the military industrial complex that's one but number two would be that they are so invested in these big businesses that they would look the other way before trying to change whatever you know tax loopholes these businesses have and uh, meanwhile they're voting for low taxes so whatever program that could possibly save people in the minds of the uh, people who are against the republicans uh you know like they, that program needs money and there's no other way so they would see conservatives as being people who talk about pulling oneself up by their bootstraps meaning i got mine like that's the attitude that's the attitude i think that uh, people have towards conservatives and well, i don't know totally false right like conservatives are the, some of the most charitable and like selfless people i've ever met in my life it has nothing to do with like, we don't want to help you. You got to do it yourself. If you don't do it yourself, you're a baby and you can't live in society or shame on you. Harumph, harumph. Exactly. Oh, I'm better. It's the only reason I succeed is because I'm better than you. No, it has nothing to do with that. Life is about struggling. Yeah. Well, Hero, Hero Alchemy makes a good point, which I think is another very important issue that we want to keep addressing on this uh, on the show when we do bring on like i would love uh kimberly for you to bring on uh more people who you would say would be more in like the corporate republican establishment because hero makes a good point he says good assessment of the left thank you very much uh but uh oh, uh or thank you to Kimberly very much, or thank you to everybody very much. I'm not going to be taking credit. No, forget for, forget me. You, you guys are the best. You guys rock. Anyway, uh, he says, but Republicans are married to corporate interests over their own constituents. And I don't, th he, he doesn't mean you. He yeah, doesn't mean I mean, I'm not a Republican. Like, I'm not, like, you know, like, yeah. I, I'm, I'm more of a, more of a, uh, a Goldwater conservative type than sure. I am. 
but he's talking about like the professionals who are yeah. out there who consist yeah. most like republicanism would mostly consist of these people because this is the machiavellian system we have that's yeah. who he's talking about and that well, issue i don't know if it gets addressed as much can, can well you, the, the, can the you, thing is that you can you could uh, go through that point that point through two different ways uh the first one is the 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 people who actually believe these things and the second one is the the politicians there are two different well, at least to me two different types of people you know the first one it's the regular people uh, who whatever life they're like, living uh, took them to have these beliefs or these views the second one is the politicians who are I don't want to send. I don't want to say a hundred percent, but at least ninety-nine percent of all politicians are just a piece of. Um, can I swear? <laughs> yeah, go for it. We've already done a lot of swearing here. It's absolutely fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was all my fault. Ninety-nine percent of politicians are usually nine, uh, just a piece of shit, you know. Usually, but politicians, uh, it's. It's you cannot trust a politician a hundred percent on following one belief or, mm -hmm. or one way or something like that because they will always have another interest. Whoever it is, whatever it is, if if it's a politician, they will always have something else uh, in mind. Sometimes, rightfully so, you know, if, if whatever job you're doing, your family comes first, for for example, or, or things like that. That could drive you to another direction that your job is not supposed to. Uh, on other times, it's just you know greed or or, or these kind of things. So uh, that I think that's a very important distinction to make uh, between the, the the people who uh, out in, in the example of, of Democrats and, and Republicans, usually the people are not actually that bad as the politicians. Well, we have the politicians and we have the people, but we also have the in between sector, which would be the media. And the bloggers and the writers. So, thank you. Good lord! Oh, yeah. Holy crap! The media is the worst. The media is the absolute worst. That is like. But you're also. Like, are you also including Fox News, though? Yes, I hate okay. Fox News. I don't. Okay, Tucker Carlson is an American treasure. And I hope he runs for president someday. I disagree with him on a few things, but yes, go on. It's fine. There's nobody on this planet, <laughs> political or otherwise, that I agree with 100% of the time. They don't exist. I haven't found... Not even... I've been in love with the guy sitting in the other room since we were 15 years old. There has really never did. been a single point in our relationship where I've agreed with him 100% of the time. Okay? So that will never happen, but... Um, <laughs> Sorry, sorry, I I went off on a tangent there. And I want to have him on, by the way. Bring 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 the hubby on. I would love to uh, talk with him oh, in the future. Will, yeah, he will. He'll come on. Excellent. Come on. So, uh, but y with the media though, you have an opportunity now that all these walls are breaking down, that we're stuck inside. But at the same time, the people who are usually sitting behind desks may actually have a little bit more time to reach out to other people. I want to get people who are on this more co conservative punditry talking about the nuances when it does come to something like the military industrial complex it's okay let's talk about it let's sit down let's track everything that has happened you know like let's talk about uh, that speech that eisenhower gave let's talk about uh, certain things that we can do to actually make people on the left see where <laughs> you know where people may be coming from the problem is that there's no mainstream narrative that supports conservative values, true conservative values. Fox News doesn't represent my values. That doesn't, you know. Your what, dog one agrees. News? You know, like, <laughs> you have One America News. Fantastic. I love Jack Posobiec. He's wonderful. But, you know, what else do we have? You know, mm. like, I work for the National File. Like, we broke the top 50,000 sites internationally for news in less than a year. So, like, we're not doing terrible, but who else? New York Times? No. CNN? MSNBC? ABC? I don't know. CNN? I mean, I mean, John, who do you listen to? By the way, what are your main media sources or Twitter accounts? Oh, or... I, I, I try to listen to as many different opinions uh, as I can because I, I think that most of the news outlets are mostly that uh, uh, they give the news but with an opinion on it at the same time at the, uh, at the right moment so um, subscribe to this podcast 
This yes. is where you're going to find the news. Independent <laughs> exactly. news is where you're going to get unbiased news. Yeah, the people who are watching right now, subscribe to our channel. We are the greatest, most underrated channel of all of YouTube history, and we are making strides. <laughs> Goddamn right. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you know, you have but, yeah, so but, uh, many good content creators these days. Would, or do you have, um, you know, John, I'd be, wonder, I'd be curious, you know, like we talked a lot about mainstream or whatever. Is there any like independent content creators that you have that are go-to for yourself when it comes to understanding news or, or interpreting current events um, internationally and in America? Well, I like to to listen or to see the, the way uh, certain people uh, portray news. Uh, mostly people who do podcasts or people who just make uh, content on YouTube and, and these kind of things. Uh, I, I, I listen a lot of uh, people from, for example, uh, I guess a more liberal, you could call it, it uh, would be, how's this guy called, um, Philip, Philip DeFranco. Mm, I, I remember Philip DeFranco, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he gives a lot of news, uh, political news, but when I hear him talk, it, he, it's more of a perspective from someone more left-wing in that right wing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I like to hear his perspective to see how he understands this news. And then I, I see the same news uh, with people like, like Ben Shapiro, who is more obviously more right-wing and who will have sort of a more, uh, I guess, pragmatic way to <laughs> to talk about things. That's what uh, we're yeah. <laughs> We gotta get Pardis on, uh, by the way. Pardis worked for Ben Shapiro. We gotta get her on our show. Well, I text her, but she doesn't reply to my texts anymore. I guess I'm not important enough. <laughs> All right, well, we'll, 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 we'll get her. Awesome. We're gonna do the cell phone cool. confrontation. <laughs> and by, yeah, and by that, the way- That, that would be awesome. And by the way, John, I want uh, to invite you back anytime you want. I just want to throw that out there right now. You are the best. You are amazing. <laughs> Thank you, man. Anytime, man. Anytime you want to. <laughs> what about to come by a little bit early next time? <laughs> what about like fringier stuff? Do you listen to any uh, stuff that would be considered more, you know, more extreme? Let's say more more on the fringe, or not as much. Uh, not exactly. Like sometimes I will. Uh look for videos or, or 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 whatever kind of content that i find for people like the young turks mm. uh which I, I maybe i'm wrong but i think it's one uh, i guess extreme left wing uh, sure i don't yeah. know, what, you yeah. know like, what they're uh, saying that's totally true you that's the thing i don't understand about modern politics is people who are like echo chamber themselves like no i hate watch msnbc i love hate watching msnbc <laughs> my favorite thing ever like you've got to listen to dissenting opinions or you never know where you stand. We should do a watch party. We should do an MSNBC yes! watch party. Every, oh, yes. <laughs> every, oh my God, everyone's all invited. The moments, I love it. Yes, that is definitely, we're yeah, definitely doing that. I, I like to, I like to listen, even if sometimes it, it actually makes me mad and I end in a bad mood <laughs> for the things I, I, li I hear. Uh, even though I, I like to, to listen to this, uh, to the people who ask these points of view, to try to understand, and it's just for my own personal, uh, uh, I guess you could say, human study. <laughs> Can or I whatever. tell you a secret about mainstream news? Go for it. Can I tell you a secret? They want you to be angry, and the reason, the reason they want you to be angry, is because yeah. anger is addictive. Okay, they trigger that response in your brain. Because, and that's the same with clickbait. Think about any article you've ever opened, even if it ended up being complete nonsense. What are you more likely to click on? The sensationalist title that makes you angry or the neutral title that you don't, that you just- yeah, You know, that that's actually something that makes me really angry that I hate the clickbait titles because I want to know the news and I know that it's going to have the information I'm looking for. But I read the title and I'm like, like, John, do you realize you're about to click on that fucking stupid title, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're well, going to read that news, but you're going to be a person who's going to... 
even more than Sorry? clickbait the problem with that even more with than clickbait and i you know I, I love what you have to say that's totally appropriate but the problem in general when it comes to mainstream news is that they are more interested in making you scared than they are in making you informed they do not care about you they the news they're, they're not getting on the news like this is going to make everybody's lives better they're like what is going to get us ratings what is going to get people to tune back in why are people watching joe rogan at millions the times that they're watching CNN. Why is this happening? It's because we understand what the dopamine teams are in big business. All right, CNN, we have you lo on lock, <laughs> hook, lock, hook, line, and sinker. All right, we know what dopamine teams are. We know that Facebook utilizes them. We know that YouTube, Google, every single place has teams that know how to utilize messages, that know how to utilize colors, that know how to utilize subliminal things that will trigger you into having a reaction, okay? So it's we're not receiving news. This isn't to be informed. This is to get ratings. This is to get money. Here, here's one thing I noticed, by the way. When I was at the Woodstock Film Festival, I had an animation of mine playing there, and this is around the time of the National Defense Authorization Act that Obama passed that allowed for indefinite detention. I was bringing it up to everybody sitting at dinner, and I got no response whatsoever. They weren't interested. We went to a cabin, and the debates were on. Joe Biden was on stage, and I remember seeing him wearing a very flashy outfit. Like, the tie was too bright. Everything, like, forget partisan politics. Forget whether it was Joe Biden or whether it was, you know, Obama or whoever. Uh, the point is... Everything was too damn bright. The colors were too bright. I noticed this, and it felt like a real circus. Just looking at it, I was like, what is going on here? This seems very sick to me, that there are these very bright colors that are being projected at the screen, and people are getting used to it, like little kids get used to eating like really sugary cereal, so they don't like eating any other like natural food. Like I think there is a psychological effect of these very bright colors. Warfare. It's 100% psychological warfare. So one, yeah. yeah. What we're gonna say? No, no, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say that uh, those kind of things when are on the public eye and people do it that way, usually has an intention on it. Mm -hmm. Like there, are, I remember a lot of things that the that the government in Venezuela will do that we will think that what is that crazy to the shit you're doing? Like what, what the hell is going on with these people? But they knew what they were doing, that or why they were doing it the way they were doing. Well, you, you know they that. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Uh, you made me remember of what happens in Russia very close to what you were talking about with these boxes that people were receiving from the Venezuelan government. In Russia, oh, that is adorable. In Russia, they have this kind of like a Make-A-Wish foundation, but with Putin sitting in front and like uh, taking a call <laughs> for somebody complaining about, you know, like their rent is past due, and he just like... You know, says the word and all of a sudden everything's fine with their rent situation and he does this also as propaganda to show look how much I care about the people see all these people are in trouble you know and people think that one day I'll be able to call the president and he'll solve all my problems and that's that's the mentality they have you guys have no idea by the way the the level of Russian propaganda within Russia it was like it's well, so circus like yeah. it is so I ridiculous I got to participate uh, at an event in New York a couple of years ago called PutinCon, where they actually had like <laughs> Russian who had, like, had to face these problems, like come and talk about it. And they were talking like this woman whose family is still held to this day um, as political prisoners. She hasn't seen her kids in six years plus um, because of these exact problems that go on in places like Venezuela and Russia. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to bring the conversation full circle back to the original thing we were talking about, and uh, then I think we're going to be uh, wrapping it up pretty soon. I wanted to bring it back to the very first thing we discussed in this program, which was the current situation in Venezuela with that uh, military guy who uh, tried to uh, stage a coup. So from the um, New York Post, it says, ex-Green Beret behind failed coup was desperate for multi-million dollar bounty. So... I don't know, like, we had a conversation about this before, but I wanted to get your take, John. I don't know if you were following the story about this uh, attempted coup, but uh, w w what are your thoughts? Uh, it's 
it's it's crazy. Uh, it's it's absolutely crazy. It, 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 it's uh, like I don't I don't understand how that happened. And if if I didn't live in Venezuela, I wouldn't believe it. I, I to be honest with you, I wouldn't believe that 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 would be true. And actually, at first, I thought it was just like a setup by the government because they they usually, they tend to do a lot of these things. Like they will set up uh, the skill. Yeah, they, they will try to set up the, the yeah the Maduro just uh, someone tried to kill Maduro. Or that that's what Daniel to... Martino said. By the way, one of our earlier panelists, that is exactly what he said. He thinks it's a setup. Yeah, there are the, uh, the thing is that the strange thing is it's either a whole setup. Or it's just a uh, very badly planned uh, raid. It, 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 it's it's uh, to me is the one of those two uh, subjects because the government in Venezuela actually talked about the raid before the raid happened. Mm. Uh, I think I was I remember uh, like one or two weeks ago there were news in Venezuela with uh, the vice president and. and <laughs> The, the, the people from Maduro uh, do, making statements like uh, there there are plans of people to, uh, trying to kill our president Maduro. Uh, we know all about it. We're going to protect the, the republic because, you know, we are all about protecting our people and we're peaceful and we're telling these people to stop it because they will not succeed in bringing war to our peaceful land and whatever, where blah, 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 all these crazy <laughs> things that they always say. And... They they even say that they will come uh, that they will try to come to Venezuela or to, to go to Venezuela uh, by sea. So it actually ended up happening, and it's been reported actually that the government paid for half of the money on the meetings or the su supposed meetings that were happening in Colombia, where they will be training these people who will go on on this raid mission. You know, they the uh, what what makes no uh, no in immediate connection to me is that there is this one guy called uh, Ivan Simonovis, uh, who is uh, he was the head of I think uh, may, I may be wrong on the exact uh, fact about that, but he was the head of the let's say the CIA of Venezuela, the the, the intelligence in Venezuela uh, from a lot of years past, and he was jailed. By Hugo Chavez, and he spent I don't remember how much, maybe like 10 years in jail, something like that. And he got uh, released. I think it was uh, last year or 20 on 2018. And he came to the United States. He's now uh, here in the United States. His take on it was a bit strange. He didn't actually say that it was a uh, setup by the government, and but it was more like uh, like whatever happened. Uh, must not drive us away of our objective, and we just got to look at the facts of what happened. It, it, it was not actually, a, you know, a, as usually, it's just the government trying to do the, this propaganda or this situation to try to make them look better or whatever. Uh, it was a different situation. It was a different response, uh, response from, from that. So that made me a little bit more uh, uh, doubtful on the government just making it, everything up uh opinion and there's also this other guy uh i don't know his actual name uh, in venezuela we call him jj rendon which is jj rendon so i don't know if he's like uh juan jose rendon or, or something like that <laughs> uh i am not actually i don't know his name very well but he was supposedly uh a, the guy who paid a uh, part of the operation and he's an opposition guy. He's, he wants the government to be out of Venezuela, you know, the Maduro regime to be out of Venezuela. So apparently he actually he actually did it. He actually paid money for that. So it could be the government a government setup, or it oh, could be uh, an actual raid that was planned, but was so poorly poorly planned that even the oh. government, the Maduro's regime counterintelligence made part of it to make it you know to make it actually happen so they could have that story to uh, for the benefit wow it, it kind of reminds me by the way of what happened in turkey with uh erdogan where people thought that uh the erdogan regime was over and there was like that cell phone footage of him in the plane and uh all of a sudden hey guys i'm back the sultan's back 
<laughs> so, yeah, there's all kinds of weird stuff going on in the world, including uh, the other Venezuela story, which was with that cruise ship that uh, the military ship miserably <laughs> failed against. So, all kind, all kinds of. Well, I mean, what do you, what do you think of that? Venezuelan tech not really being up to standard when it comes to uh, butting heads with a uh, cruise ship. Uh, I mean, I know for a fact that there's not that many tech in Venezuela. That the technology in Venezuela is it's it's pretty old compared to the to to the standard of the whole world. You know. Yeah, except for the uh, Russian stuff. <laughs> Maybe yeah. Uh, and the Chinese stuff. Yes. This... Uh... <laughs> China isn't too happy with Venezuela, though, last time I heard, right? Like, uh, even though they do have a very strategic partnership, uh, it's like, how how hard are they able to hold on to it until that crumbles away? Because what, Ven- what does Venezuela have? Like, let's, let's end this on this question. What does Venezuela have left other than doing like drug deals now that the oil price is so low like what what is the future that you see happening for venezuela and could this be like the silver lining that maybe this will make everybody revolt and change the regime and bring in a uh, free market uh, and all that well uh i i can understand for example russia's perspective on why they will want to partner with venezuela it's a very strategic point in in south america you know it's right in, in the middle when you want if yeah. you want the whole continent to be you know watch out watch over venezuela is a perfect point for that so i can understand russia's point on that absolutely in china's point china had them they have a really good deal with venezuela because did you know that in venezuela the the nicest of the or the best uh, public transport buses are uh, Chinese made uh, so much that they are like the letters in the in the bus and and the, and the names of the buses and everything is in Chinese. It's not even in, in Spanish. <laughs> what? That sounds so backwards. Wow. Yeah, it, uh, these big red buses that had uh, Chinese uh, letters on it. Like they will have to put the uh, Spanish uh, instructions for the seats and stuff like that on top of them. Oh, like right in markers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they had a lot of, of deals with Venezuela. I, there's actually this big depth uh, between Venezuela and China, where Venezuela owes China for like, I think I called it wrong on, on that fact, but I think it's almost like 20 years of free oil to be able to pay the debt that we have with China. Wow. Because China has brought to us uh, uh, good uh, uh, technology and, and a lot of these things that the government has been uh, made a profit of, but it was just it will just be more and more debt accumulated. So I can understand China's perspective on that. They have this safe uh, oil reserve, if you may, uh, for years now. But if now, Chi- if China st- stops supporting them, so, sorry to cut you off. By the way, if China support stops supporting them, would China get that uh, oil back? Like that would be kind of like a loss for China too, right? The problem with that debt is that, as I as I understand it, it's an basically an illegal lead debt because uh, a country cannot make uh, a deal with another country. Uh, knowing that the other country cannot pay for that deal you know what i mean mm. like the deal that china made with venezuela venezuela at the moment they made it venezuela didn't have enough money to make those deals that's why the the, the, the payment of the deal will be in, in basically free oil and free whatever venezuela will do because it didn't have enough money to pay it to pay that so one of the policies that the opposition is, is, talks a lot is that re uh, I don't know if this is how would you call it in English, but it will be translated on something like re-evaluation, uh, re-evaluation of the debt, yeah. which means that they, they will go again on, through this debt with China and with other countries that has made this type of deals with Venezuela, because mm-hmm. it will be basically impossible for Venezuela to leave this or to even pay these kinds of debt. So 
that point between China and Venezuela, I don't act in exactly understand it that 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 well. To to know when is China gonna turn around the other way, or 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 how much is China gonna profit from that? I'm not that well educated in, in that subject. Well, that you you are thing. incredibly well educated in so many things, and usually, <laughs> like when people say someone is well educated here in America, that could that wouldn't necessarily put them in the frame of being wise. I'd say you are both educated and you are wise. And I think that that is such a beautiful thing to see. And uh, this is why, like like I said before, like when I was at the Woodstock Film Festival, the person who I uh, got along, I think, the best there was this guy named uh, Juan uh, Lopez uh, Fons, who's from Mexico. And he did a documentary about the uh, drug cartels over there. So he put himself in this uh, precarious position and he knows what it's like to live in a precarious place. So I think this is why I connect a lot more to people. Maybe it's because my parents had to go through this whole rigmarole in, uh, you know, in their life back in the USSR that I feel like these are very valuable things for the American audience to hear and know and understand while trying to improve every problem that we have over here. But uh, any uh, any final words, uh, Kimberly and John, and then we're going to end the broadcast. You wanna go first, John? Uh, ladies first, please. <laughs> All right. Well, I I don't I don't really uh, I guess my my synopsis of this is to learn to do research on your own. Um, if there is a silver lining of this terrible isolation isolation and social distancing, which I'd like to pray to God that there is, it is that we all have more time in the sense to like explore and learn about things on our own. I would implore people to deviate from the mainstream narrative. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Yes, please subscribe. The eight people who are watching this thing, I'm looking you at you right now. Subscribe. I'm looking at you right you. in the camera. Subscribe. What are you doing? Subscribe. Why are, make a subscribe. Google account. Okay, some of the people, some of the people who are watching this right now, you may not have a Google account. Make one. Make a Google well, account. It's not it hard. Takes Thirty seconds. Yes. I know you spend longer doing dumber shit. Exactly. So. And press the bell. I completely forgot about the poor bell, by the way. There's a bell that you could press. Press it twice and make sure you get updates for Click new. Click the bell. Subscribe. Send yes. it to your friend. Tweet. Like. like comment. <laughs> yes, exactly. Hello, here's, everybody. Here's a little subscription banner. Okay, and with that, uh, John, final thoughts. Who Also, who should we support in Venezuela? Like, who's the person that we should get behind as far as someone who could actually make some change in the positive direction? Well, that that's actually a, a whole other subject to talk about because I'm not exactly a fan of uh, President Juan Guaido. Uh, I think that he's been actually doing more damage than than real good, and real I actually dislike him almost as much as Maduro because he's a person who is who came and gave us all hope, and and it's been more than a year. And it, nothing has happened. And you could argue that there are situations on why and stuff, but Bobby. the fact of the matter is that he's not suffering, Maduro is not suffering, everyone else is suffering, and you know, and that's just what it is. And so, who to support? I will say that for the for the moment, for Venezuela, <laughs> and it may sound crazy, it's actually Donald Trump. I think that Donald Trump is, is it's the only person right now, as I see it right now, who will uh, actually lead for a lead, or even uh, this country and Venezuela to a actual actual prosperous uh, situation in in that country, at least in this matter. You S S. <laughs> now every time I hear USA, I, I, ima I imagine that scene in the theater where somebody released a poor bald eagle and then just like flew into the window. <laughs> I was like, it's so sad. But but anyway. And and my final thoughts. Yes, on, final on the thoughts. Is that I, I love to be here and I would love to come back as many times as you want me to. Like, but really, it's definitely fun. You're and, awesome. You are a natural. And to the people, <laughs> to the people who want to understand the situation in Venezuela. I uh, will say um, whatever you hear, whatever you read, 
there is always something else behind it. it whatever, as crazy as it may sound, it, there is always a context or a backup story or something like that that is involved in that that will make sense to that. It yeah. will take a little bit more work, but uh, I will advise you to dig a little bit deeper uh, before that story so you will understand better the story you are reading or watching at the moment. And I think that could apply to whatever politics in, in, in any place in the world. That is beautifully said. And also, uh, where could we find you, John, and where could we find you, Kimberly? Ladies well, first. <laughs> i like that i got to interrupt you to say that too that made it that made it even more amazing to me no, you're wonderful. thank you so much um you can follow me and support my work on parlor telegram um bit shoot facebook twitter and instagram at Coulter culture c-o-u-l-t C-O-U-L-T-E-R-C-U-L-T-U-R-E. -E. I can spell my own last name. I know. It's very funny. <laughs> um, and you can also support me by finding me at the M-A-G-O-A, -A, the Magoa. It is the Motivated Armed Girls of America. It is a Second Amendment page. We are all inclusive, all ages, all genders. We don't care. Um, it's all about learning to defend yourself. And we host a monthly live stream every month on the 26th, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. So check out the Magoa everywhere. You can find us on social media. Excellent. And uh, John, where can we find you? Well, you can actually look for me on Instagram as John Gonzalez Music. I'm actually a musician. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm actually about to release a song pretty soon, so <laughs> you could. I'll buy it. We, we, we look forward to hearing <laughs> your music. Uh, Hero says thank you oh, for thank the stream. You. Great content as always, Hero, like I just wrote, you are the real hero. You are the real MVP. And one final thing before everybody goes. To the people who are watching, this coming Wednesday, we are talking UFOs. We are going to have with us one. Of, okay, one of the people we have with us is Jim Adams, who is the dep, who was the former deputy head technologist of NASA, and we are going to be talking and with him. We are going to be talking with friend with his friend, who is a uh, Dakini guru. She is like an Indian uh, woman who practices yoga and mysticism, and she's a friend of his, which is really cool. It's very oh, you're making that face. We I'm already so had. Happy. No, I'm so happy. I'm so excited. <laughs> okay, good. And not only that, Man. we are we are going to have. Okay, here we go. We are going to have from Twitter. We are bringing the Eastern Orthodox Twitter community to the alien stream to get the perspective of um, Seraphim Rose, who was this guy who became an uh, Eastern Orthodox monk who wrote this book talking about how aliens are actually demons. And we are going to get that perspective. That should be a hell of an exciting thing. And uh, the um, the person's name, by the way, is uh, Gravantus, who is joining us at the... T A B E L L I O N, the Tabillion. So he is a friend of Landshark, who I love. Much respect to Landshark. Um, he's great. You guys go to his Twitter. You are, you're going to be impressed. And we're going to have a whole bunch of other guests. We're going to have Matt Bow, Matt Kahn. These are uh, friends of ours. And uh, John yeah, Facey is joining us. They're like they're like big into UFO, big ufologists, and I'm not gonna announce all the guests yet because it's still kind of fermenting right now. But we are <laughs> having really big guests for this UFO event. That's gonna be I Wednesday, 6 p.m., 6 p.m. Eastern. Be there or be square. And don't forget <laughs> to subscribe. Don't forget to like this video. Click the bell. Click, the, click, the bell. click that bell. Subscribe. Send to your friends. And become a patron. Patreon.com slash Jewels. Become a patron. Very there cool. are three different tiers. <laughs> We're going to be giving Why all kinds. Why pay for cable when you can pay for Levin Jewels? Exactly. We're going to be giving all kinds of goodies <laughs> your way. Better than those stupid boxes from Venezuela that the people get. We're going to give you all kinds exactly. of. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're going to give you all, all, all kinds of good stuff. So anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I love you all. You guys are incredible. We we owe everything to you, the viewers who are watching, and to these amazing guests who are with us today. You guys, much love to everybody. Let's keep doing this. We're going to break the matrix. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye -bye.